Number one, Skinwalker in the Redwoods, submitted by Art L. This happened when I was 12 years old and spending the summer with my Aunt Maria, Uncle Joseph, and two cousins in California. The summer I spent with them was a lot of fun as it was my first time in California and I can say my time spent with them was a lot of fun. I got to bond with my cousins, learned a few songs in Hebrew, went to Universal Studios, Legoland, SeaWorld. It was amazing. But there was one incident that occurred that I first thought was a bit peculiar. Four years later, when I found out what truly happened, I could never look at the Redwoods the same way again. Along with the numerous trips to theme parks, we also went camping in the Redwood forests with another family. Now, the mother of that family is important to the story. Let's call her Rosa. We stayed at this national park where Rosa's family rented a cabin and we were camping out right next to it, just a couple of minutes walk into the woods, which isn't so bad in the daytime when you can admire the awe-inspiring majesty of the 100-foot tall, centuries-old redwood trees. But it's an entirely different story once it's dark outside and you're trudging through the area trying not to trip on a branch while shining your flashlight around you as you attempt to keep up with the rest of the group. And so, after a day of hiking, we were hanging at the cabin as usual, eating dinner, laughing, playing board games, the whole shebang. Of course, the time came for me, Maria, Joseph, and my two cousins to walk back to our tent in the dark. So we said our goodbyes and grabbed our stuff. Then we flicked on the flashlights and exited the cabin. That particular day, I was more exhausted than usual and as a result, I was at the back of our group and lagging behind a bit. I'd say we were about three minutes into our walk when I heard a very faint voice behind me. Andy. I stopped for a moment, wondering if I really heard someone calling my name or if I was just succumbing to my fatigue and imagining things. But then I heard it again. Andy. It was clearer this time, a bit louder, and I could have sworn it sounded like Rosa's voice. I turned around and shone my flashlight in the direction I heard it, calling out Rosa's name, asking if she was there. And then I heard it again. Andy. It definitely sounded like Rosa's voice, but I was just confused as I couldn't figure out why she would have followed us into the forest at night. But then I figured, Maybe one of us forgot something, and she was returning it to us. We were right next to their cabin, so it wouldn't take long for her to do that. With that reason in mind, I started walking towards the direction I heard it. But no matter where I shone my flashlight, I couldn't find her. Rosa, where are you? Again, I heard it calling my name. Andy, Andy. This time, I stopped in my tracks, there was something wrong. I stood there frozen. The sound was definitely coming in front of me, but this time any thoughts I had about it being Rosa were gone. It may have sounded a bit like her, but it sounded off. The best way I can describe it is as if Rosa was talking through an old TV or a broken radio. It was staticky and distorted. I could feel there was something in front of me hiding from my flashlight but it didn't feel normal. Whatever it really was, it didn't feel close, but I could tell it was close enough that if I just took a few more steps toward it, it wouldn't be a good idea. Contrary to what you might be thinking, I didn't feel scared, but confused. I definitely knew its intentions weren't to my benefit, but for all I knew, it may have been someone playing a prank on me, but I wasn't sure. Andy, what are you standing there for? The voice startled me a little as I spun around to see my Aunt Maria lightly jogging towards me. I let out a big breath. I didn't even know I was holding one in. She caught up to me, tugging at my arm as we power walked to catch up to my uncle and cousins. I turned around and I didn't see you. I thought you got lost or something. 
Under normal circumstances, I would have responded with a sarcastic remark, but I was still in shock about what just happened, so I just mumbled out an apology in Spanish. But my aunt must have noticed how terrified I looked and stopped. Hey, are you okay? You look like you've seen a ghost. Seeing no reason to lie to her, I told her what happened, from the voice to it sounding strange, to the malevolent feeling I got when I walked towards it. You see, my family is Mexican, and as a result, we're very superstitious, and often believe in the supernatural around us. But not in a, we fear them and demand the spirits leave this room before I shove this rosary down your throat kind of way, but in a, we respect it kind of way and we often came to each other for advice if we were dealing with something we expected was supernatural or things we didn't know better about. I was just hoping that maybe she'd give me an explanation as to what happened or what the thing may have been, but she just shrugged her shoulders. Your guess is as good as mine. Maybe it was a camper playing a trick. Yeah, I guess, I said. I glanced back one last time to see if I could spot anything, and I swear, I could see the leg of something like a dog disappearing back into the shadows. Needless to say, I spent the next few minutes of the walk back to the tent between my aunt and uncle. The next morning back at the cabin, we were making breakfast, and I remembered what happened the night before. I asked Rosa if she went out looking for us last night. No, silly. After you guys left, me and the kids sat on the couch watching TV until we fell asleep. Why, did something happen? I shook my head and said to forget I asked. She gave me a weird look, but didn't ask me anything more. Later, I was wondering if Rosa was playing a prank on me, and I asked her husband if Rosa and her kids really were asleep on the couch after we left. He said they were. He was sitting at the table near the couch reading, and that they all slept there for at least an hour. Fast forward four years later, and I became close friends with someone who had quite a bit of experience with weird situations, things like the supernatural and paranormal. We often shared stories together about our experiences. When I told him about the strange experience while camping next to the cabin with my aunt and uncle, this person said without blinking, oh yeah, that sounds like a skinwalker. A little shocked and a bit curious, I asked why they were so sure. They explain that skinwalkers inhabit the southwest and west coast area of the US, and that they often imitate voices of the people they want to prey on, trying to lure them into a false sense of security. I've had to deal with a few of those things before, a bit of a pain to rid an area of. From my experience, don't be the last person in a group, because that's who they're going for, the easiest to separate. You're lucky your aunt caught up with you and brought you back before it got the chance to do God knows what. They also tend to take the shape of dogs and coyotes, so that leg you saw probably belonged to it. I felt a chill run down my back as I imagined myself coming face to face with a skinwalker if my aunt hadn't come to get me. Needless to say, I don't think I'll be camping on the West Coast anytime soon. Number two, The Thing in the Woods, submitted by Alex. Around 10 years ago, my dad, our German Shepherd puppy Diamond, and I lived in a 25-acre woods in between the Georgia and Tennessee border. In our little cabin, unfortunately, there were a lot of weird goings on, and this was the most memorable and terrifying event. In March of 2007, we were in the middle of a bad storm. Me and Diamond were watching an episode of the Dukes of Hazard when the power went out. I, of course, being 14 years old, got immediately creeped out. I grabbed my mag light and started walking towards my dad's room. And then I heard someone at the door. So me, being an idiot teen, went to open the door to say hi to whoever it was. Then suddenly, my dad ran out of his room screaming like crazy, don't open the door. So I stopped in my tracks and asked what's wrong. 
and what he said still makes me shake today. He told me there was a figure in the window, a figure that wasn't human, unlike any human or animal he'd ever seen. He said there was something beyond that door that wanted in, and we weren't going to let it. We then sat in the living room with a lantern and a few flashlights, just waiting out the storm and hoping that whatever was outside would go away. Just as we were drifting off to sleep from waiting so long, the door burst open. Before I could see what was happening, my dad grabbed me and everything we could carry, and we locked ourselves inside of his room. Diamond followed us. After locking the door, dad grabbed his shotgun, and I asked if we should call the neighbors or 911. But then he reminded me that our nearest neighbor was 10 miles away, and it would take the police maybe 45 minutes. By then, we could already be dead. Diamond stood behind the door growling and waiting for whatever was behind it to come in. Whoever or whatever it was kept hammering at the door for five minutes until it all went quiet. We listened to the heavy footsteps exiting the cabin. They were twice as heavy as my dad's footsteps, as if this thing weighed over 500 pounds easily, but it was somehow still on two legs. We took the sudden calmness of the moment to call the police, and when they arrived, they questioned us. Then we drove to my grandmother's house. After that, we sold the cabin, and I never saw it again. My dad, of course, had to go back to get everything out that we wanted, but he would only go during the day, and he was armed with his shotgun. I don't know what visited us that cold night, but what I do remember seeing were tracks in the cabin as we left in a hurry. Tracks that weren't footprints. No, they looked more like hooves. Number three, Forest Howl, submitted by Leviathan. My family and I visited our cabin for spring break last year. It was on top of a hill in Indiana, surrounded by forests throughout. On a side note, I've always been fascinated by the creatures I find, like snails and bats flying overhead at night. This year, however, it was far too cold for many of these animals to be out and about. So this time around, we stayed inside the cabin for the most part, no forest exploring or hiking. On our first night there, we lit a fire to enjoy our time there before the incoming rain the next few days. Since we were bored and had no s'mores to cook, we decided to tell some scary campfire stories, like any sane person would. My mom found one on her phone and began reading it, and I decided to close my eyes and relax next to the heat of the fire. It was comfortable, the perfect temperature, and a story to fall asleep to with the background noise of a crackling fire. I was in a state of perfect relaxation when we all heard a howl of something outside. I snapped up, startled by the noise. My mom went quiet for a moment, shook her head, then continued to read, and my niece next to me simply listened. No one seemed too bothered by the howl. It could have been my imagination, but it was so real and vivid. Plus, I don't remember ever hearing a howl like that one. It was such an odd moment. But then, my mom asked me if I had heard something. What? Of course I had. She was suddenly acting like she didn't hear it, and the others were in agreement. Why had they reacted to it before? How could I have been the only one to hear something like that? This really bothered me, but I tried to shrug it off and I went back to relaxing next to the fire. But then, my dog started to growl at the door. She was staring upwards, as if ready for some intruder to burst in, and then came another howl. It was much more clear and close than before, like it was right outside the cabin, and it wasn't coming from the height of my dog. It sounded more like something the size of a person was walking around outside. And when I looked toward my family in a panic, 
They all pretended not to hear it. What was happening? Why was this happening? Was there something I didn't know? Something they thought I didn't need to know? For the rest of our stay at the cabin, even though we didn't, I didn't hear it again. I couldn't enjoy myself or relax. There's something out in those woods, and I think it wanted in our cabin. Number four, The Monster of Camp Road, submitted by Not Telling 27. This happened when I was nine years old. I was home alone, and it must have been two in the morning when I woke up from a deep sleep in our cabin. I was with my friend Luke at a summer camp. It was the second night, and everything was going great. But when 2 a.m. rolled around, we could hear something above us, something like a deep breathing and thumping sound. The night after that, after we exited the bathrooms, which were separate from our cabin, I was reprimanded by one of the counselors because I left the light in the bathroom on and I was the last one there. So I had to turn around and turn it off. I walked into the bathrooms and I turned the light off. But before I left, I felt suddenly freezing cold, and then I saw something horrifying through the small grated windows at the top of the bathroom. A slow and incredibly tall figure walking around the building in steady and heavy footsteps. It was so thin, and it must have been over eight feet tall. From what I could see, I didn't get the whole picture, but the skin I could see was thin and gray, and there were bones jutting out of it. I ran back to the cabin. Luckily, nothing else happened that night, but at the end of the week, I went to the bathroom, and the lights were broken, and the door had been pulled off of it. Even after seeing something like that, I assumed it was someone being stupid and had destroyed the door, but even the counselors and other kids had no idea who or what had done that? Number five, Sheriff's Camp, submitted by Scarlet S. Over the years, I would normally go to Sheriff's Camp in the summertime. It's a summer camp where you get to experience cool simulations of real situations like tornadoes, fires, etc. The camp is split up between girls and boys. The boys sleep in tents near the lake, while the girls sleep in cabins in the woods. After we arrived that year, they did the welcome to camp, here are the rules speech. Then we proceeded to split up into our cabins and gather our things. We walked up to our cabins and got settled in. Then we walked down to the fire pit. The girls who were in charge of our cabin decided to tell us a ghost story a story about a girl named Sally who had drowned in the lake, saying that she walks up the camp every night, blah, blah, blah. I was 11 at the time and I knew they were just trying to scare us, so I acted brave and pretty much blew them off. Later that night, we were in our cabin, windows open and everyone sleeping, and suddenly, Mal just started going ballistic, like she was freaking out, one of the older girls had to calm her down, and we finally understood what she was saying to us. She was still crying and said, there was a girl in the window. At this point, I'm thinking she's going crazy. I ignore it and go back to bed. The next morning we get up, and Mal has all her stuff packed. She was leaving that day. Me and Nikki asked her why, thinking it was probably about the girl she saw or claims she saw. She then lifts up her shirt. I found it hard to breathe. There were dozens of scratch marks all the way down her back. Me and Nikki are looking at each other, asking ourselves, what are we even seeing? Mal leaves, and I can't say I blame her. Later that night, we were talking about it, and Kate says, yeah, that's a little odd. Last night, I thought I saw rainbow boots walking outside the cabin window. Me and Nikki think she's going insane as well, so we play it off. 
I didn't talk about it again. Nikki ended up leaving camp early because of a family thing, leaving me with Kate. The rest of the week goes off without incident. Now, at the time, I had a dog at home who would be having puppies at any moment. This will be important later. On the bus ride home, I had to sit with Kate. She was really talkative that day until she suddenly just stopped and got dead quiet. She was just staring out the window. Her head wasn't moving. I ignored it because I was tired anyway. And then she suddenly says in a really, really deep voice, a voice that did not match an 11 year old, something bad is going to happen. She still doesn't turn her head for the rest of the ride. So I switched seats because I'm so creeped out. I got home and about a day later, my dog has her 12 puppies, but they all didn't make it. They were doing fine. There was no explanation as to why they didn't make it. And as for my dog herself, she passed away too, with no obvious explanation. Number six, Bummer Camp, submitted by Lily. It was about a year ago. My neighbor, who's a good friend of mine named Lily, went with me to a summer camp. We helped out as counselors to the young kids. The camp was on an island isolated from the world, or so it seemed. It was mid-June when we left for the island to go to camp. When we arrived, everything seemed normal except the fact Lily and I's cabin was deeper in the woods than everyone else's. You had to travel down a really long gravel path to get there. Now, I was really curious at that age, so I asked my friend if she wanted to go walk in the woods when it got dark out, just for the thrills. She agreed. That night, we snuck out, trying not to wake up anyone else. We started walking down the path toward a large hill in the distance. We decided to start running toward the hill, and when we made it to the top, I looked out into the huge fields ahead. We saw some object flying toward us. It had three red lights that looked like dots against the night sky. My friend and I were paralyzed when we saw it. After we came to our senses, we took off running back to the cabin. We hid in the corner all night long and eventually fell asleep. When we woke up in the morning, we confirmed with each other that what we saw the night before was real, but we didn't tell the other counselors. That night, we decided to go back, this time a little later than last. We went back to the same spot, and when we arrived, we saw the three red lights again, coming from the object in the sky. It was even closer than before. As soon as we saw it, we screamed. It disappeared. Then we ran back to the cabin again and locked the door, regretting going back for a second time. We didn't sleep that night, but as soon as it was morning, I turned on the news in the report, which was about dozens more sightings of the exact same object we had seen. We had witnessed, along with almost a hundred others, an actual UFO. I froze and Lily's face went pale. We went to the head counselor and told them about the incident. Unfortunately, no one believed us. All I know is I will never be visiting that camp again. Number seven, Creepy Hermit Encounter, submitted by Jordan. I live in Burlington, Ontario, a nice lakeside city near Toronto. This story happened to me during a school trip when I was in the eighth grade. At my elementary school, which by the way was Catholic, everyone in grade eight would get to go on two trips as part of their final year at the school. One trip took place in the fall and it was usually a religious camping trip that took place about 40 minutes out of the city. By religious, I mean everyone had to participate in group activities that revolved around being a good Christian and teamwork. This, of course, completely sucked at this camp it was little more than a religion class stretched over three days. The second trip took place in the spring and it was usually a trip to Ottawa for the weekend. 
where we could explore the city and visit museums. For some reason, it was decided my year would instead take another camping trip, about four hours away at Algonquin Provincial Park. The camp was on one of the many lakes in the park and was set up like your pretty typical summer camp. Cabins were spread out near the lake and partially in the forest, and there were bathrooms and a mess hall in separate buildings. As you would guess, boys and girls shared separate cabins. The girls' cabins were built on supports above the ground and were closer to the lake. Our cabins were almost in the forest and built on the ground along a gravel road. I shared a larger cabin with about four other guys. Although ours was the largest, it was probably the least comforting. While the other cabins had actual windows and doors that would fully close and lock, our cabin looked like it was built from balsa wood, only had thin bug screens for windows, and a door that wouldn't completely close. I should also point out that I had no experience with actual camping, as my family hated it, so this was a pretty bad first impression. This is where the creepy part of the story starts. On the first evening, we were all gathered outside the mess hall for a fun night activity. The camp counselors told us about a hermit that lived in the nearby woods. The activity was that they were going to take us into the dark woods in groups to see where the hermit lived. This kind of caught us by surprise as it was kind of random, but intriguing at the same time. As you would expect, Everyone was pretty much screaming as we were led deeper into the woods with only our flashlights, looking for this hermit's house. When we finally came across the house, which was little more than a huge log with a makeshift bed, we were led back to camp. Although my group didn't see anything, other people started talking about seeing someone creeping around the dark woods. Someone in my cabin even said they saw blue glowing eyes in the forest, I shrugged it off, thinking the whole hermit story was made up by the camp to scare us, and the person in the woods was probably just a counselor. Sometime in the middle of the night, I woke up to the sound of someone sprinting down the gravel road near our cabin. At first, I was startled, and then a little creeped out, but then I thought it may have just been some animal. That was until I started hearing the gravel crunch around our cabin. It was very soft, but definitely a person outside. I was suddenly terrified. My bed was right beside the door that didn't lock. An animal could have easily pushed the door open on its own and walked inside if they wanted to. There was also nothing covering the screens, so the person outside could clearly see in. I was ready to scream as loud as possible if someone entered the cabin. I had my eyes locked on the door, anticipating to see it slowly open, but it never did. The sound outside slowly disappeared into the woods. Immediately, I thought it must have been the hermit. I ruled out the possibility of it being a counselor or a teacher because it was at least three in the morning, which was a terrible time to check on the students. Surprisingly, I was able to fall back to sleep a short while later. That was the only interesting part of the camping trip, unfortunately. The rest of the trip was pretty dreadful. It rained nonstop for the remaining days, and a few people from my class caught the flu from another school that was sharing the camp with us, so the bus was partially quarantined on the way back home. As time passed, I mostly forgot about the creepy encounter, giving in to the possibility that it was just a counselor checking on us. The story doesn't end there, though. The following year, it was my younger sister's turn to go on the same 8th grade trip. Just like for my class, she also had to go on the weird hermit expedition during the first night. Although she initially thought nothing of it, during one of the other days when she and a few friends went exploring in the woods along the lake, she described seeing a small hermit-like person sitting on a log in the distance. I know this isn't the scariest camping story to be told, but it creeps me out knowing that the hermit was indeed real and that the camp thought it was fun or funny to lead a bunch of kids to this random person's house in the middle of the woods. It's also a delight to know that the hermit also wasn't afraid to peek on unsuspecting campers in the dead of night. It's been almost 10 years since this happened and I haven't done anything camping related since. 
Number 8. Something Wasn't Right. Submitted by Jake. I'm going to start by saying that I'm not exactly sure what me and a few friends experienced fully, but there was definitely something strange with us that night. This story takes place in fall of 2017. I was 16. A few friends and I went to a cabin camp out with our Boy Scout troop. The first night we got there, it was the normal routine of unpacking and setting up our things. We made sure to set up near one of the power outlets, which me and a friend shared together as there were two in the room. The next morning was fairly normal. Hanging out, talking, playing card games, and on the GameCube someone brought, we even had a projector we had brought with us to play with. By the time lunch came around, we were out of bottles of water, so me and a few friends were asked to walk approximately a mile, maybe a little less, to a water pump to fill up three of the five-gallon jugs we had. Now me, being the biggest one of the group, I had to carry them, but I knew that there was no possible way I could carry these things all the way back. One, sure, but physically impossible to do all three or two for that matter. So we looked for something to help us on the way and found a sort of cart by some wooden building on the path there. It had two big wheels, a wooden body, and a bar that stuck out the front enough for me to fit in it and push it with the box-like thing behind me to pull the water jugs. We used this and filled up the water which took longer than it should have due to the other kids messing around with the pump. The pump was in front of a shower house with a lone light and it was near the lake. So after that, we used this card to bring the heavy jugs back and went on with our day. Well, by the time night came, they needed to be filled again. And of course, instead of waking up early when it was light out, my friend and I were sent to go right away in the middle of the night. I threw on my coat and some gloves to go out since it was cold and we each took a flashlight. We started walking, me with the card again to make it easy for us. From the moment I stepped out the door, I had the sketchiest feeling I've ever had about something being out there with us. It was hard to describe like the feeling of being watched and that you know something is going to happen. I tried to calm myself, but I kept hearing noises in the distance and seeing movement out of the corner of my eyes. When we reached a spot in the path not too far from the cabin, where there was a little fenced in area with canoes and kayaks and things like that, my body froze and the feeling tripled. I told my friend about the feeling before but he kept saying it was nothing. I finally said at that point, dude, I, I can't do this. It's getting weird out here. We'll get up first thing in the morning. He wasn't having it, but went back anyway to get someone to go. I felt bad, but I truly had the feeling I was going to die out there. We went in and I told one of the leaders, but they said it was probably just animals. We had heard and seen a coyote the night before and during the day. I was completely planning on staying, but then my friend said something along the lines of, I'm going to get some real men to go with me. Well, right then and there, I knew I couldn't let him insult me like that, but we figured a couple more people wouldn't hurt. Supposing we were attacked, we'd be able to team up on it. So with a couple of more people and an extra powerful headband flashlight loaned to me, we went back out but the feeling soon came back. We started walking and again by that fenced area, the feeling tripled, but we just walked faster past it. Now everyone started sharing my feeling, but we all kept an eye out and noticed animal tracks that weren't there before. We reached the pump and filled the water while me and my friend loomed around. The lone yellowish light from the shower house left huge areas of creepy shadow and there were noises coming from the lake, just bullfrogs, I think. The feeling never left, but wasn't as strong as by those canoes from earlier. I kept seeing things lurking in the shadows and didn't trust it at all. As we head back, we kept observing strange things all around, and as we were walking, we would stop occasionally to hear distant footsteps. As we neared the canoe area, I hear my friend, the one originally with me, yell, what the hell is that? And we all bolted, 
At the time, I had a jacked up knee with an additional 30 to 40 pines of the cart and water jugs with me. I still made sure not to be the last one in line. We made it back to the cabin in one piece. After we set the water down and my friend went just outside to get some air, I asked what he saw that made him react like that. He said when we reached the building I found the cart at, he saw a man in his peripheral vision sprinting at us in full speed. But when he blinked, the man was gone. I believed him since I thought I heard the running back then. And when I looked back, I swore I saw the resemblance of a man silhouette. The next morning we checked it out, but saw nothing but a few worn out looking footprints. As we drove off that morning though, I got the feeling again as we drove past the fenced in area. To this day, I'm not sure what happened that night. Was it all a strange coincidence or was there some man stalking us? I don't remember the name of the place, so I couldn't even look into it if I was curious, but I do know I'll never go back there again because you never know who or what is lurking in the shadows. Number nine. This is why I don't go to summer camp. Submitted by Freya D. Camp Coleman was one of my favorite places. It was nestled by the Puget Sound with a lagoon of salt water, but no fish. We were near the border of Washington and Oregon, and all the cabins had a deck overlooking the strip of land between the ocean and the lagoon, but our cabin was the nearest to it. All my cabin mates were about 14, just like me. The first night we were there, we played poker out on the deck for candy and other stuff we had brought, when a sickening noise like nails across a chalkboard, but louder and higher pitched, rang out. We all froze. The sound seemed to be coming from all directions. We all ran inside, telling our cabin leaders what happened, but they just told us it might be a pack of coyotes, but we knew better. That night while we were sleeping, I woke up to the sound again, but I wasn't the only one. Two of my cabin mates had woke up too. We decided that tomorrow we were going to the library. This library had all the animal sounds at Camp Coleman on a kiosk by the front door. We looked up all the animals we thought could possibly make that noise, but nothing matched. We asked other cabins if they had heard it, but no one had. We were so afraid to go back that night, we even volunteered to clean up after dinner. When we finally were forced back to the cabin, we all got ready for bed. Worried we might hear the noise again, we shut all the windows and locked the doors. That night we heard the sound once more, but it was louder somehow, closer. That entire week, the sound only seemed to get louder and closer every night. Then, on that first Sunday, I told my closest friend that we should stay up and see if we could locate the sound. We stayed up reading and passing notes. The noise burst through the back door, seemingly only for us because no one else woke up. We were so afraid to step out onto the deck but I'll never forget what we saw. There was a humanoid figure with long arms and claws dangling down its skeletal torso. I didn't see any visible head. It was standing near the lagoon. It seemed like only a shadow moving like an ape on all fours. Then it seemed to just fade away into nothing. The sound never came back that summer, but I still have a clear image in my head that keeps me up at night. What lives in that lagoon, I wonder? Hopefully, I never find out. And number 10, Scary Camp Experience, submitted by Ikmik L. Last summer, I attended a camp in Maine called Lakeview Summer Camp. This was my first year at Camp Lakeview, and nothing extremely scary happened to me personally. The following tale, though, is about a counselor who was in my cabin told by various other witnesses. The counselor's name was Andrew and was apparently from Florida. He seemed nice enough to me. He let me plug in my iPod in the outlet above my bed if he could use my fidget spinner. 
One day he was missing for quite a while. Word started getting around the cabin that he had pushed one of the campers in our cabin onto a rock and was apparently in trouble. Things quieted down for another day until another incident happened with another camper in our cabin. This got him kicked out of the camp for good. After he left, the following stories our counselors told us really creeped me out. Apparently, the counselor had been paying a little too much attention to the two boys that he pushed. This really disturbed the boys. One of them, a 14-year-old, would not stop crying, and believe me when I say it's hard to make him cry. Our counselors also told us that he had touched other campers and had made inappropriate comments to others. I'm so glad that I wasn't one of the ones he targeted, that I had a bed as far away from him as possible under the most awesome counselor ever. As for you, Andrew the counselor, I hope we never meet again. My friend doesn't stay at cabins anymore. From Hollow Ghost. This is an email from one of my friends. We'll call her Abigail. I received this back after sending her an email asking if she wanted to go up to my family's cabin for a week this past summer. Here goes. James, I'm really sorry. I know I promised this year would be the one that I finally went with you to the cabin. You've told me again and again that it'll be safe. There are other people there, but I just don't feel up to it. Next year, maybe, if we're all together. We could go to my parents' place, even. Maybe go skiing. Colorado has some nice mountains. Who am I kidding? I guess if I'm going to blow you off for the third year in a row, you might as well know why. Do you remember four years ago? You probably don't. Well, you asked me the same question. But my parents had already planned on going up to the cabin that year since my dad was finally off of work. Anyway, I went up there with them. It was good. Fun. I guess. At least I got to spend time with them. I'm rambling again, sorry. The point is, I've not been honest with you. Or with anyone, for that matter. One night when my parents were all asleep, I went out into the woods on one of the trails. You know the system that runs back behind my parents' cabin, don't you? Well, I kind of got lost. It wasn't the smartest move, but you know how my insomnia is. I just felt claustrophobic, cooped up in that cabin. Well, I was lost thoroughly. There was no signal up in Colorado where my parents' cabin was, so I had no idea what to do. I just kept walking down the trail. I guess I hoped that it was one of the routes that led down to the town, and not one of the ways to the backside of the mountain. I walked for half an hour at least, and I didn't get anywhere. Most of it was uphill, and the trail kept getting rockier. I think that's why I decided to turn around and take a different route when I reached one of the small ponds. You know, you can never be quite sure with those ponds. They all look the same. As I was turning around, I caught a glimpse of some light through the trees. A yellow kind of light, like you would see from a lamp. Not the glaring white ones that they line the water towers with, though I guess a water tower would have helped too. I walked over to it, thinking I could ask for some help. And as I entered the small clearing with the house, it was a small house with an oak wood frame, I saw the lights were on. And the door was open. But there wasn't anyone there, if you can believe it. I figured that whoever owned the cabin just went out into the forest for a minute. They would probably be back soon. I don't know why I decided to wait inside the cabin instead of outside, but can you blame me? It gets really cold at night in Colorado. I walked into the house. A rich person definitely owned it. It had all the bells and whistles. A nice stove, refrigerator, the biggest flat screen I'd ever seen. I sat down on the couch. 
I don't think I even waited two minutes before a young man walked back in. He was wearing casual clothes, a blue hoodie, if I remember correctly, and jeans. He looked surprised to see me there. I asked him if he knew the way back to town, or if he could at least help me get back to my parents' cabin. He ignored my question at first, the nerve, and said, Darling, you look cold. Let me get you a drink and a blanket first. Now, there was something seriously off about the dude. I can't quite place my finger on it, but it was something about the way he walked and moved his arms. It just looked jerky and weird. And his face looked fine, I guess, except it was too long and too smooth. And he would never look me in the eyes. He got back with the tea and a map, which I thought was the sweetest thing. He said he would be in the other room to get a blanket for me. And then he just, well, stood there, watching me. It was really creepy. I didn't trust the tea then. I was in the middle of the forest at some stranger's house, and a funky-looking stranger on top of that. I was seriously freaked out, and I began to think, he's not going to leave until I drink some tea, is he? So I planned on drinking it and then getting the heck out of there. I took one sip, and it tasted bitter as heck but he was already walking away, seemingly satisfied. I don't remember much after that, but I do remember trying to stand and run. I don't even think I made it to the door before I collapsed. This part's where it gets weirder. I woke up in his cabin sometime later. It was dark inside, and I had to kind of fumble my way around until I found the coffee table. It was dark, pitch black, but I could still see a bit somehow. I really don't know how to describe this to you, but I think it was coming through the windows. The wall by the windows was just lighter than the rest of the room, but it was even darker outside than it was inside. I went up to the window and pressed my hand against the glass. The glass was hot hot like the sidewalk during the summer. I thought I'd burned myself, but it didn't hurt, and it didn't even feel warm. It's hard to explain, but I could just tell it was hot. Then, I heard someone scream behind me. It was this little girl. She looked like she was only 11. I think that was when I realized that there was something seriously wrong here. There were eight of us in the cabin. It took the rest of them about an hour to wake up, and when they did, it was silent. Nobody wanted to talk. I think all of us, being strangers in an even stranger cabin, we were all just confused at first. I decided there was no use in just standing around, so I got up, and I told them I was going to do some exploring. It was definitely the same cabin, but something was off. Save for the living room and kitchen, all the other doors were missing. There weren't any lights either. I was looking around in the kitchen drawers, I think. And another weird thing was there wasn't anything in them. That's when I heard the door slam open. I turned around, surprised, expecting to see the strange man come in. But it was one of the men I'd awakened with. He was just standing there in front of the open door. There was some kind of black goop behind it, but it appeared like it was swimming, almost, but it wasn't making waves. It looked like it was folding in on itself, and every time it did, I caught a glint of light. It was like a soft blue, but it wasn't any color I can describe, at least not any color I've seen before. He just stood there, staring into the goop. He kept inching towards it like he wanted to jump in it, but something was holding him back. Joey, one of the girls, Michelle, I think her name was, said to him, What are you doing? The man didn't respond. He didn't even look at her. He just kept inching towards the door. 
Then the goop stretched, or more like it bulged, and part of it caught around the waist of the man. He looked at the girl for a second like he had broken out of a spell. He looked terrified. But the goop just yanked him into itself with a hiss, like water hitting a burning hot pan. The younger girl began to scream. Do you have any idea how awful an 11-year-old scream is? Anyway, I slammed the door shut and pulled the girl down onto the floor with the others. What was that? Michelle asked. Where did he go? I was dumbfounded. I think we all were. And terrified. We started discussing what we saw, how that man had been absorbed or dissolved into the goop. I kept glancing back at the door, expecting to see Joey burst through it at any moment. One of the girls pulled out her phone and tried to call the police, but again, there was no signal. Another one of the girls got up and moved around, trying to find a landline. I stayed on the ground with the little girl and a few of the other people. There was something weird about Michelle. She hadn't looked at any of us once the entire time we'd been talking. She just kept staring out the window. Curious, I started to look too. I don't think the goop was actually moving, but it appeared to be pulsing or breathing. It was pressing up against the windows and then back, and up against the windows again. Michelle rose to her feet and started to the door, and somehow that broke me out of my trance. I caught her sleeve as she passed. I was confused about how she could even go over there after what had happened to the boy. Where are you going? I asked. Then she hit me. I let her go then. All I could do was watch as she opened the door and that mass stretched to take her too. We waited for hours. I don't remember how any of us were left at that point. It was alluring. I felt drawn to it. I don't know why, but I had the urge to just stare at it, to let it swallow me up, too. I think we all felt it. At one point, I was holding the little girl, and I caught her staring out the window at the blackness. I didn't know what to do, so I tried to cover her eyes. She started to scream and kick at me, asking me why I wouldn't let her look. Somehow she got my hand in her mouth and bit down hard. I think I remember she drew blood, but it just kind of floated there in the air, like the videos of astronauts drinking orange juice on the International Space Station. She was already on her way to the door, running, and I ran after her. I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't made it to her in time. I had her pinned against the wall, and she was kicking and screaming, and someone else, one of the others, just walked by and opened the door, and the goop took them. The little girl and I just stared in shock. It felt as if a wave of heat pushed against us, when the girl at the door sizzled out of existence, like someone had pointed a stream of hot air towards us. I dragged the little girl back into the center of the room, and we sat again waiting. I don't know what for, I just knew that doing anything else could kill any of us. Nothing happened for hours. I must have been in the cabin for days, though. I never got hungry or thirsty, and I never had to use the bathroom. We tried to play games to pass the time, but you can only play Go Fish so many times. The cabin had practically nothing in it now, Furniture, sure, but no books or games. The fridge was empty, and the TV was not on the wall anymore. I tried tying myself to the furniture with my shoelaces. I thought that if I did get the urge to go to the door, it would stop me. So I attached my hand to one leg of the couch. Everyone was in some sort of daze. We all moved around sluggishly, like we were walking in a pool or through molasses. It started getting harder to tell who was where, how long it had been, or what I'd been doing. I started to forget things too, like what day it was, and why I was even there. James, I started to forget my own name. I was even more afraid when that began to happen. 
I just kept repeating my own name under my breath over and over again for hours. I must have looked like a lunatic. I think I was at that point. The other people were picked off one by one, all of them being absorbed into that goop, until there were only three of us left. By then, I was staring into the windows as well. It was beautiful, James, like heaven is supposed to look. Somehow, the black was colorful. I just wanted to stare at it, to become one with it. I nearly didn't notice when the last girl walked over to me and yanked the little girl from my arms. It was so sudden, I didn't even know what to do. I got up, and I tried to grab her arm, asking her what she was doing, but she pushed me back. I fell and hit my head on the side of the coffee table, and that's the last I remember. When I woke up, it was daytime. I remember I was still tied to the couch, and the door was wide open, like it had been when I first entered that place. But now, I was the only person inside. All seven of the others were gone, as if they had vanished into thin air. I untied myself from the couch, and I began to make my way over to the door, when I saw something. James, you're not going to believe me when I say this, but there were deep impressions on the floor behind the couch. That girl, the last one, she had tried to drag me and the couch into the door with her, and that poor little girl... I didn't know what else to do, so I ran. I ran as fast as I could, all the way back to my family's cabin. I didn't come out of the cabin for the rest of the trip, and I haven't been back since. Now I hope you understand why I won't go with you. Again, I'm really sorry, but I just can't. I hope that you'll be safe too. Have fun. And James, don't go getting lost, especially at night. Cabin Creature From The Hetera So this happened not too long ago, just about a year ago, I think. My two sisters and I never knew this would happen to us. Back around November 2nd, 2019, my sisters and I let's call them Grace and Sharon, were sitting in our rooms playing an online game. We were at our parents' house, and they treated us like queens, so we liked staying there. Grace's parents heard Sharon's screams of anger and excitement, and so, just like any young child who has spent almost half the day on their cell phones, they told us to go outside, as it was a wonderful day out, and all that stuff. Sharon was the first to get up and frown, we didn't want them yelling at us again, so we slowly went outside and just stood there. Quit acting like a five-year-old, Grace said to Sharon, who was just sitting there in the backyard stairs. I'm not acting like a five-year-old, Sharon replied. Right then, as I didn't want them to fight or argue, I asked them if they wanted to go to the woods for a while. Luckily, both Sharon and Grace wanted to come along. But before we left, I told the adults that we were going off into the woods for a while. They said that was fine. So off we went. We started to chat about different animals. Grace was obsessed with dinosaurs, and all the while she kept on blabbering on how cool they were, and how she wished they still existed today. We were walking along when Grace then changed the subject to something else. You guys know about that cabin in the woods? She asked. Sounds pretty cliche to me, I answered. No, there really is one around here in these woods, Grace retorted. I'll show you. Just follow me. Sharon and I both followed her to a path through the woods. There were lots of low-hanging branches and leaves scattered all over the forest floor, sticks in random places and all that. We kept hitting our heads on branches, too. But we laughed it off. Soon, Grace stopped and looked at us. She had this wide smile filled with excitement as she pointed up to the hill that was not too far from where we stood. On that hill was a cabin. 
It wasn't your typical horror movie cabin, all creepy and worn out, but it was a new one, as if it had been recently built. So, we're going inside someone's cabin without permission, huh? I see where this is going, Sharon said with a hint of suspicion in her voice. I agreed with her. The place did look like someone's residence. No, Grace retorted. I've been there. No one lives there. I promise it's safe. It's safe, I say. When people say something's safe, it's never safe. Are you coming or not? Grace shouts. She was already halfway up the small grassy hill. Sharon looked at me and I looked back at her. With a bit of hesitation, we followed after Grace. By the time we reached the top of the hill, Grace was already on the doorstep. The first thing we all noticed was that the cabin had no front door. The lights were on, though. I'm not sure how we didn't notice that when we were first down the hill. And the place was quiet, unnaturally quiet. Grace went inside and Sharon followed, with me behind. The smell of cut grass soon hit my nose with the force of a semi-truck. Why does it smell like that? I ask. Took the words right out of my mouth. Sharon agreed. Immediately, we heard footsteps. Not a person, but more like an animal walking on all fours. I froze. Guys, we need to leave. Someone's animal is in here. Grace nodded slightly. But apparently, she didn't agree with my idea. Instead, she began to explore around the cabin, as if she was looking for something. Run! Sharon suddenly shouted and took off out of the cabin. Grace and I then turned around, only to see a massive animal of some kind standing just inches away from the staircase. It was white, impossibly skinny. So skinny, in fact, that it was almost bone. It had these black, sunken-in eyes. It was about eight feet tall and stood like a person. And it stared at us. What is that? I whispered into Grace's ear. Grace didn't answer. And I understood why. She, we, were so terrified by this creature... This white thing then decided to crawl back up the stairs, now seemingly uninterested in us. The way it crawled was more like a spider. Before finally vanishing in the darkness upstairs, it took one last emotionless glance back at us. It stared for only a few seconds, then leapt the last four stairs up. Grace grabbed me by the arm and took me outside. Sharon was there waiting for us, mouth agape, staring at the cabin. There was no need for us to speak. We fled away from the cabin, down the hill, through the woods, and finally made it back into the backyard, where the adults stared at us with suspicious eyes. We made it out, alive, but confused and traumatized. Dragon on Vacation From Yolo Fishy 23 At the time of writing this, I'm 17. I have two younger siblings, a brother Josh and a sister Krista, who are both 14. My mother is a very kind woman, always helping other members of my family when they need it. My father passed away when I was 10. He always had a way of making any situation a good one. Finally, there's Uncle Jesse, my mom's brother. He was living with us at the time because he had lost his arm a year before. This story may sound crazy, but I swear on my life this happened. I even have a scar as a reminder, but I'll explain that along with the story. This happened to me and my family when we were on vacation in the UK. We had been driving to a small town in the UK countryside. The drive was about five hours. There were five of us in the car. Myself, my two younger siblings, Mom and Uncle Jesse. My siblings, Josh and Krista, were both asleep at the time. My mom was driving while my uncle and myself were talking about what plans we had when we arrived. We had rented a cottage by a lake for two weeks. 
Eventually, we arrived at the cottage. My mother stepped out of the vehicle and went to wake up Josh and Krista, while Uncle Jesse went to unlock the door. Mom, I'm going to go take a walk, okay? I said, climbing out of the car. My mom responded with, Okay, just don't wander off too far. The cottage was laid out like this. At the front was a deep forest that stretched around until it reached the back of the cottage. Then it opened up to reveal a beautiful lake. If you stood on the shore, you could see other cottages around the lake. I started walking about 20 meters or so into the forest. It didn't take long for me to spot something strange. Claw marks on some of the trees. They looked like they could have been from a bear, except they were about as long as my entire arm, and they wrapped around the whole trunk of the tree, like something had used the tree to pull itself upwards. Then I felt it. A feeling I'll never forget. The feeling that I should run, and run fast. I kept walking, and as I did, the feeling kept getting worse and worse, until I was about 30 meters in. By then, I could not take it anymore, so I ran back out. When I'd gotten back to the cottage, my family had already brought our bags in. The rest of the day went without any problems. We all went to bed but I soon discovered that, that night, it would be one night that I wish had never happened. The cottage had two bedrooms. My siblings and I were all sleeping in one, my mom in the other, and my Uncle Jesse was sleeping on the couch. It was around 3 a.m., and I was lying in bed, unable to fall asleep. Suddenly, I got up, because I saw Uncle Jesse leaving the cottage. I got up and ran after him. I caught up to him about halfway to the beach. He told me he was going to sit by the water for a bit. So, I joined him. We were sitting by the water together for about half an hour before we decided to head back in. The distance from the shore to the back door was about 150 meters. We had walked about 50 meters when the feeling from before returned stronger than ever. I was guessing Uncle Jesse felt it too, because he told me to speed it up. This is the hardest part for me to tell. When we were about 25 meters from the door, Uncle Jesse broke out into a full-blown sprint. Before I could follow suit, I felt a sharp pain in my back, and something pushed me into the ground. I began to hear a rumbling growl. Suddenly, there was a pressure on my back, as if something was standing on top of me. I heard screaming coming from the cabin. I raised my head to see my mother, my siblings, and my uncle, all standing there with their faces locked in looks of fear, and they were white as snow. I could feel it. Whatever was causing the pressure in my back, it had a scaly texture to it. Then... The weight was lifted off of me. I was not able to move until my mom ran over and helped me up. I turned my head to see this massive creature hidden among the tall trees. The only clear part I could see were its large yellow lizard-like eyes. Together, my mom and I ran inside. We completely locked the place down, and we didn't leave the cottage for the rest of our vacation. That creature left a scar on my back. I assume it tore into me with its claws. Thanks for listening to my experience. I know how crazy it sounds, but I swear it happened. Please, if you ever enter the UK countryside, be careful. The Cabin from Wolvesbane. Even when I was little, I had a great love for Michigan. Ever since my parents decided on an impromptu spring vacation up in the vacation home that belonged to my grandparents, I was smitten. The secluded cabin, the field splayed out right beside it that I could play all day in. What wasn't there to love? 
That cabin was my safe place. There was nothing up there I didn't find absolutely breathtaking and wonderful. That was until a few years ago. In 2017, my husband and I had finally tied the knot after being together for five years, and that's when my parents gave us the news that they would be selling us the cabin. In only a matter of four days, after deciding to spend our honeymoon up in Michigan before packing up our lives back home, Lee, my husband, and I were catching a flight to our new home. The familiarity of the gravel road crunching beneath the rental car's tires was what woke me from my unintentional sleep, as well as Lee's low whistle in amazement at the acres of land. Wow, hon, you weren't kidding. This place is something else. I laughed. When will you learn I'm always right? In the midst of our banter, Lee had parked the car in the middle of the large driveway, and the second the car doors automatically unlocked, I was outside, breathing in the fresh air. We pulled our luggage from the trunk, and I practically sprinted up the front stairs with my suitcase thumping up them behind me. Hurry up, slowpoke, our honeymoon awaits! Lee only shook his head and laughed. Elena, I love you, but we both know you couldn't give a crap about our honeymoon right now. You just want to get inside and bask in the memories of your youth. I rolled my eyes, taking the keys from my husband's hand once he reached me. Are you calling me old? There was no ounce of seriousness in my tone. I simply enjoyed pulling his leg. I turned the key in the lock, twisting the door handle. Dust particles floated in the air inside the cabin, cloth tarps covering the furniture. No one had been up here since my grandparents passed away in 2011, even when my parents found out they inherited the place. However, even with how untouched and unclean the place was, it was beautiful. I couldn't help but smile at the sight of the familiar feeling it brought. It felt like home. Needs a good dusting, but I think we can handle that. I smiled at my husband, wrapping my arms around his waist. Lee held on to me tightly, looking around the house as well. It's perfect. Oh, how wrong we were. The month of our honeymoon was perfect for the most part. Some light cleaning and relaxing. It was halfway through our stay there that Lee and I found out we were expecting. It hadn't been planned, but we were absolutely ecstatic nonetheless. In fact, my pregnancy was one of the reasons my husband left the night of my first encounter with this thing. Because my cravings came in full force, and Lee, being the great husband he is, drove the hour-long drive into town to get me my potato chips and mint chocolate chip ice cream. Alone, I was lying under my blanket on the couch, dozing off to the sounds of the TV when the knocking began. It took me a moment to realize it wasn't the TV. Someone was actually pounding on the front door. Now, I've always been scared of being by myself when it was dark. I've never been able to place my finger on the reason why. All I know is that when night fell, my skin would crawl, and I would jump at the smallest of sudden noises. My body was frozen in its spot. My heart began to thump rapidly against my chest. My mind began to make up reasonable excuses. It was probably a neighbor, even though we were the only ones here for miles. Maybe it was Lee and he just forgot the keys. Elena, let me in. It was Lee's voice, but it sounded so wrong. Not comforting and warm, but bone-chilling, cold, like this person had been smoking for most of their life when Lee had never touched a cigarette. I couldn't move. I couldn't even twitch. The only thing I could do was lay frozen as I began to cry. When the banging stopped, I thought it was over, but I was entirely wrong. Sharp nails began to claw on the outside of the cabin, trailing over towards the living room. My eyes widened, and I realized my horrible mistake. The curtains right beside the TV were pulled open. I'd forgotten to pull them down. I soon realized that, as whoever this was grew closer, I'd be able to see them through the window, and they would be able to see me. What I did next, it made me feel like I was five again, 
but I pulled my blanket over my head and curled in on myself. I couldn't help it. I was terrified. Right after my vision was put into darkness, after I pulled my blanket over my eyes, a sharp tapping sound came from the window. I see you. It was taunting, menacing, and the voice didn't even sound like my husband anymore, but demonic. Evil is the only way I can put it. I felt like I was living in a horror movie. Whatever that was, it wasn't human. Scared? The thing let out a growl. God, it sounded like the embodiment of evil. As I was on the brink of sobbing out of fear, I heard keys jingling in the front door. My heart skipped a beat. He was home, Lee was home, but that thing still stood outside that window. It growled, seemingly out of frustration, and that was it. I pulled the blanket from my face, my eyes blinded by light, and my husband's amused chuckle brought me from my petrified state. What are you doing, you goof? Lee was smiling over me, but the grin quickly dropped when he saw my eyes swollen from crying and how much I was shaking. Hey, hey, it's okay. What happened? His voice was gentle. God, his voice, it was so warm and loving. Nothing like that thing. I tried to speak, but the only thing that came out was a sob. I wrapped my arms around my husband once he sat down beside me, and I couldn't stop until my eyes drifted to that window. Close it. What? Lee sounded puzzled, and I didn't blame him one bit. Close it, Lee. Freaking close it. I jumped from the couch and almost tore the drapes from the pole as I pulled them close. My hands were shaking something fierce, I noticed. Alina, honey, what's wrong? Come on, I can't help you calm down if you don't tell me. Lee grabbed me by my shoulders, turning me away from the window. There was someone, something out there, Lee. It was telling me to let it in. I was so scared, I, I thought it was going to get in. The tears came back full force, making my eyes sore. I left out the factor of whatever it was trying and failing to mimic his voice. There was no way he would believe me. When I looked up at Lee, he seemed mad. Not at me, but at the thing that had terrorized me when he was gone. My husband wrapped his arms around me and brought me into a hug. It's okay. They're gone, all right? You're okay. We'll call the police, and I'll go look around in the morning. The police arrived nearly two hours later, and of course they didn't find anything. However, one of them reported back to Lee that there were deep scratch marks in the wall outside, leading straight to the living room window. It took more than a bit of convincing from my parents, but Lee and I still moved into the cabin. I know it sounds stupid, but we made plenty of modifications after that event. We had a gate installed at the beginning of the driveway, and many security cameras put up. We even got gun licenses and purchased two firearms. Years passed and only mild things occurred. Strange screeching from the woods, numerous dead animals littering the field and the makeshift trail we had created. There was even one occurrence when a fresh rabbit carcass was left on the front porch. However, it was what happened only a month ago that made me and Lee start questioning whether or not we should move. Lee and I both worked as mechanics at the shop our friend owned. Sure, it wasn't the best paying job, but it paid the bills. Said friend, Chris, had called us close to five one day, saying that staff was shorthanded and he needed one of us to come down there. I offered to be the one to head over and Lee agreed to finish dinner for ourselves and our two kids. Yeah, that's right, two little troublemakers. Charlie, our daughter, who I was pregnant with during the whole ordeal, and James, our little boy, who came along two years after. I gave Lee a kiss and the kiddos a hug, and I headed into town. When I arrived, I had never seen my best friend look so guilty. Chris continuously apologized for asking me to work, 
but I simply laughed and waved him off. Let's just get back to work, you big dork. Hours passed. Chris and I talked about he and Tori, his wife, had begun trying for a baby, and how Lee and I had been thinking about taking the kids back to our hometown to see the folks. It was around 8 when my phone began to ring, and I decided it was time for a break. I picked up my phone and the sight of Lee's caller ID made me smile. Hey you, what's up? However, my husband's frantic voice and the sounds of my kids crying cut me off. Linny? Linny, where are you? Lee asked hurriedly, and his question confused me, as I had texted him an hour ago saying I most likely wouldn't make it home until 9 or 10. Babe, what do you mean? You know I'm still at work. Lee, what's wrong with the kids? Are they okay? Why are they crying? No, 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 you can't be at work. You're... Elena, you're outside. It was that thing... I knew it was. It was there at my house, terrorizing my husband and kids like it did me. My keys were already in my hand, and before I could think, I was waving goodbye at Chris with a simple, I'm sorry, I need to go. It's the thing that was here four years ago, isn't it? Lenny, that's what this is. Never in my life had I heard my husband sound so terrified. Even though he was trying to cover the tremble in his voice, I could tell, and it made my heart hurt. The crying of my children only made it worse, and I couldn't imagine how horrified they must be. I want mama. Daddy, I want mama. My daughter was practically wailing. I could hear her completely from the other end. Her sniffles and sobs were soon in my ear, and the fact that I couldn't physically be there to comfort her was agonizing. Sweetheart, it's okay, it's okay, I promise. You have Bubby and Daddy, they're right there with you. At that point, I didn't care if I was speeding. I could not drive the hour-long ride back home casually, when I knew my family was in danger. Mama, I'm scared. Charlie had never been the kind of kid to cry on a regular basis. When she had cuts and bruises, sure. But never once had I heard her wail like this. The phone was soon passed to my two-year-old, who blubbered incoherently to me. However, I was able to make out bits and pieces. It was at the window. It sounded like Mama. It was telling Sissy to let it inside our room. No matter how much I tried to soothe James, in any way I could, unlike Charlie, his crying only got worse. After telling him to hand the phone to my husband... I could finally let my voice crack and the tears fall. The fact that my children were terrified of something that I was scared of myself and I couldn't be there for them, it made me feel helpless. Finally, our driveway came into view. It was then I realized that I'd have to go outside to open the gate. I cursed under my breath and quickly told Lee that I was about to be driving down the driveway and to have James and Charlie's overnight bags packed. My heart was pounding as I stared out into the woods, which was partially illuminated by my headlights. Something was wrong. I knew this thing was out there, but Lee had told me only minutes before that he could hear the thing walking around outside, as well as the occasional growl. Everything in me was screaming not to take a step from my car, but that darned gate needed to be opened manually. What's wrong? Lee's voice came through my phone as I'd gone completely silent. My eyes were lingering on a particular spot in the trees beside me, and I knew, deep down, I knew it was there. It's... it's watching me. I was terrified to speak, my voice barely above a whisper. I wasn't even sure my husband heard me. I... I need to open the gate, but it's out there. Lee, if I go out there, it's going to get me. I can feel it. I was no doubt crying once more. It felt as if I was back at that night four years ago. Listen to me. Do not get out of your car. Stay there, alright? We'll drive down in my truck and I'll open the gate from my side with the keypad. The way our gate worked was you could either open it with the keypad outside on both sides of the gate or open it manually. 
However, the entry keypad had been busted for more than three weeks, but the other worked perfectly fine. Be careful. With two quick I love yous, I reluctantly hung up the phone. I soon realized how dead silent the woods had become. Not the deafening sound of crickets, just complete and utter silence. Suddenly, I heard it. Sharp nails lightly tapping on the back window. My breath hitches, and my body went rigid. With my heart beating rapidly against my chest, I reached a shaking hand out to my radio, pressing the knob to turn it on. With the music blasting to drown out the tapping, I closed my eyes. Whatever this thing was, I knew it would look just as horrific as it made me feel, and I refused to let myself see it. I felt my car shake as it bumped against it, and I only clenched my eyes tighter. That's when it broke through the sound of the random music station, a growl so guttural it shook me to my very core. It was slow, drawn out. This darn thing knew what it was doing. It knew just how to make me feel petrified. It was then that I slowly grew more angry than anything else. This thing was on my property, terrorizing me and my family, and it was then that I decided enough was enough. I threw the car into reverse and shouted at the top of my lungs, Screw off! and floored it backwards into the thing. My car hit something hard, and it fell underneath my tires. Beneath the vehicle came an echoing scream, my skin crawling at the sound. I was halfway in the road when I slammed on my brakes, and I summoned the courage to look at where the thing should have been. But there was nothing. Not even blood. I heard the gate creak open, and the headlights of Lee's truck blinded me for a moment. I decided to take the lead and have them follow me to the closest gas station. It took 15 minutes, but eventually we both pulled into the parking lot. Neither of our cars were completely parked, before both me and Lee, as well as our kids, were out of our vehicles and hugging each other. That night will always haunt both myself and my husband, but with my children being so young, I hope the memory will fade. We're currently staying at an Airbnb for the time being, until we find a place. If we stay in Michigan, or move back home, we'll just have to see. That night we stayed with Chris and his wife, and I researched about this thing until at least four in the morning. The two that matched it almost perfectly were a Wendigo or a Skinwalker. Heck, maybe even the Rake, though that's just a creepypasta. Maybe. However, one thing I do know is that the cabin that I once considered paradise was a nightmare that will forever haunt me. Something in the Woods of Northern California From Anonymous This takes place in Northern California where I grew up, sadly where a lot of the fires have been going through the past few years. My brothers and I were headed to our property for our garden. We were staying up the mountain for a week or two, just to get away from everyone in the city, and to get some one-on-one -on -one time with it just being us, since we haven't really had the best relationships with each other growing up. At the time, I was 17, eager to get away for a while, to hang out, shoot some guns, and have some beers with my brothers, and hopefully do some bonding since we all had a good deal of an age gap. It was a Wednesday when we packed up my brother's lifted Chevy 1500 with all our guns, food, fishing stuff, and plenty of beer and Jameson. We stopped and got lunch and headed for the garden. It was on a secluded road off the main road, the turn to gravel the further you got up the mountain. At the top was an old helicopter pad. Not sure why it was there, but it always piqued my interest. Forty-five minutes after we set off, we finally reached our destination, the garden home away from home in the middle of the woods. I loved this property, just because it was out there in nature and I could do anything I wanted. Nobody could tell me otherwise. All it had was a newer cabin my brother built and a couple of other buildings for cooking, bathing, storage, and stuff like that. Our first few days were awesome, tending the garden, having beers, and riding in the truck, driving out on the old logging roads. I was having a blast. 
On the fourth day, my brother's neighbor came by. We'll call him Bob. Bob was an old man, a typical mountain man, really rugged and all about his privacy. He wanted to have his slice of heaven and no one to bug him and his pups. Well, I met him, and I was told by my oldest brother to go fetch my other brother so they could have a chat with old Bob too. So I did. We returned, and now Bob was wanting my brothers to keep an eye out for a mountain lion, since there are many up here apparently, but usually they leave people alone. For context, one had gotten a hold of his oldest dog, Martha, and he was just giving us a heads up. Well, eventually Bob left and my brother spoke in private, and I found out later at dinner that we were going hunting for that cat the next morning. My brother had a predator tag to fill, so we had some beers and went to bed early. Fast forward to the next morning, 3 a.m. My brothers are awake and ready to get going, just waiting on me, of course, like a typical little brother. I shower, spray my clothes with scent block, and grab my 6.5 Creedmoor with a little coffee and a Marlboro. Then I'm ready to set off. My brothers are both really good outdoorsmen, and they've been coming up here for 10 years now, so they know the woods like the back of their hands. So I follow them, picking up pointers on how to track and what to look for along the way. After about an hour of slow hiking, we make it to a spring, the start of a small creek, but it has a pool which my brother tells me is basically a watering hole for a lot of animals out here, as it gets really, really dry in the summer months. We then set up two blinds around 200 yards away with the breeze in our faces. It's a perfect setup to sit and wait, and that's what we did. With snacks and coffee, we sit patiently waiting for light, and at first light, my brother ranges the spring pool with his rangefinder. We were at 205 yards. Perfect, I thought, because my Creedmoor is sighted for 200, 250, and 300 yards on my three-pin scope. Well, we all get to whispering about Bob and his poor pup. And in the midst of our conversation, we didn't realize a raccoon sneaked up to the pool. But what we did notice was it ran off like it was scared to death of something. We looked at each other, thinking that's weird. We'd never seen a raccoon run off quite like that, in such a sudden and dire panic. Well, we weren't prepared for what came next. Something came out of the brush next to the spring and waddled down to the small pool. We had no idea what it was. I'd never seen anything like it before. It looked like a wolf, but its head was way oversized and square, like a massive pit bull, and it seemed to have hoofed rear legs like a deer. We sat there watching for a while, when, out of nowhere, it perked up and stared directly at us. My brother, who had the 30 odd six, had it shouldered in seconds, but did not let off a round. This thing knew exactly where we were, but how, I wondered. We hadn't made a noise since it appeared, and we were upwind, so it couldn't sense us. It would be almost impossible to. Everything for us had been perfect. We had the upper hand, or so we thought. We then saw that its mouth was open, and it was making a squealing noise, like when you scratch on styrofoam and it makes that high-pitched noise. I was beginning to freak out. I shouldered my creed more, ready to rip one. My brothers had done the same, but at the time I was too freaked out to notice. Before we could fire, it shrieked like a siren. A broken siren. Then it sprinted back into the woods. I looked over at my brothers and my oldest was whispering something that I couldn't quite hear. We sat there for another hour then decided to head back. Now, while we were hiking back to the cabin, my brother told us that when he had ranged it with the rangefinder, after it looked at us, it bore its teeth. He said they were like a lion's teeth or a big cat's, a true predator. We're not sure what it was, and on our way back to the cabin, we stopped at Bob's and spoke with him about what we saw. What he said has stayed with me to this day. He told us he believed us, then told us a personal story about a Native American shapeshifter. Many years ago, when he first bought this property, there was a deer-like creature that would shriek through the woods at night. It sounded like a mountain lion. He said he had seen it twice, but never close enough to cause harm. Just close enough to know it wasn't a real deer, 
but an android-like creature trying to mimic one. He said it had been gone for 30 years. He hadn't seen it for a while, but assumed that's what we had witnessed. He told us to be careful, and with that, he sent us home, giving us a gar of Woods Brew. We got back to the cabin, and I hate to say it, but I was still scared, and I had no clue what I'd just seen. After Bob's story, I didn't know what to think of those woods. The rest of our stay was, luckily, uneventful, besides a raccoon in the bathhouse scaring the daylights out of my brother. But the memory of that creature will always stay with me. So if you ever hear a shriek in the mountains north of Cohasset, be very careful, as it could be that same shapeshifter we came across. Hiking in North Georgia from Anonymous. Each year, me and one of my closest friends, Dane, go down to visit his grandparents at their cabin in a nice but small peaceful town in the North Georgia mountains. My friend, his grandpa, and I are all outdoors kinds of people, so we're always looking for something fun for all of us to do around the area. One night, we decided to go on a night hike on a trail not too far from the cabin. Now, this isn't the kind of trail you're probably thinking of. It's really a gravel dirt road, but a lot of hunters, campers, motorbikers, and backpackers use it. We headed out to the trail, and right as we pulled up to it, we noticed an older, beat-up, suspicious-looking black Chevy SUV with two middle-aged men in it, parked next to the entrance of the trail. Now, even though this is a safe area, dealers and other kinds of sketchy activity and people often come out here or occur in these deep woods, so we avoided going on that trail and decided to head down to another trail about a half mile down the road. We pulled about 50 or so feet into the trail just outside the view of the road. Then we parked the truck and got out to start the hike. Our hike was off to a great start until we got about a mile in. We began to hear a dog barking from probably about 300 feet away. We decided to keep going, but the dog just would not stop barking and we didn't know if the dog was on a leash or not. Was it something that was going to bother or even attack us? So we decided to turn around and head back. When we were about maybe 1,000 or so feet away from the truck, we could see a car sitting behind my friend's grandpa's truck, running with its headlights on. This instantly made us worried, because who would just roll up behind a random truck at 10 at night on an isolated trail? Keep in mind, You'd have to drive into the trail to see where we parked the truck. It was not visible from the road. We stood there for about five minutes, trying to see if we could see anyone there. But since it was so dark and pretty far away, it was too hard to see anything. Fortunately for us, there was a pretty large tree next to the trail we were able to stand behind, so there was no way they could see us from where they were parked. My friend's grandpa took these night vision binoculars we had with us to try and get a better look but it was still not much help. We decided to just stand there and wait for them to turn around and leave, because there was no chance we were going to walk back with this random car with potential bad people in it, sitting behind our truck. After about 10 minutes of just standing there, to my absolute horror, the car drives around the truck and begins to head down the trail in our direction. As fast as we could, we climbed up this hill right next to us and hid behind a log that was sitting at the top. A few seconds later, the same beat-up black Chevy SUV we saw outside the other trail we were originally supposed to hike on comes driving down where we were just standing not even 15 seconds ago. The car had its windows rolled down and began to slow down as it drove past us. We were terrified. My heart was pounding out of my chest. We were terrified these guys would stop and sit there even worse, get out and begin looking for us. Fortunately, the car just kept driving and never stopped. As soon as the car was out of sight, we got out of our hiding spot, booking it back to the truck and getting the heck out of there. I know this may not be as scary as some others, but to us it was pretty frightening. We don't know who or what those guys wanted. My guess is they had a stash on that trail deeper in the woods and thought we stumbled upon it or something, and they were out there to confront us or even worse. A lot of things could have gone wrong. We could have walked up to the truck just as they pulled in. What if they came out and looked for us? What if they slashed the tires to the truck? 
What if they turned their headlights off and sat there and waited for us to come back? I mean, if we had made it to the trail two seconds too late, we would have been seen and possibly encountered by some very bad people. The following story was posted anonymously on 4chan on April 22nd, 2013. The Fallen Tree by Anon I've only shared this one with a few people, and still when I think about it, it freaks me out. I was 16 or so, and growing up in a small town, exploring out in the hills was the thing to do. This incident took place at the north end of Ruby Valley in Elko County, Nevada. It's slightly north of the road off of Highway 93 that goes into Ruby Valley. I always liked checking out old mine shafts and ghost towns, and that crap really intrigues me. At the Burger Bar in Wells, Nevada, where I'm from and grew up, they had these old turn-of-the-century maps under glass on the tables. On one of them, it showed several ghost towns just north of Ruby Valley, so I figured I'd go check them out, as I had not been in the area very often. I gassed up my 72 Dodge W200 pickup, and being a redneck and gun enthusiast, I grabbed my HK91 and set out. I'd found some old foundations in the lower country, and I started heading into the mountains themselves. I began finding abandoned mine shafts, it was pretty cool, so I kept going up. I took this ancient road that was no more than an overgrown cattle path by this point in history, and I soon came upon a tree. It was blocking the road. It was an old pinion pine about two feet in diameter that blocked the road. After the tree road, I continued straight for about 200 yards, then hooked right before coming back 180 degrees. I parked my truck in front of a tree and set out on foot. I grabbed my HK-91 with one 20-round magazine in the rifle, and put one 20-round mag in my back left pocket. I always had a rifle with me as I have encountered mountain lions and mine shafts before, and because generally I like to shoot stuff. I got up on the ridge lines and shoot boulders from a couple hundred yards away. As soon as I climbed up over a fallen tree, I had a freaking creepy feeling. It was like I was being watched. I continued on for about 200 yards, to the point where the road began curving right and gaining elevation, going towards the cabin. At this point, I had the realization that not only did I feel like I was being watched, it was also dead quiet outside. This was in June or so, as school had just gotten out. Everywhere you went, you would hear those freaking cicadas, but not here. It seemed as soon as I crossed that fallen tree, the mountains were silent. No bugs, no birds, nothing. Deafening silence. As I came up to the turn, there was this big freaking rock. The thing had to be about 15 feet in diameter. You could tell that it used to be on the road, but due to years of erosion, snow, and all that, it had slid down just slightly off the road. It seemed to be red limestone or something like that. It stood out since they're not that common in the area. I looked at the rock, and I could tell there were carvings in it at some point in time. Due to weathering, though, whatever was carved in it had been worn off. I kept walking up the road, being creeped out like crazy, but I really wanted to check out the old cabin, as it was pretty obvious no one had been there in quite a while. At this point, I was probably three hours off the road, I got up to this cabin, and as far as abandoned houses and cabins in Nevada go, this one was in pretty good shape. All the glass in the windows was intact, and there were remnants of curtains behind the windows. By then, there was something in the back of my mind telling me that I should be going. But I went in the cabin, and that's when I began to get the feeling that something was wrong. Most cabins you find out in the middle of nowhere in Nevada are barren. Nothing really left maybe a bit of broken furniture. This one was completely furnished. Time had taken its toll, of course, but everything was still there. What was left of an old mattress and bedding, plates and other cookware throughout the house, 
tattered clothing and personal effects, such as a chest, faded pictures, and the like. What really creeped me out was the dinner table. It was set for four people. Dinner plate, glasses, silverware. This was the first cabin I'd ever found that was in this condition. It was like whoever resided here just up and left in a hurry, leaving everything behind. I felt like I should not be in the cabin. I went outside to see if I could find the mine shaft or anything else. Once I was out the door, I decided to chamber around on my HK-91. The sound of me racking around echoed throughout the canyon and broke the silence. As little of a thing as it was, this calmed my nerves very slightly. Directly behind me was a well. It was still intact, and as I got closer it sounded like there was noise coming from it, like a slight breeze rustling through it. When I was within about 30 feet of it, I started to smell something. It was absolutely putrid. Something had definitely died in that well. The smell of decay was heavy in the air, with an acrid copper scent that tore at my nostrils. I didn't want to get any closer to the well. I started walking towards the left, where I could see the opening to a mine shaft up on the hill. The closer I got to it, I started feeling a breeze coming out of it. This isn't really uncommon if you've explored mine shafts before as the breeze could be coming in from another opening from the mine. But the thing was, it was perfectly calm. As far as I could see, there were no trees moving or any signs of wind. As I got closer, another thing that struck me as odd was the breeze coming out of the shaft. It was hot. Usually, it was cool, as most mine shafts maintain a constant temperature. The closer I got to the shaft, the slower I moved towards it. Nothing since I crossed that fallen tree seemed right. The closer I got to the opening of the mine shaft, the more of a feeling of dread and being watched I got. I was within about 15 feet of the shaft when the freaking smell hit me. That smell of decay and copper, but much stronger than what I smelled from the well. Right then, all of my spidey senses started going off. I had to get out of there. I began turning left to book it out of there when I saw a dark shadow moving in the opening of the mine shaft. Whatever it was, it appeared to be crouched down to fit in the mine shaft. Most mine shafts I've been in have 8 to 10 foot ceilings. At first, I thought it was a mountain lion. Then I truly remembered how big the shafts were. My mind raced, trying to figure out what the heck it was. It was too big to be a black bear which are rare in Nevada. I nearly froze with panic, and it slowly kept coming towards the opening of the mine shaft. It was probably within 10 feet of the opening, and the light was beginning to show what it was. It was covered from head to toe in grayish-brown fur. This thing suddenly freaking screamed. It was unlike anything I've ever heard in my life. My ears were ringing from it. I flipped into panic mode and did what any good redneck would do. I shot it. I pulled up my HK-91, placed the front blade on what appeared to be its center mass, and ripped off five rounds as fast as I could accurately shoot. If you've ever shot big game with a large caliber rifle, you know the sound when you connect with something. I heard four solid thunks and one round that went high. This made it scream even louder than it had, in pain, at this time, I started hearing more and separate screams coming from over in the well and in the hills above the mine shaft. I started running down the hill as fast as I could, in the tree line above the road, approximately 75 to 125 yards. I could see fast movement. Rocks were tumbling down the hill and there were several other screams. From the mine shaft, I could hear the wailing of whatever the heck I'd shot, and whatever it was, my shots had definitely connected. It was hurting. It was up in the tree line. They were running from tree to tree on all fours, getting closer to me. As I ran towards the rock, I was shooting in the general vicinity of the movement on top of the hill. By the time I got to the limestone rock, I had expended the 20-round mag in the rifle. I ripped it out and put in my spare magazine, chambered around, and started sprinting towards the fallen tree, approximately 200 yards away by now. I kept glancing back 
and whatever they were, they were staying in the trees. I could make out their masses and fur, but they would not stay in the open. I got back to the fallen tree, and I ate crap trying to jump over it. I got up off my rear, fired between 12 to 15 rounds the closest movement, which was now about 50 yards away. I heard a few rounds connect, and those things began to scream louder. Between the screaming and gunshots, my ears were damn near dead. I opened the door of my truck and got the heck in, starting it up as fast as I could. I backed up to turn around, and I darned near put my truck down in the canyon. As I began going forward to leave on the road I came in on, I finally got a good look at one of them. It was crouched over with its front feet on the tree, covered from head to toe in grayish brown fur with long slender fingers and claws tipping off those fingers. The back of it was hunched and the face was slender, most closely resembling that of a badger but with sunken in eyes. It was shaking its head back and forth and it sounded like it was attempting to speak but it was so garbled and with the noise of my truck I could not make out what it was. I averaged about 50 to 60 miles per hour on a crappy dirt road that I'd done 15 on on the way in. I did not slow down or stop until I got back to pavement. By then I was so shaken I had to stop and collect myself. I got back to town and I was in a bit of shock. My dad had been a guide in the Ruby Mountains for about 20 years. He asked me how my trip went and where I went. He could tell that I was startled and asked where I'd been. I told him that I'd been north of Ruby Valley, he got quiet, and asked if I'd seen a cabin with a fallen tree over the road. I told him yes. He looked me in the eyes and told me that is somewhere I should never go again, especially alone. We never spoke about it again after that. I've never been back there. Part of the reason is I live in western Nevada now. But in the back of my mind, there is something that is telling me I should go back. And one day I do want to go back. This was in 2001, before camera phones, and I was too broke to afford a digital camera. I want to go back with a camera, preferably a GoPro on my helmet, and with several friends that are armed. Just something about there, even with the crap I experienced. It's drawing me back. One day I will go back. I guess I need closure for what happened that day. After a few years passed, I tried researching it. I asked some old timers. One of them told a story about the rubies. During the 40s and 50s, the Army Air Corps operated out of the Wendover Air Base. Every now and then during crap weather, a B-25, B-17, or B-29 would smack the rubies due to poor visibility. Some of the local ranchers got recruited to help the military go up to a crash site during the winter to recover the bodies. The rancher I was talking to told me that it took them three days to get to where the crash was on horseback and finally recover the bodies. He said when they got to the wreckage, all crew members were laid out side by side next to each other in a clearing in the wreckage. Many of them had severed limbs and it was apparent all died on impact. Somehow, they ended up laid out next to each other. This was at nearly 10,000 feet in elevation, too. The Cabin on the Lake From Judy A. This happened back in August in 2001. I was 14 years old and about to start high school when Dad took me and my older sister let's call her Ruth, fishing in Canada. My dad was in the New York textile trade and had a business contact in Montreal. They planned to bond over fishing in northern Quebec. The Canadian friend was taking his teenage son, so dad was taking his two middle daughters, me and Ruth. We were really close and were generally called the partners in crime by our parents from how often we got into trouble so mom thought us being in the wilderness would be harmless. Our destination was a two-day drive from New York City. We drove to Montreal on the first day, and the next morning we met up with Dad's business buddy, then drove north. 
I mean, way north, too. It was lovely to look at, but it was the part of Quebec where speaking English was rare. Ruth had two years of high school French, and I had some junior high stuff. Dad was fluent, and the waitress at the place where we stopped for lunch was tolerant of our mistakes, because we were trying our best to get it right. A couple of hours after stopping for lunch, we left the main highways and were soon on the road, where it seemed to be just us and our two SUVs and trucks from local loggers. Ruth and I thought it was cool to see these big trucks roll past with huge tree trunks on them. I mean, we were two girls from the suburbs, and people really did that. Ruth and I joked about finding cute lumberjacks. We were still giggling about that when we pulled into the place that handled the fishing. Dad bought some fishing licenses, and we loaded everything, including food, into the company's boat and headed down to the river. It was really picturesque. I mean, deep forests, mountains in the distance, the clear lake, and no sound except for the motor of the boat. We passed a few cabins on the shore. Each had a little dock and a few rowboats tied up to them. A few had smoke coming from their chimneys. We kept on going south, deeper across the lake. Dad had told us we were going to a cabin on a lake. What he didn't tell us was that it was a cabin on a lake. Like it was on an island in the middle of the lake, and the only way to reach it was by boat. The island was flat and barely large enough for the cabin, a woodpile, and the dock with a couple of rowboats on it. The closest land was a couple of hundred feet off. Cute lumberjacks? We weren't even going to get close to a squirrel. The boat pulled up to the small wooden dock on the island, and we offloaded these supplies. To be fair, the cabin was pretty nice. Bunk beds and a wood stove. We settled in and started work on dinner, tinned stew. We tried to get to know the son of Dad's contact. He was 15 years old and kind of an awkward nerd. We all walked around on the shore of the island and tried to be friendly, but behind his back, Ruth and I kept rolling our eyes. The things we did for Dad, we thought. We went to bed early. There wasn't any TV or anything, so why not? and we needed to get up early after all. So we were in bed at a time that in New York would have us complaining. There was still lots of giggling between us until Dad complained and Ruth said, this is why boys don't have slumber parties, which caused more laughing. We got up before dawn and had breakfast, bacon, toast, and coffee. I hate eggs. And even with the morning chill, the lake looked wonderful in the gray light, with mist rolling over the surface. We headed out into the lake in two rowboats, and I discovered I really hate fishing. The dads were getting on great, which was the point of the trip, and the Canadian guy kept trying to talk to Ruth, ignoring the fact we'd both told him we both had boyfriends back home. Me? I tried to catch a fish and prayed to God Dad wouldn't want to teach me how to gut it if I did catch one. For the record, I did catch a fish. I caught one fish during the whole time we were there. And it was the largest any of us caught. It was a big pike. Everyone else caught a couple of fish, enough for a few meals, and we headed back to the island cabin for lunch. I had no interest in going back on the lake in the afternoon, and told Dad I'd look after the cabin, keep the fire going, and prep dinner. I guess Dad knew I had given it a good try, and if I was willing to stay behind, that would be enough. Ruth looked at me pleadingly, since she'd be alone in the rowboat with that guy. But I wasn't going to back out, just to float out there. Everyone else went back to torture fish, and I straightened up the cabin, fed the fire, and went outside. It was so peaceful. There was no sound. And that's when things got weird. I was gazing at the shore and realized there was no noise. No birdsong, no nothing. The undergrowth out there was so dense I don't think you could get through it. I was looking upon land that I didn't think any white man had ever tread on. 
but there was something there, tall and humanoid, in the shadows, looking at me. I couldn't get a good look, and I'd almost convinced myself it was my imagination running wild. When the figure moved. It wasn't much, but it was enough to let me know that I'd seen it move. It was tall, and the head seemed like a deer. But do you get deer that stand six or seven feet tall at the shoulder? Then it moved again, and I realized it was on two legs, not four, and it was staring back at me. I was extremely glad there was a lake between us. This thing gave off a feeling of hostility. I wanted to run back and barricade myself in the cabin until dad came back, but I stood my ground. Once again, I reminded myself there was a whole lake between us. Then soon it was gone, fading back into the woods. I backed to the cabin, and once inside, I bolted the door. I grabbed a paperback book in my bag to read, to distract myself, to not think about what I saw. I ended up losing myself in the book until Dad banged on the door and wanted to know why it was locked. I didn't want to tell him. I didn't want him to think I was a baby. So I said the wind kept blowing it open and I was sick of closing it. He seemed to accept that. They brought in their catches, and we were having fish for dinner. The men folk went to clean them. I took that chance to tell Ruth. She was my best friend, and I needed to tell someone. Unfortunately, she was still teed off at me, having to spend the afternoon on the lake with the geek guy, and she teased me, saying I was just hallucinating. I was hurt by this, and luckily she backed off, but we were both in a bad mood as evening set in. Dinner was really good. I mean, fresh fish out of the lake? It was delicious. As everyone was settling in and the dads were playing chess, I went out to look at the stars overhead. They were amazing. No light pollution at all. I looked out over the lake. There was nothing there to spoil the peace. Then I looked at the shore, the place I'd looked before, and it was completely dark. But somehow, I knew it was there, looking at me. Whatever sense I had evaporated. I just knew there was something there, and that it hated us, hated me, hated people. Whatever I was to it, I felt like the embodiment of what it hated. I didn't think I'd been there that long, but suddenly there was a hand on my forearm, and I let out a little scream of surprise. It was Ruth, saying that I'd been out there for a couple of hours, and everyone was going to bed. Two hours? No way. It was just a few minutes, right? There was no giggling that night but Ruth sort of accepted there was something bugging me, even if she didn't see it. The next morning, everyone else went fishing again. Dad just took it for granted that I would stay behind. But Ruth made a real effort to get me in the boat. However, I didn't want to go. I should have. I found myself staring at the shore again. Was it there? How deep was the water? Could it swim out to me? Then I realized I was thinking, could I swim over there? The idea of trying that took hold and started to grow, becoming a near obsession. I could do it. I really could. I was standing there when the others came back from the morning on the lake. By now, Ruth was really worried about me. And when I asked about swimming, Dad looked at me like I was nuts saying it was far too cold to be doing that. We would be leaving that afternoon, and I kept standing, staring at the dense woods, where no white man or woman had set foot, and wondered what could happen if I was the first. I was really glad when we got back on the boat to go back to the cars. 
Less than a month later, I was in high school, and 9-11 happened. The world changed around me. Since then, I've been in lots of woods, and I even became involved with my church's youth league. But I've never been in woods as primal as the ones in Canada. I wonder what would happen if I ever find them again. The Beast in the Woods From Reet Yeet One I've lived in the woods for a while now, and it's been nice. As beautiful as it was, I've now run into something not as nice. It began as something here or there. Something would vanish mysteriously and I would not end up finding it. But then it started to get a little worse. You see, I have this chicken coop because I thought it would be fun to raise some chickens and get some eggs out of the whole ordeal. But about three to four months ago, they would start to go missing. Well, I hate to say it, but I think I finally found what has been taking them. Throw back to about three weeks ago. I was shutting my place down one night, around 1.30 to 2 a.m. I was just locking up the place when the automatic lights near my shed went on. I thought to myself that this is weird, but it was probably just a wild animal snooping around. At this point, I had reinforced the chicken coop, so at this moment I wasn't too scared and I just wanted to see what was snooping around my house. I peeked out the window and saw something similar to a wolf, but something about it was just really wrong. I couldn't yet tell what was wrong with it, but all I knew was that I didn't like it. I watched helplessly as it got into the coop, which I just thought was impenetrable for anything other than a human. After it made its way into the coop, I stood there, dumbfounded at what I saw. A moment later, the thing exited the coop. I couldn't believe my eyes. The creature was standing on its hind legs. I was a heck of a lot more confused by this when, bless his heart, my dog let out a snarl at the creature. Before I could react, the beast was looking at us. My dog instantly stopped and slunk down. I followed suit quickly. I quietly called for my dog to come to me, and we hunkered down in my bedroom. Thankfully, my room is on the second floor, so I thought I wouldn't have to worry about that thing seeing us. I locked my door and put my dresser in front of the door, hoping if that monster found its way inside, I'd be able to hold it at bay for at least a while. I have a decently powerful shotgun, a Remington 870, if you're interested. I grabbed it and loaded it, just in case. So there I sat on my bed, gun in hand, with my scared dog, listening to that thing pace and grunt around my house throughout the night. At daybreak, I slowly moved the dresser away from the door and slinked downstairs, looking out my windows around the cabin, and I saw nothing. I let out a sigh of relief and called my dog down because screw this place and screw these woods, I grabbed the keys to my jeep and left. The woods around my house were bone-chillingly silent that morning, and if you know anything about the woods, that is not a good sign. As I made my way to my jeep, I looked around, and I spotted it, that thing, standing about 100 feet away from us, I wasted little time unloading the shotgun in its direction, hoping that I hit it. I think I did, because the thing let out a scream so horrid, it was almost louder than my shotgun. It ran off, but I didn't see where it went, and I didn't care. I ran to the jeep and opened the door for my dog and myself to get in. I sped down that dirt road at breakneck speed when, of course, what do I see standing on the side of the road? That same beast. I sped up, and I was able to make it out of the woods, wondering how that thing caught up with me. I made it into town at record speed. 
Once I slowed down, I caught my breath and composed myself, then decided to drive to the nearest big city in my state because I can't bring myself to go back there alone. Me and some friends are going to go up there to clear out my house, and I'll never see that place again. It'll be nice to be in the city again, at least. As an update, when we did go up there to move my things out, I saw it again. It came out of the woods and seemed to just watch us, and apparently the few slugs I fired at it didn't seem to do anything to it. Thankfully, my friends are interested in guns too, and had brought their assortment of firearms, just in case it got ballsy. Before long, we finished packing up in the car. We started to pull out when I realized one of my friends wasn't there with us. He hadn't gotten in the car. We immediately went back down the driveway and searched the premises, looking for my now missing friend. I hoped we would have found him in the house, distracted or something, but no, it was worse than that. We found him outside, barely conscious, claw marks and bite marks on him. We got him into the car and sped to the nearest hospital. When we were asked what happened, we didn't know what to say. We couldn't just say that some wolf-like humanoid thing mauled him, so we said it was a bear. Luckily, he's slated to make a full recovery, but that was just too close for me. Any part of me that still wanted to live there died that day. And that's all for now. I'm thankfully safe living with my parents until I find a new place. Long story short, you can never be too comfortable living alone in the woods. You may just find yourself dead. Dogman Infestation from Mallory K. I'm going to start out by saying that I'm sorry. Don't assume this is one of those stories where I pass the monster from my head into yours. I just need to get this known. I'm Palestinian, and we have our own version of the dogman called the Golfalfa. I always assumed it was fake. As the story goes, supposedly, one of the high-up members in Hamas and a member of the Directorate of Paranormal Defense struck a deal with intelligent creatures that were not human, that had fur and could speak Pasinda. To me, this origin story sounded like something made up to give hope to Palestinians, sort of like a we-can-do-anything propaganda. But some people swear up and down it was true. I didn't believe any of this, not until I went to America and had an experience for myself. My cousin and I came to Michigan to film his latest propaganda film. We were staying at this cabin in Higgins Lake, which had to be at least 500 kilometers of forest, with caves scattered throughout. We went to shoot a scene in the forest. My cousin thinks we should shoot it at night. We did this for many nights and days, it was fine for three weeks, but come the third day of week four, we're packing up our equipment from a hard day of filming, when we begin to hear scratching and growls. My cousin looks content, almost as if he'd heard a friend's voice. I find this strange. This goes on for six nights, always between 8pm and 6am. On the eighth day after the first incident, we see scratch marks on the side of the cabin. My cousin almost cries, but it seemed more like tears of joy. On the 14th day, we see fur stuck in the thornback strawberry bush. My cousin speaks under his breath, Kumatulo, which to my knowledge at the time was gibberish. On the 17th day, I see at the back of the cabin something that I thought was a wolf but it made no sense. This was Michigan. I didn't think there were wolves in this part of USA. Then, I swear, I see it stand up on two legs. It's bipedal. My cousin comes into my room and says to me, Mallory, are you need be of the sleep? He doesn't speak good English. 
I reply, telling him what I just saw. He sits me down and tells me the same story he always told me, that Palestine made a pact with the Golfalfa. I honestly called bullcrap, but I was truly considering what he was saying for the first time in my life, as if it might be true. The twenty-eighth day was the worst. My cousin calls me outside to watch the stars, as we don't get much of that in Palestine. When I go outside, this creature comes around the bend. At first I don't see it, but I hear a familiar phrase, Fala majirka gudar mayari basura. That is Pasenda for, it's been so long, friend. My cousin stands up and says again, Guma Dulo, and starts to approach this beast. That's when I realized my cousin was a maniac, not only a psychopath, but a suicidal idiot. After what felt like hours, but was probably closer to five seconds, my cousin spoke in Pasenda again. Ha, pire, camarade. Or, hello, comrade. And this a wolf begins speaking in Pasenda. I don't know what was said because I was too terrified and confused. As soon as I'm about to run away, my cousin stops me, telling me not to run. My cousin then bends down to say something. I realize then there were two smaller figures too. What he says I didn't hear, but then he says, Paz fa kalu hir da, or may we meet again. At that moment, I understood his story might be true. We had something to do with them. He wasn't a liar or a suicidal idiot. He behaved as a savior or family to them. The fact that these dogman stories involve assaults or even death, I can't help but feel at fault. Now you understand why I apologized. We Palestinians believe these things to be intelligent, emotional beasts, and that we may have something to do with this infestation. I do believe my cousin did what was best for them, but not for humanity. I can't explain why, but he has an unrealistic attachment to these beasts. Number 1. It Almost Got in the Cabin Submitted by Iced Earth Fan 666 Me and my friends, Ron, Mick, and Avery, decided to spend a week in the woods. We went to a cabin that was owned by Avery's dad, and the area was spectacular. There was a platform on a tree for hunting, and a creek not too far south of the cabin. We all went to the creek to fish. Ron pointed out a decent sized snake in the fishing area. We all thought that was pretty cool. Mick took a picture right when a hawk swooped down and grabbed it. It was breathtaking and a little startling. We walked back to the cabin to make hot dogs. On the way there, we saw a lot of deer to the left and right on the trail, but the one that stuck out the most was extremely tall. We could only see its head behind one of the trees, but it stood a few feet higher than your typical deer. The thing was staring at us, which was odd. It was the first deer I've ever seen not just run away at the sight of humans. Mick and Avery were just looking at it, but Ron, for whatever reason, was trying his best to beckon the deer over to us until I said, it's not a freaking dog. We continued to walk back to the cabin when we got there, Avery started the fire for the hot dogs. Me and Mick made a little competition of throwing a tomahawk into a dead tree while waiting for the food, and Ron smoked a cigarette. The night was pretty normal. We had some good food and drank a little. But do keep in mind, none of us were drunk. I don't think any of us were on to our second drink yet. We started talking about the apparently fearless deer we had seen earlier. Avery said he was examining the deer when he noticed something that we hadn't. According to Avery, the deer was much larger than normal. He claimed around the size of a horse. We dismissed this as just a rare specimen who happened to be that big. Around midnight, 
we all went inside the cabin to settle in. I was asleep pretty well until I heard something outside. It sounded like a buck call. It was deeper and just off. The sound got closer and closer, and then I saw a face in my window. It was the head of a buck. I could make out large antlers, and when it opened its mouth to breathe, I saw teeth that shouldn't have been that sharp. Teeth that didn't fit in a deer's mouth. Whatever it was, it was over seven feet tall because its head reached the top part of the window and its antlers went above it. In comparison, I'm six foot three and you would only see the top of my head from inside the cabin if I stood outside the window. I don't think the thing saw me because it stood there for a while. It left my window eventually and I thought that it was gone. But not two minutes later, I heard someone screaming. It was Ron. All of us woke up and ran into Ron's room. He told us something big had reached its arm into his open window, trying to get in, trying to get to him. Then I admitted my story as well. I told everyone about the face I just saw in my window. Avery ran to lock every door and window. All the while, we kept hearing that distorted buck call coming from just outside. Then we began to hear pounding on the walls and the doors of the cabin. I don't know what it was exactly, but I know it wanted in. It was trying its very best to get inside to us. We weren't about to go outside. Our only hope was daytime. Hopefully, it would leave by then, and if it didn't, I don't know what we would do. Luckily, Avery's dad did let him bring his shotgun to the cabin, so we did feel a little bit safer. By morning, there was no sign of the creature. We went outside, only to find hoof prints the size of a large man's feet. There were also deep claw marks on the door. We found dead deer on the roof of the cabin. We didn't stay there much longer. We booked it out of those woods as soon as we could. Ever since then, Avery and Mick have only been back a couple of times. As for me and Ron, we never went back to that cabin again. After the event, Mick has had trouble sleeping. He can't seem to get over it, and Ron is jumpier and more nervous than ever. Carnivorous deer man, let's never meet again. Number two, The Haunted Cabin by the River. Submitted by Spencer C. Based on the title, you're probably thinking this story is about a creepy old abandoned cabin. Well, that's not the case. The cabin in this story is actually very modern and my friend still lives there with his family to this day. The cabin is in a very beautiful part of Montana, right next to a river. My friend Jeff has lived in this cabin for about 10 years. When I first met him, I thought his house was pretty cool. I mean, living in a big fancy cabin year round, surrounded by nothing but a river and woods, what's not to like? Well, apparently a lot. The first and only experience I have personally had with weird things happening at his house happened about two months after I met Jeff. Jeff had not said that his house was haunted. I think he didn't want to scare me or he was in denial. But after this, he told me about his experiences in the house. My experience took place in his theater, which was very creepy if the projector and screen were not on. We were playing on his PlayStation when all of a sudden the console just shut off. The lights were dimmed, so the room wasn't in complete darkness. The lighting was just enough to make out everything in the room, but not clearly. Jeff looked over at me, and I watched as the color in his face drained entirely. He then told me I needed to leave the room. I did as he said, and he was right behind me. We slowly exited the theater room. Once we were out, I asked him what had happened. He then told me that after the console shut off, 
he saw a silhouette of a man standing right behind me. After this, he told me about other things that had been happening in his house, things that had been going on all these years. I'm not going to tell you about all of them, but most of them were far more scary than what had just happened to us. Jeff said that every night at around five in the morning, the door to his bedroom would open and slam shut multiple times for about five minutes. He also would hear his voice being yelled from deep in the woods when he would go outside, his own voice. I remember this one time while we were on a Skype call, there was someone laughing in the background. It sounded like a child, though Jeff doesn't have a brother younger than him. He doesn't know exactly why his house is haunted, and because he lived in front of a river, sometimes the rafters would often stop in his backyard. When they first moved in, a nice family stopped by while they were rafting, while Jeff and his family were outside. They said they were happy that someone had finally moved into the house. Jeff's mom was confused because there was an old couple who lived there before Jeff's family moved in but the rafters said that they just assumed that the place was always empty because the house was always pitch black inside. There were never any lights on and all the windows were always closed. Jeff has gotten used to all the paranormal activity in the house, but one question sticks with me. What happened in there to make it so haunting? Number three the rude and terrifying awakening, submitted by Biohawk5. I was eight years old, and it was the summer of 2009. My parents and I were going to stay in a cabin at a campground called Kinzu for about a week or so. I had had many good times there. Dad and I used to camp out on an island in the massive lake and go fishing but this was the first time we stayed at that cabin. The cabins we stayed in were pretty small. It was literally one room with a bunk bed and another bed beside it. The first day there, I called the top bunk and my parents went along with it. Dad just took the bottom bunk and mom took the other bed. We had fun on our first day. I remember riding my bike on the road that led to the cabins. I remember settling in that night. The bunk bed was wooden, and it had a built-in wooden ladder to climb up and down on. Before falling asleep that night, I was reading a book for about 20 minutes or so. I woke up an unknown amount of time later, and it was pitch black in the room, and I just couldn't go back to sleep. I had no idea why. I laid there for a little while, closing my eyes and shifting positions trying my best to fall back to sleep. And finally, when I was just about to drift off, I heard the worst, most horrible sound I have ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> the best way I could describe it is demonic, deep laughter. And to my horror, it was followed by the sound of something climbing up the wooden ladder. Immediately, I screamed for my parents and the climbing suddenly stopped. I was bawling my eyes out and I told them what had happened. They didn't see or hear anything and they thought I had just had a nightmare. I ended up sleeping with my mom for the rest of the trip, but I still couldn't fall asleep for that night. I had a hard time the following nights as well. And to this day, on my very own bunk bed, I can't fall asleep on the top. It just creeps me out too much. I want to believe that it was just my imagination. It can get the better of you at times. Then again, it horrifies me to think about what might have been climbing up that ladder. I don't think I wanted to see it. Number four, close call, submitted by Wolfcat Butterfly. I grew up in rural Indiana. Small towns centered around farming and blue collar work related to farming. 
Classic cases were towns were filled with people who all knew each other. Baseball, particularly the local little league travel teams, were the biggest events in the area. When the Colts weren't losing, they sucked back in the day. Those came complete with town barbecues, picnics, and parades. It was like something out of a movie, and the scene is still something I hold very dear in my memories, despite one dark event, which still haunts me. One day, I was attending my older brother's baseball game a few towns over. Now, when I wasn't physically playing the game, I could usually only stomach watching a few innings from the rough pine bleachers before I got too antsy. So about 100 yards away, towards the tree line, there was a busy playground full of children of all ages, a few of which I knew from the local teams. They were around my age. After running over and exploring the playground, which I'd never been to before, and playing a few rounds of tag with some of the other kids, a few of the others my age and I were approached by an older boy, most likely in his late teens from what I remember. He began talking with us, telling us some creepy stories about the town and the area around it. I remember him seeming very charming and entertaining in the way he told the stories. He had a relatively captive audience for a while. Soon, for various reasons, the other kids I was with either lost interest and walked away, or they needed to check back with their family by the ball field. So that just left me with the older boy. He spoke about a cabin he liked to explore, which was right inside the tree line. He said that two brothers had gotten in a fight a few years back. They began swinging axes and shovels at one another, and apparently, they ended up passing away from the injuries they gave one another. He said I was probably too scared to check it out with him, especially since I was so young. But being a young boy, I was always trying to prove myself to be tougher and more mature than my peers. So I insisted that his little story didn't scare me, and I would actually love to see the house and explore it for a minute. Now, I know what you're thinking, that I'm dumb for even going along with this and being alone with any kind of stranger but bear in mind that I was a young child. I was raised in a place where nothing bad really ever happened, and naively, I always assumed that everyone was as kind as the last person and always gave them the benefit of the doubt. So we stepped into the woods and instantly began going up a steep hill. When we had gotten to the top, we could see the ball field below through the trees we then dog-legged to our right about 90 degrees and traveled along the top of the hill, which turned out to be more of a ridge. We then walked into a clearing, which was actually accessible by vehicle from the ball field. We cut across and right into another tree line. As we climbed this hill, I finally asked if the cabin was much further because I had assumed it was very close by. He assured me it was just over the hill and we continued on. I would later find out that around this time, my father, who had been watching the baseball game, finally noticed that he couldn't see me anymore. Looking panicked, another father who was a grizzled veteran and friend of the family told him they needed to get in his truck and look for me right away. The last place the other kids had seen me was the woods directly behind the playground, not the woods that we dog-legged over to. My father and the vet tore through the field in the pickup truck, disregarding the baseball game. The veteran, understanding how to evade people in the woods, correctly assumed that I had been lured away in a deceptive direction. They drove right up into the tree line below me, where I was about halfway up the hill with the stranger. They could see me in the trees and began coming towards me swiftly and aggressively. I turned to attempt to introduce the older friend I had made, but he must have taken off as soon as he heard the truck coming towards us. I was promptly scolded, but then embraced by my father and the veteran who were just happy to see me okay again. We later found out that there had been multiple kidnappings and cases of abductions from that park, and some of the children were found in an abandoned cabin that really was at the top of that hill and what went on there 
change their lives forever. I remember the boy who tried to take me. He was rather skinny with curly brown hair. I remember him looking like one of the older brothers from the Brady Bunch in the later episodes. To this day, I still search Google for arrests made in that area, and I've never seen anyone that resembles him. Though it's been many years since that day, ultimately, I'm extremely thankful of God and the swift action of those who saved me. I'm thankful for them rescuing me from either an early death or a life altered by emotional trauma. Don't go to a creepy abandoned cabin in the woods with a complete stranger. And number five, Shadow of the Skinwalker, submitted by Xanathar. It was late 1996, in a newer subdivision of an area called Pinnacle Peak, just north of Phoenix, Arizona. Our home was practically developed right over fresh desert, with breathtaking rocky peaks in the near distance. The desert was actually federal land, and at the time you really weren't supposed to venture back there. But I was a teen in my junior year of high school. I loved to ride my bike back there, hike and tip junk to look for scorpions. I soon made a new friend, and he lived about two miles away. He lived across from another part of the desert. We would often go to this one area where there was a little alcove in the peak side. It was a cool spot that we loved to hang out in. Now I realize how scary it was to be back there. Rattlesnakes, scorpions, and jumping cacti would stick in you like fish hooks. And even once we ran into a couple of guys driving a beat up pickup truck who stopped in front of my bike that was in their path. They threatened to run my bike over as well as us if we didn't move it. My friend and I said nothing and just moved it out of the way. But yeah, it was a pretty dangerous place. My friend and I rolled huge boulders from the top of the peak that would roll down smashing everything below. It was fun to watch, although we didn't think of the danger at the time. I would ricochet small rocks with my slingshot against other rocks and pretty much anything around. Later on, that friend of mine moved to Florida and I once in a while went back there by myself. One day I collected some jumping cactus so I could plant one in my yard because we had some loony neighbors. They were fighting with the homeowners association over his solar panels on the roof. This guy and his kids would graffiti fences and act out violently against all the neighbors. So I figured I would plant these nasty cacti under the fence and if they jumped over, a stinging surprise would await. Anyway, when I was collecting these, an unmarked black helicopter came out of nowhere. Something in my mind said to get out of there right away. So I hopped on my bike and rode out as fast as I could back to my place. But it was well over a mile away. Eventually, I made it back home and I ran to the back ducking my head in the pool because I was about to get heat stroke. Moments later, that same helicopter was hovering right above our backyard. I didn't look up once. I remained calm and pet my dog. After a minute or two, it left, but it was really strange. Might I add that behind the area I was in, it was a shooting range for Luke Air Force Base. Now this is where the true story really begins. Soon after this, I began to have really strange things happen to me in my sleep. I'm talking about suddenly waking up and finding myself swinging my pillow at something very violently and not knowing why. It happened many times and often I would notice a ghostly cloud, face or figure that would vanish as soon as I realized that something was there. Later on, I graduated and I started a graphic design school that was in Tempe, Arizona. I would drive from my parents' house to the school very early in the morning. And once there, I would nap a couple of hours in the car before the school started. One day, I woke up to see a figure next to my window. I freaked out and I was wide awake. 
yet my eyes closed again and I could not reopen them. I had a knife in the door, so I tried to grab it, but I could not move anything. Moments after, I finally break free and I cannot figure out what had just happened. Years go by and I move back to Washington State where I grew up and my parents had moved back when I was going to school. I later met a woman and married her in 2001. I kept having the same ghostly cloud experiences every few months, and even a couple of times, my wife had witnessed the same thing. We would have fascinating conversations about my sleep, and she would say that often I would be sitting up in my sleep, eyes wide open, and talking in some ancient sounding language. She would usually nudge me and tell me to go back to bed, and apparently I would listen. We laughed and thought it was funny, and just some harmless sleepwalking. 2004 arrives, and we had moved to Texas in late 2003. We rented a small cedar cabin in Smithville, Texas. My wife then was working for the airlines and would not get home until anywhere around midnight to three in the morning. Well, one night in June of 2004, everything was about to change forever. I closed at my job and got off at around 9 p.m. I got home and was relaxing and listening to music. I fell asleep around 11.30 p.m. and my wife got home around 2.30 in the morning. After I went to sleep, I have no memory of events until I regained consciousness, which I will describe more into the incident. The following is my ex-wife's side of the story. She described as she pulled up to the cabin that she could hear what sounded like dogs running around our cabin and growling. She was creeped out by this and got inside quickly. Once inside, she could hear more growling coming from our dark room. She went to investigate and kind of forgetting about the dog growling outside, she sees me standing on the bed in such a way that seems inhuman and contorted. My mouth was just hanging down and my eyes went dark. It was very dark in the room, but at first she didn't think much of it and thinks that I was just sleepwalking a bit. She thought that she could nudge me again and I would just lay back down as usual. She was very, very wrong. As she got closer, she said that I leapt on top of her like a predator and began choking her neck. She describes not even wanting to look at me she feared that something truly and exceptionally wicked had taken control of my body. She was so scared for her life that she kicked me away, but it didn't work, even though she kept kicking. After this incident, I didn't even have the slightest marks on my body from her struggling. As this is going on, she's screaming for her life, calling out my name and crying out for help. Somehow, I finally break free of whatever is controlling me. It's like my soul was held back and I slowly regain control over the fading power the thing had. I could hear the most horrid and heart-wrenching demonic screeching I'd ever heard. I could not imitate it no matter how hard I tried. When I finally realized something god-awful was happening, I tried to tell her that everything was okay now. When I spoke, my voice was not my own. If you've ever seen the Mothman Prophecies, the movie where Indrid Cold is on the phone and speaks in that low, creepy voice, that's exactly how I sounded. And I remember her saying, no, it's not you. A few minutes passed by and I was completely free of whatever just happened and back to normal. Needless to say, I was absolutely terrified. We both were. We were both in tears and we knew something had just attacked us, something that wasn't just some waking dream or night terror. Somehow, the bedroom door shut itself during the incident and my cat, Saber, was running in circles, creeped out as well. This cat loved me to death and was never afraid of me until that night. All of my weird happenings seemed to climax in that cabin. Well, my wife and I did not go back to sleep that night. I had to work in the morning and she went to church to get some holy water and spread it around the cabin. We both prayed, even though at the time I thought God and prayer were ridiculous. When I woke up in the morning as I went outside, 
the air was freezing cold. I could feel the hair on the back of my head stand up. I felt like something was outside, watching me, and it was angry. After that, roughly two weeks later, I was home alone at a sleep and woke up suddenly to see a statue of Apollo that we got from Walmart, except now its eyes were glowing blue. I thought the moonlight was shining in them, so I grabbed it and brought it into the dark. To my horror, the eyes were still glowing. I refused to give in to fear, and I put it on the floor and covered it with a blanket. Then I went to bed. After this, not one single time did I have any more ghostly clouds above me, no more talking in my sleep or eyes open, absolutely nothing. The only thing was after 2004, my relationship with my wife slowly went downhill. We had two children and in 2010 we divorced. Now in my home I do hear knocks in the kitchen and sometimes in the hallways, but I do not feel threatened by it. I met with some paranormal experts in 2008 who believed that it is possible that I attracted a skinwalker out in the Arizona desert by my teenage destructive or intrusive nature and it had been following me all those years. All I know is that I'm no Bible warrior and never will be, but there's nothing wrong with just believing in God and asking for help when it's needed. And keep in mind, negative energy feeds from fear. I never drank or did drugs of any kind, and before this, I had never had any sleep problems. You can tell me I had night terrors, but personally, I know it was much, much more than that. Sometimes you just have to have your own experience to know that there is much more to our world than what meets the eye. Number one, The Watcher in the Woods, submitted by Lisa R. This encounter took place in 2010 my boyfriend and I were in our mid-twenties. It was summertime. We were lucky enough to get time off work at the same time, so we decided to spend a couple of nights at my family cabin. This cabin is located in northwestern Ontario, Canada. It's in a remote area about 40 minutes away from the nearest town. It's near a mid-sized lake surrounded by dense forest. There are only 20 cabins on that lake, spread out quite far from one another. We were there in the middle of the week, so there really weren't that many other people on the lake. I should mention that this cabin is on an island. Our plan was to get there Tuesday night and we'd be leaving by Thursday morning. We arrived and spent the first night without incident. On Wednesday, we took the canoe out for a short ride. Then we parked it on the mainland and went on a hike down an old logging road. The road hasn't been driven down in years it's overgrown and as far as I knew, people only used it for blueberry picking nowadays. But it goes into the bush for quite a few kilometers. The two of us hiked down this road for about two hours. Soon we sat down for a small lunch, then decided to turn back. On our way back, I could not shake the heavy feeling that we were being watched and followed. It only occurred to me then that if anything bad were to happen to us, no one was coming to help. In hindsight, we should have told someone about our hiking plans, considering we went two hours in, just in case, but it was too late for that. I tried my best to dismiss how I felt, and I didn't mention it to my boyfriend. We found the canoe where we had left it tied up. We got in and began paddling home. I was in the back of the canoe, steering. I couldn't help but turn around and look behind us. And the very first time I did so, I saw a large shadow move among the trees. It was a short distance from where we had parked the canoe. When I looked back a second time, I saw nothing. So I quickly dismissed what I saw originally. I reminded myself that your eyes can play tricks on you very easily when you're looking into the shadows of a densely packed forest, especially when you're already scared. We got back to the cabin, we had some dinner, and we played some cards and just hung out. At around midnight, we decided to head down to the dock to do some stargazing. We're lucky enough to see the northern lights all year round. We were sitting on the dock. It was peaceful, we were just looking up at the stars and we started to kiss. 
About 30 seconds later, just behind us, there was a loud crash back in the bush. It sounded like there was a big animal moving around, breaking branches and twigs about 60 feet away. Whatever it was, it was huge. We both instantly turned around and my boyfriend asked, what is that? I have no idea, I said. We don't get animals that big on this island. And just then, whatever this creature was, it started to grunt and stomp its feet all over the ground. My boyfriend muttered, what the heck? I, I don't know, I replied. It was so dark outside that we couldn't see a thing in the direction of the sounds. Neither of us had bothered to bring a flashlight as it was easy enough for us to walk back up the path by following the kitchen light we'd left on. We both stood up slowly, and once we were up, we ran back up to the cabin. Back inside, we closed everything except for the kitchen window. We sat there in silence and listened. Nothing. We heard nothing outside. We tried to look out the windows, but it was simply pitch black. We tried to discuss what it could have been, tried to figure out what it was. We decided that the only two animals remotely that big in the area are moose, which are extremely rare and have never been seen on that island before, and black bears. I explained to my boyfriend that bears rarely swim out to the island from the mainland, and we hadn't had one on our property in years. Besides, I joked, since when do black bears interrupt people having romantic moments in the moonlight by crashing through the brush and stomping their feet? My boyfriend didn't think it was so funny. Eventually, we calmed down and we went to bed. There are two single beds in the back room. One of the beds is situated right under the bedroom window. The pillow sits about two inches below the window sill. This is the bed I always sleep in. I enjoy keeping the window open. It lets the fresh forest air in and I like the sounds of the night. That night though, I kept the window closed tight and I pulled the blinds shut. We were lying in our beds talking when all of a sudden, this awful smell enveloped the entire room. I'd never smelled anything like that before. It was a putrid combination of wet dog, body odor, and rotting garbage. I will never forget that smell. I must have made a disgusted noise because my boyfriend asked what was wrong. I told him to come over to my bed and smell this horrible smell coming through the window. And sure enough, he smelled the same thing. Again, we had no idea what it was, and neither of us wanted to open the blinds to investigate. The smell disappeared as quickly as it had come, and a short time later, we were able to fall asleep. The next morning, we thoroughly checked around the cabin and docked for signs of a bear. We found nothing. We then ate a quick breakfast and left the cabin for home. It honestly didn't occur to me until weeks later what the creature could have been. Perhaps it was a Sasquatch. Although not as prevalent as on the west coast of North America, there is a long history of Bigfoot sightings in the woods of Northwest Ontario. I did a bit of research and discovered that Sasquatch has been known to display ape-like behavior, such as throwing rocks and stomping their feet around. People that have close encounters with Bigfoot often report the creature having a very strong odor. In addition, Bigfoot are widely believed to be very strong swimmers, so it would have been no problem to follow us back to the cabin by swimming and island hopping. Now, as an avid camper, hiker, and lifelong cottager who has seen many bears over the years, I don't believe for one second that that thing was a bear. Over the 50 plus years my family has owned the place, every bear has left obvious evidence behind. Evidence such as piles of excrement, claw marks on the windowsills and walls of the cabin, ripped up patio and window screens, or tipped over garbage cans and barbecue. Bears create a lot of noise and can be very destructive, but the creature we encountered was quiet and sneaky when it wanted to be, too clever for a bear. The creature must have followed us back home from our hike down the logging road, and to think it could have been only inches away from my head, listening and sniffing me through the thin pane of glass. These thoughts give me chills to this day, my boyfriend never believed my Bigfoot theory, but he still admits that he doubts it was a bear. If not a bear, then what was it? I'll never go down that logging road again, and next time I feel like something is following me through the woods, I'll trust my instincts and run. 
Number two, The Stalker in the Woods, submitted by Anonymous. This happened to me only a few months ago. I was 13 and my friend had just invited me along with three other friends on a fun fishing trip. His mother picked us up after school and we drove to my friend's cabin by the lake. The cabin itself was about an hour's drive away and that was about a half a mile away from the lake. We got there around 4.30 in the afternoon and we set up everything. We got the canoe ready to go fishing and we got a fire ready to burn. Everything was normal until we had dinner. My friend's parents brought some burgers to cook on the fire and after that we made s'mores but I kept hearing noises coming from behind me in the woods. There was a lot of snapping twigs and I tried to shake it off as a deer since where we lived is known for having a great population of them. We were about three quarters of a mile from the nearest other living soul, or at least we thought. Around seven that night, we were packing up and my friend announced that he needed to go to the bathroom. So we walked about a half mile to the cabin, but there's an intersection leading to the road where the car was parked and one of my friends said they were going to wait back at the car. So while she walked to the car, the four of us and my friend's parent walked to the cabin. When we got there, my friend and his mother went inside. The rest of us just waited outside on a tire swing. We each took turns at being pushed. I was sitting on a log staring off into space when I heard the familiar noise of more snapping twigs. I looked behind my friend on the tire swing. I looked into the woods 50 feet away from us it was getting very dark, and since it's almost winter, it was very hard to see. I could barely make out the outline of a figure as I stared into the woods. Then the figure seemed to see me, and it ran away, and I could hear the snapping twigs too. I immediately told my friends what I saw. They didn't believe me. Then when my other friend and his mom came out of the cabin, I told them as well, and they said I'd been watching too many scary videos online. Maybe I was just too paranoid, I thought. So I walked into the woods where I had seen it. And sure enough, there were very obvious and fresh footprints there, crushed leaves and soil and snapped twigs. Creeped out, I walked out of the woods and I told my friends that I still think I saw something, even if they don't believe me. We started walking back to the car and we heard the most blood curdling scream I'd ever heard. It was our friend who decided to walk back to the car alone. We ran back up the trail to the car and we found our friend sitting in the car with the doors all locked, but the windows were rolled down just enough for a man wearing a black suit to fit his hand through. This man dressed in all black was taller than all of us. He must have been about six foot five. In his hand, he was holding something and I couldn't make out what it was. When this guy saw us, he jumped into a red pickup truck that wasn't there when we arrived, and he floored it out of there. We asked our friend what had happened. Through tears, she said she was sitting there listening to music on her iPhone, when suddenly a man's hand was trying to fit through the window, trying to grab her. She screamed, and then the man pulled out a knife, and luckily, that's when we came. She was still choking up, but I could tell she was saying that she would have been killed if we hadn't come at the right time. It turned out that one of my friend's parents was holding a shotgun and that's why the man didn't try to fight us. The parents called the police and we all got in the car and sped home. When we were dropped off, she told my parents what happened and luckily no one was injured. I still hang out with all four of those friends. We were planning on going to the cabin again later that year, but we decided that a sleepover would be better. Who would want to go back to where a traumatizing event took place, where they almost died? Number three, The Cabin, submitted by Thomas. Four years ago, my friend invited me to stay at their cabin in Tahoe. I didn't really know them very well, so I asked if I could bring my best friend Mark along. It wasn't a very long road trip. It was something like three hours, so it wasn't that bad. The cabin was this old four-story place, including basement and loft, of course, with another smaller cabin in the backyard, which had two stories. When you stand in front of the cabin, you walk up a long flight of stairs, and in front of you, you will see a door. To the left is another staircase that goes to a sliding door, and to the right is the path to the backyard. 
Once you go through the door, to your left is a door to the basement, and in front of you are stairs that curve to the left and up to the second story. There to your left is a bedroom, and to your right is the hot tub, laundry room, water heater, and in front of you is another flight of stairs that goes up and to the left. When you get up there, it's a living room, and to the left is the kitchen. Halfway to the kitchen and to the left is the stairs to the loft. That's where we kids slept. The day after we arrived, before breakfast, everyone decided to go to the other cabin. We hung out and after breakfast, Mark and I finished early, washed our plates and grabbed the keys for the second cabin. We went up and waited for everyone else to finish. We walked up the stairs and Mark unlocked the door and we walked in. Once we got on the floor, we noticed that the window to the left was open. Mark went and shut it and we went on to the balcony straight across from the window. Now we closed the door behind us and we just sat there for about 15 minutes, hanging out and talking. When we got bored and realized that they weren't coming, we turned around and tried the door. It was locked from the inside. Now we thought this was a self-locking door or something, so we thought we were idiots for closing it. So it was just us, locked out. We freaked out and we forgot about the keys in Mark's pocket. Then there was the sudden realization of the keys and Mark took them out and unlocked the door. But as soon as we opened it, the window from before that was open when we walked in, the one that we had shut, it was now open again. Slowly, I closed the window and we headed for the other cabin. Four steps down from the outside stairs, we realized we left the door open. Well, I left the door open. So I went to go close the door. And once I was up there, I heard it. There were footsteps on the upper level. I ran back to Mark, trying to get down the stairs, telling him that someone is in the cabin. Those four words made us run so fast faster than our little legs could go. When we got back to the bigger cabin, we told everyone what happened. We all decided to go back, but we brought knives and the biggest sticks we could find. I yelled into the still open door, if anyone's in there, come out, we have weapons. No answer. We ran into the cabin and did a complete sweep of the first floor and found nobody. Adrenaline pumping, I led everybody up the stairs but again, we found nothing, just an open window. That night, we all kept that in the back of our minds, thinking about it occasionally. Right before dinner, we made up this game where we would put freaking sheets over our heads, hide and scare the ghost hunters who were coming down to the second story bedroom. They had to find the ghost without getting caught. It was my turn to be the ghost, so I went down to find a hiding spot. And that's when I saw it. It was floating or gliding past a window. No person could reach that unless they were 20 feet tall. Its face was pale white. It went in front of the window, just minding its own business. My heart sank. Immediately, I ran up the stairs to the living room when a pillow thrown by one of the other kids hit the chandelier and we had to end the game early. After dinner and getting ready for bed, I told Mark what I saw. He believed me. And because the others wouldn't believe us, we decided not to tell anybody. But that night, I woke up at three in the morning and little did I know that Mark did too because we both saw something going up the stairs to the loft. It seemed to be a shadow. I don't know how else to describe it. It was blacker than black, like a solid black mass just walking up the stairs. That morning, I told Mark about the incident and what he said made me feel less crazy. He said, yeah, it was like three in the morning. I heard someone walking up the stairs. Then I just fell back asleep thinking it was one of you guys. And thankfully, that was the day we left. Now, I only went there one more time after these incidents, and I never had an experience like those again. Number four, Cabin in the Woods. Submitted by S. James N. This happened about two years ago. I was 12 at the time. It was just me and my grandpa. We were staying out at a cabin in the woods. A couple of times every year, we'd go to this cabin to camp out for about a week. This happened on our second to last day of our little camp out. I had gone out to collect some water from a well. I was walking back and I looked up the hill to see a man standing there. He was kind of far away. All I could really make out was his shadow. As I looked up at him, he started to move. 
I was used to seeing people, but they were always hunters, wearing bright orange clothing or camouflage. But this man was wearing dark clothing. He left my line of sight as I walked away. When I got back, I asked my grandpa about the man. He said that I shouldn't worry, that it was probably just someone hiking through the woods. But I saw the same man one more time that day. He was down by the creek, just standing there. I ran back to camp as I was too scared to do anything. I have insomnia, so it's sometimes hard for me to go to sleep. It was nighttime and my grandpa was sleeping. But I lay awake on the couch downstairs, playing games on my phone. So as it often went, I couldn't sleep that night. I was facing a window and saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I looked up and there was nothing there. So I went back to my phone and I got on YouTube. As I was watching videos, I heard a knock on the door to the cabin. It was slow and quiet. I quickly shut off my phone and sat there in silence. This time it came again, only louder. I ran up the stairs as fast as I could to my grandpa's bed. I shook him awake while begging for this to end. I told him as fast as I could what had just happened. He grabbed his handgun that was next to his bed and he turned on the light. My grandpa wasn't very old and he was fast. He told me to calm down and to stay upstairs. He slowly walked down the stairs with the flashlight in hand. I tiptoed to the top of the stairs and sat down. Then I heard a gunshot ring out. Then my grandpa screamed up at me to come downstairs and to follow him. As soon as he saw me, he grabbed my hand and pulled me outside. He told me to get into his truck as fast as possible and lock the doors. It was pitch black and all I could see was the light from my grandpa's flashlight outside the car. My grandpa ran towards the truck and I unlocked the doors so he could jump in. He started up the truck and started driving down the path towards the road. The truck stopped and I looked in front of us and there was the man. He was limping down the road with a large hunting knife in his hand. Number five, The Lake's Secret, submitted by Riley W. It's important to note that this isn't my first strange encounter, but the worst. My name is Riley and I live in Australia. I'm 16 years old. My family and I have always enjoyed water skiing as long as I can remember. Burrenjuk Dam, practically a lake, was always a family favorite spot. During the summer holidays, we would pack our bags, equipment, and we would be on our way. The drive was boring as heck, but once we made it, it would be far from boring. When we arrived, it was dark, and we had to go through gates to get in. We asked the receptionist for keys to the cabin. While the rest of my family went to get the keys, I stayed in the car. There was only a minute left on the video I was watching on my phone. When it was finished, I looked out the window to see my surroundings. Though I couldn't see much, I could make out a few ferns and trees. Everything you'd expect, but something didn't seem right. A strong feeling of fear washed over me. No matter how hard I looked, I couldn't find what was causing me so much panic. But eventually, I saw two red dots reflecting in the glass. I decided to turn around and look out the other window, but I wasn't ready for what I saw. The image is still burned into my mind. Its face was as pale as the moon, yet its eyes were red like neon. It had two different lower jaw bones on each side, like its jaw had been split in half. Its fur was falling out in patches, and what fur it did have was matted and dirty. The whole of its body was extremely disproportionate, and it was twitching crazily. Yet the moment I blinked, the thing was gone. The moment my family got back, I told them what I saw, but they looked at me confused. For one, they knew I never really got scared. I didn't get much sleep that night, but what sleep I did get, I kept seeing it outside my window, and it seemed so real. I woke up, but not dramatically like you see in the movies, but I was very much soaked in sweat. And that's when I noticed that it was really outside my window. I noticed how tall it was, at least three meters. I rushed to my brother to wake him up to show him the proof before it was gone. But the moment my brother walked into the room and looked out the window, the thing had disappeared again. My brother simply shook his head and he left. 
The next day, I thought a quick kneeboard session in the water would clear my mind. My mother was the one watching me. She always had an eagle eye and would spot the smallest things, so I felt safe with her watching me. It was surprisingly busy on the water with different colored and styled boats all over the place. We went past the island in the middle of the lake and things started to get bumpy really fast. Eventually, I fell off and I raised my hand for them to spot me in the water and to turn the boat around. But when I looked, there was no boat. They wouldn't have just left me there, I thought, but there was no sign of a boat anywhere, even though seconds before, there were many all over the place. I yelled for what must have been 10 minutes, but still, no one came. I swam to the island in the middle. It was closer than the shore. No matter how much I swam though, it didn't look like I was getting any closer, which scared and confused me. What was going on? There had just been so much weird things going on like it was a bad dream. Then I remember waking up on the shore around late afternoon. Why though, why was I there? I thought I was in my bed. And that was when I realized that I was wearing my boxer shorts because it was really hot that night. It apparently was a dream. A bad dream, going out onto the lake and falling, everyone disappearing. But how the hell did I get to the shore? Had I slept walk from my bed? I even had some light marks on my chest. I was walking barefoot back to where I thought the cabin was, and the rocks butchered my feet. Soon I had to rest as my feet were aching and stinging, so I sat on a rock by the shore. I heard something, and I looked in the direction of the noise, and I saw that thing again. This time, it was by the water. Every instinct told me not to. I called out to it. I looked into the thing's red eyes. It didn't move, but fear filled me so fast that I ran anyway. With my feet basically destroyed, it hurt so much to run. I hid behind a tree so that it wouldn't see me. I could hear large branches breaking behind me. It sounded so loud like thunder. I peered around the corner and I saw it move from tree to tree. It then stopped. It then went in between some tall shrubs and ferns near a hill. My curiosity was way too strong, and stupidly, I followed. Feet shredded to hell. I was still a very curious teenager. I had never heard or seen anything like this creature before. I had to know more about it. I lost sight of it pretty fast, so I followed what I thought was a trail as best as I could. I ended up finding what seemed to be its din, there were bones of many different animals in there. The thing wasn't there, so I cautiously looked around, but it was very dark and I couldn't see much. It took a while for my eyes to adjust, but soon I could make out things all over the ground. Things like a couple of phones, a wallet, someone's pill bottle, and even pillows. I reached for the nearest phone. If anything, if it did work, I could use its flashlight. And luckily for me, there wasn't a password on it. I swiped to unlock the phone, and the moment I did, a noise echoed throughout the din. Whosever phone this was, they had left the music on when they locked it, and it automatically began to play when I swiped. The sound of it echoed around me at full volume. Panicked, I was trying to stop the music, but then I heard the footsteps behind me. I slowly turned around, and I could see that thing at the entrance searching very carefully. Then a weird noise came from the thing, it sounded like a clicking noise that came from its jaw, and from its throat bellowed a low moan. It sounded like a dog crying and metal grinding. I lowered myself to the ground slowly. It took everything I had not to scream. I watched as the thing approached me steadily. Every inch it got closer to me. I felt like I was in hell. Suddenly, a light appeared at the entrance of the den, and the creature vanished just like before. And as it went, it felt like a weight had been lifted off of me. I could finally move and stand up. I ran as fast as I could, and I found the man holding the flashlight. He asked me what was wrong and why I was up so late at night. It must have been weird to see some kid running out of a cave in his boxers at night. I told him what had happened and what I'd been experiencing, and he took me back to my cabin. Once there, he explained to me that I was not the first person to say things like that but he warned me not to tell anyone, especially the police or the rangers. The man made sure I got to the door and then he took off. My parents were up for me waiting. They asked where I'd been, that they were worried sick. I told them that I was going outside to go to the bathroom, but I had lost my way. 
they didn't really buy it, but they didn't pry anymore. They attended to my cuts and scrapes, and we ended up going home early the next day. When we finally got back home, I felt safe because we were hours and hours away from there. But that night, my brother came into my room and he said, Riley, there's something out of my window. And when we walked into his room, there was nothing there, but I still get chills wondering if that thing may have followed us home. I don't know what happened when I was asleep or how I woke up on the shore away from my cabin, but I do know one thing. That was the most horrifying experience of my life. Curiosity can be a demon itself, and just like a demon, it can possess you into doing very bad things. My curiosity could have gotten me killed. Paranormal Cabin from KM8642. This incident happened in November 2018 at a cabin in the Adirondack Mountains in New York State. The cabin is located in a private camp owned by my alma mater. There are about 10 cabins on the property, each of them isolated and private. I've been going to this camp for 30 years, and before this trip, I've never had anything odd or supernatural happen to me. Attending this trip was just me and my 16-year-old daughter. It was her first time there. We arrived mid-afternoon. The cabin we rented was about a quarter mile walk from the parking lot. It sits in a pretty glade surrounded by the forest, and a small path runs past the cabin and continues on into the woods towards the next cabins. The cabin's construction is extremely rustic, made wholly of logs hewn from the surrounding forest. There's a porch that is covered with a wood railing. To the left on the porch is a wood rack built up against the railing. This is an important detail for later. The main room has a large stone fireplace and hearth. There's a couple couches, a dining table, and a galley kitchen. The only water source is a 10-gallon plastic container situated to the left of a sink that's set in the middle of the counter against the wall. The bedrooms are in a separate section behind where the fireplace is. Each bedroom has two single beds, one against the wall on the left and one against the wall on the right. There is a window between the beds. After unloading all our supplies in the cabin, we went outside to chop wood as the cabin is without heat or electricity. Light is provided by propane lanterns. After a sweaty half hour, we had enough wood split to last at least 24 hours. It was already getting dark as we loaded the wood inside on the stone hearth next to the large fireplace, the excess wood we placed in the wood rack on the porch. We enjoyed our first night, eating a roasted chicken we'd bought at the store. I built a fire in the fireplace and kept feeding it until there was a nice bed of coals. We turned one of the couches around to face the fire, then sat down and read our books while intermittently chatting. It was very peaceful. The only sound, the crackling of the burning wood and the warmth of the fire was soothing. We went to bed early and got a great night's sleep. After breakfast the following day, we went for a short hike on the property. I showed my daughter a few of the other cabins in which I'd stayed in the past. It was a cloudy fall day, a bit chilly and windy. We got back to the cabin around noon. I fed the fire to get some heat going, then we had sandwiches for lunch. We sat on the couch in front of the fire and enjoyed the silence for a while once again each of us reading our books. This is where the story gets interesting. Out of nowhere we heard a sound behind us, outside the cabin. To me it sounded like one of the logs on top of the wood rack on the porch had rolled. Just picture the sound a heavy round log would make if you rolled it across the top of other logs. My daughter and I immediately looked at each other. Did you hear that? I asked. Yes, she said. She pointed towards the back of the cabin, which was odd because I'd heard the sound coming from the front where the porch is. 
I figured it was probably just the acoustics of the cabin. My first thought was that it was some kids from one of the other cabins just messing around. Remember, there's a footpath that runs closely past our cabin. I thought someone walking by decided to mess around with us. We both stood up and I looked out the window towards the path. I didn't see anyone. I looked at my daughter and saw some fear and confusion on her face. I said to her, I better take a look outside. For protection, I picked up a long, thin split log from the hearth, easy to swing at someone if necessary. With more than a little trepidation, I opened the door and stepped out onto the porch, closing the door behind me. I took two steps and stopped. I looked first to the left, and all I saw was grass and forest. I then turned to the right, where the wood rack was. What I saw changed my life. It all happened so fast, a matter of a few seconds. When I turned, I saw something hovering above the wood rack, exactly where I thought the sound had come from. It's hard to describe. It actually looked like an octopus's tentacle, but a foresty version of it. Light brown on top with white spots and white underneath. But it did not look solid. It was like a phantasm, glowing and shimmering. The instant I saw it, it pulled back and was gone around the side of the cabin. It was as though it knew I'd seen it so it quickly pulled its tentacle back. I've often read stories where people say they were so scared they couldn't move, and I always think, come on, you're in danger, move, what's your problem? Well, I now know why they don't move. They literally can't. I was so scared, it was like my feet were nailed to the porch. My entire body went numb. My brain was telling me I should jump off the porch and run around the corner of the cabin to see what this thing was. But my body would not move. After a minute or two, I got enough courage to move. I turned around and I went back inside. I felt pale and flushed, as if I'd seen a ghost, which I guess I had. My daughter was standing there looking at me, and she could tell something had happened. I... I saw something, I said. Her eyes got bigger. What did you see? She asked in a shaky voice. I told her. I was nervously tapping the piece of wood against my leg. I walked over to look out the window again. I was trying to act normal and brave so my daughter didn't panic. I still didn't see anything. I better go walk around the cabin to see if I find anything, I told her. Stay here. I walked outside again and closed the door. Although I was still terrified, I knew I had to at least do a full circle around the cabin to reassure myself and especially my daughter. I stepped off the porch and onto the ground. I went right, towards where I'd seen the phantasm. I poked my head around the corner of the porch. Nothing. I did notice, however, that on the ground right next to where the wood rack is on the porch, there were a bunch of twigs and a small branch or two, meaning if a person or animal had been standing on the ground next to the porch, I would have heard twigs snapping. And yet, I had heard nothing. There's no way an actual being had stood there. Gaining a little confidence, I proceeded to walk around the cabin, inspecting the ground and the surrounding area. Not a single thing was out of place. Not a footprint to be found, nothing disturbed. I walked back into the cabin and told my daughter, Well, there's nothing out there. I said. I guess that's good. She nodded tentatively. 
I restoked the fire and told her to sit with me on the couch. We propped our feet up on the hearth and soaked in the warmth, lost in our thoughts. She then asked me, Do you think we should leave? I thought about that. I understood her concern, but I honestly didn't think we were in danger. If she insisted she was too scared to stay, I'd pack up and leave, but I didn't want to. I don't think so. If it was something that meant us harm, it would have attacked me. This seemed to mollify her. We sat a while more, then I noticed it was twilight outside. I lit a few of the lights that are mounted on the wall, and I said, Why don't we make dinner? I'm starving. She kept reading for a bit while I worked in the kitchen. There were plates in the drying rack on the counter that I put away. I then noticed a large puddle of water sitting on the counter to the right of the sink. The container of water on the counter was on the other side of the sink. It was way more water than a few drying dishes would cause, but I just figured I must have spilled some water as well. I took a towel and mopped up all the water. I filled a pot with water and put it on the stove to boil to make pasta. The boxes of dry goods we'd brought were on the small table against the wall. I grabbed for a box of pasta, and at first it wouldn't budge, like it was stuck to the table. I finally lifted it up and I saw water dripping from the bottom. I felt around and the box was soaking wet. I then checked the other boxes on the table and they were all wet as well. There was a large puddle on the table. This was a real head scratcher. As I mentioned, there is no plumbing in the cabin so no running water. I called my daughter over and showed her the table and I also told her about the puddle near the drying rack. She was just as confused as I was. We looked under the sink. Nothing there. I checked out the plastic water container, but there were no leaks in it. I used a flashlight and examined the wall above the counter, but nothing. I checked out the ceiling as well. Once more, nothing. We'd been there 24 hours, and there had not been a single drop of rain. There were no drips coming from the ceiling. Besides, the roof is slanted, so it's not like there'd be standing water up there. We cleaned up the water and wrote it off as an oddity. We cooked the pasta, heated up some sauce, and had a tasty meal. We relaxed at the table for a bit, then began cleaning up. I brought the dishes over to the sink and placed them there. I caught a reflection coming off the counter to the right of the sink and leaned closer. No way. There was once again a large puddle of water there. I called my daughter over and showed her again. We were both absolutely perplexed. I mopped it up again and forgot about it. To this day, I have no idea how the water got there. There's no rational explanation. But that isn't the end to the story. We went to bed, both of us still rattled from the day's unnerving events. As a precaution, I placed a metal folding chair against the door to the cabin, figuring it would topple over and make a lot of noise if someone opened the door, as the door had no lock. We eventually fell asleep. My daughter was lying with her head at the far end of the bed, closest to the wall, which is an outside wall. I lay with my head in the opposite direction closest to the inside wall. After a fitful sleep, I awoke around 7 a.m. The cabin was freezing cold as the fire had died hours before. I knew I had to get up and start the fire and get some heat in the cabin but it was warm and cozy in my sleeping bag, so I just lay there for a few extra minutes. Suddenly, I heard a scratching sound coming from the corner of the room where my daughter lay. It sounded like someone had a sharp metal pole and was dragging it along the outside of the cabin. 
Even weirder, the scratching sound was moving along the wall, in my direction. And as it moved, it gradually got louder, until it filled the entire room, and felt, to me, like a physical force. It went all the way across the outside wall and then turned the corner. Then it came all the way across to the wall behind me. I was lying with my back to the wall. When the scratching stopped, it felt as though it was precisely at the midpoint of my back. The entire sequence had taken about five seconds. My daughter did not wake up. When it stopped directly at my back, I lay there frozen. I began praying to Jesus to not let me get hurt. Whatever this thing was, it seemed focused on me. I have no idea why. In the 30 seconds I lay there praying, I didn't hear sound nor feel anything on me. But it was as terrifying a 30 seconds as I've ever had. Finally, after about five minutes, I found the nerve to sit up. At that point, my daughter woke up. I asked if she had heard the scratching, and she looked at me like I was crazy. She obviously hadn't. I told her what I'd heard. We made ourselves a quick breakfast, straightened up the cabin, and got the heck out of there. I didn't relax until we were in the car driving home. As we checked out, though, I did ask the camp manager if they'd ever had reports of anything paranormal in the cabin we'd stayed in, or any other for that matter. He said no. To my frustration, some of the people I've told this story to have not believed me. I attest that every word of it is true, and my daughter is a witness. I was not drinking or doing drugs. I was 100% lucid. I haven't been back to that camp since then. I do plan to head back soon, staying in a different cabin. And if something else happens, I'll be sure to let you know. The Cabin from Anonymous It was the middle of winter time, early January I believe. This time of year right after Christmas we usually get quite a bit of snow. Two cousins and I decided to go on a trip and stay in a cabin for the weekend. We had a family member who owned a cabin toward the mountains and we decided it would be a nice getaway. We would head up there on Thursday night and return home that Saturday morning. The family who owned the cabin had warned us about strange sightings and things that had happened at the cabin. They claimed their young son had been standing at the kitchen window and was pointing outside. When the mother asked him what was the matter, he had told her there was a woman standing outside. There had been no one there. All three of us, being skeptical, decided to go anyway and have a good trip. If a woman outside was the most harm to come, we really didn't see a problem. There was also a weather forecast of a winter storm coming in, but we all four had four-wheel drives and knew how to drive in the snow. Nothing, we decided, would stop us from a weekend of relaxation at the cabin. We had all of our stuff packed with enough food and drinks to last us a weekend, and were soon on our way. We finally made it to the cabin. It began to flurry snow, but we figured it would make us more cozy at the cabin anyway. There was firewood for the fireplace and we had remembered the hot chocolate and coffee. We got settled in and were relaxing at the fire we had built. The wind had begun to howl and the snow was now an inch deep outside. Believing this was as bad as the weather would get, we relaxed for a few hours. We talked and laughed and were having a good time. After several hours, we all decided to go to sleep. That night's sleep was the best I had slept in a long time. I don't know what it is about sleeping in a cabin that just gives you a warm feeling. I remember waking that morning to a wonderful smell of sausage and eggs and bacon. You could almost hear it sizzling, the smell was so strong. I rolled over and decided to have a cup of coffee and see if whoever was cooking needed some help. I was met in the hall by my cousin. We will call him Joe. Wow, Joe said, 
I am starving. That kitchen smells amazing. But when we entered the kitchen, not a soul was around. There were no eggs, bacon, or sausage frying. The stove was turned off, and it looked like the pans had not even been touched. We wrote this off as the strange things that tend to happen at this cabin. Well, said Joe, if there is a ghost here, I sure wish we hadn't just imagined that breakfast. We laughed and vowed not to say anything about it. People would just think we were crazy anyway. About that time, we heard someone come through the door. We will call this person Charles. It has come a blizzard outside. Probably a good idea if we try to crank these trucks up. If it gets much worse, we will have to head out sooner. And a dead battery is not good, said Charles. Now we had all come in three pickups. All four-wheel drive and not an issue with any of them. The three of us grabbed our keys and walked out to start the trucks. My ignition rattled but would not start up. It was then that I heard the other two trucks struggling to start and then silence. After checking all of the trucks, it seemed there was nothing wrong with any of them. Irritated and wondering what on earth we were going to do, we all walked back inside. There was a phone inside the cabin and we decided to call and see if a buddy might make their way up and give us a lift. The phone line was silent though, no dial tone. What are we going to do? asked Joe. Well, I answered, the last thing we want to do is let this fire go out. Charles decided he would go out to the woodshed and bring in plenty more firewood, and then we would see about eating something. We were too far from town to walk back, so all we could do is hang tight. At least, until we could figure something out. After a few minutes, Charles came back in shouting. Hey, we may have neighbors. Now, I had never heard talk of anyone living close by, so I asked what he was talking about. Charles claims he was out at the woodshed and heard a giggle. When he turned, he saw someone walking in the snow. When she turned around, he said it was a woman. He said she turned and walked around the other side of the woodshed and was gone. We all went out to see which way she might have gone. When we got to the woodshed in the area Charles had said he seen her, there were no footprints. Now, the snow by this point was about five inches deep. I have never seen anything walk through snow that deep and not leave a print. We all called Charles crazy and laughed it off. Deep down, though, I believe we were all three wondering what the heck was going on. The rest of that day passed, and we all went to sleep, hoping the next day would come with better luck. I woke the next morning to grease sizzling and the same glorious smell coming from the kitchen. Again, I would find the kitchen empty and simply pour myself a cup of coffee. Joe and Charles walked into the kitchen about the same time and grabbed a cup of coffee, too. Truck still won't crank, Joe said. We all sat in the living room at the fireplace for a while, trying to figure out what to do. It wasn't like we didn't have people who knew we were there. So we decided if Sunday came and we hadn't come home, someone would come looking for us. This day passed, just as the first, and finally it was nighttime. We were still sitting in the living room when we all three heard what sounded like footsteps coming from the kitchen. I got up and walked toward the kitchen. It was empty. No one was there. We all turned in for the night, hoping that someone may show up later the next day when we didn't show up at home. Sunday morning, my eyes flew open. Once again, the aggravating smell of breakfast that I knew would be there. I walked into the kitchen and was joined by Joe and Charles. What do you think? asked Joe. Try the trucks? I simply nodded and we all walked outside. I put the keys in the ignition, not really even hoping at this point that it would start. The engine revved and my truck was running. I heard the other two trucks crank as well. All three of us looked at each other equally shocked. Two days had gone and now all of a sudden all three trucks are running. 
We didn't even turn them off. We ran into the cabin, grabbing and throwing everything in no particular order into the trucks. We just wanted to get the heck out of there. I was focused on loading up when I heard Charles say, Look! In the window! I looked up and stared in shock. In the kitchen window looking out at us was a woman. She had long brown hair and seemed to be wearing a nightgown. She was quite pretty and appeared to be waving at us. We all shared silent looks. That was all it took. We finished loading up and all jumped in our trucks and started down the mountain, not looking back. To this day, we don't really understand what happened. Why three trucks seemed to stop running and on... This Sunday, we were set to leave. All three trucks fired right up. And the woman? Whoever she was, we have told people what happened. Some believe us. Some think we just came up with a good campfire story. When we told the owners about the woman, they nodded and said that she is there quite often. Today, the cabin is no longer there. It was sold, and I have heard it finally was burned. As far as what still lingers on the land, I don't know that either. Do things stay there when places are gone? The following are older stories about cabins that some folks might not have heard yet. Enjoy. Grandpa's Best Friend from Mythology Loves Horror. The hunting cabin was just as I remembered it. It was tiny, hardly bigger than a tool shed, and after a year of neglect, dust now coated every surface. I hadn't been there in almost 10 years, not since the last time I went hunting with my grandfather Sebastian. I'd been so terrified by the thing we saw in the woods there that I hadn't wanted to return and my parents just assumed I was too bored to want to spend two weeks with the boring old man, but Gramps still came to visit us. Thankfully, we never went there. When Gramps passed away a year ago, he left the cabin and the 30 acres surrounding it to his only remaining grandchild. At 20 years old, I had never expected to set foot on the rural mountainside again, much less inherit it but a bad breakup had left me with the decision of moving into the cabin or into my parents' basement. The choice had almost been hard to make. The local newspaper, the Village Times, had claimed that Gramps died of a bear attack while out chopping firewood behind his cabin. I didn't really buy that story, though, and even as I pulled my beat-up old Ford into the unpaved driveway, I had my hand on my rifle. Though if that thing came back, I was sure it wouldn't do much to it. But still, it made me feel better. I hadn't seen it in a decade, but if that creature was still out there, I would be prepared this time. At least I hoped. Several hours later, I was unpacked, and the cabin was decently clean. All of the utilities were still hooked up, and the refrigerator was well stocked. I had taken the week off of work to adjust to my new life, and I was planning on just relaxing for the next few days. My first night and day passed uneventfully, but by the second night, things were getting a little weird. I had spent enough time in the country as a child to be familiar with the wildlife here. Raccoons, skunks, bears, other mammals. But the freshly made claw marks on the side of the cabin they weren't anything that I recognized. I woke up on my third morning to gouges in the wood, and I was definitely unnerved. They were too large to belong to any small critters, and far too high up to be from coyotes. They were even too wide to be a mountain lion or bear. In this neck of the woods, that ruled out everything logical. As I studied the claw marks, I wondered how I could have slept through them being made. They definitely hadn't been there when I first arrived, and the fresh marks stood out in a bright contrast to the weathered wood of the cabin walls. I supposed a human could have made them with a knife, but I didn't have neighbors for miles. Who would be skulking around out here just to prank me like this? It didn't make any sense. 
It crossed my mind that maybe my ex might have done it, just to freak me out. But Sandra lived almost 50 miles away and did not have the address for the cabin in the first place. I don't use social media enough to bother listing my new address, and we didn't have friends in common or anything like that. I eventually shrugged it off, deciding to let it go. I knew that worrying about it wouldn't help. That afternoon, though, I found myself driving the 10 miles into town and buying some motion-activated floodlights and a motion-sensing camera. Two more nights passed, and each morning, I woke up to the claw marks getting closer and closer to the cabin door. As much as I wanted to believe it was a prank, I had to admit to myself that the evidence was overwhelmingly against that idea. The floodlights would turn on, and the camera would snap, yet somehow, all I would ever see in the photos was an empty yard. I had even tried to set up a video on my phone, but all it managed to capture was a vague blur of movement at the edge of the screen. I had enough. On the fifth night, I went outside, rifle in hand, settling comfortably on the porch steps. There was no noise, no sound to indicate that the usual nocturnal critters were up and about. I shut all the lights off and waited for the creature that I knew would come. Hours passed, and as 1 a.m. rolled around, I snapped myself out of a doze. I could hear something moving quietly out by the edge of the woods, where I could make out a figure skulking about, its features hidden in the shadows. As the animal drew closer, I rubbed my eyes in disbelief, because there stood Sebastian, my supposedly dead grandpa. He wasn't wearing any clothes. He paused mid-step, his head slowly turning to face me, probably hearing me gasp from shock. Grandpa looked sickly, with skin pale and ribs visible. He was bald now, his once Santa-like beard and hair gone. Grandpa? I called out. I could hear the quiver in my own voice, and my hands were shaking from terror. The rifle had fallen to my lap, nearly forgotten in the intensity of seeing my presumably dead grandfather. I'd been so convinced that what I was about to see would be that antlered creature that I saw years ago, the one I knew killed Sebastian, but I never considered once that my grandpa was still alive. Grandpa, what are you doing? C come inside. Tears were streaming down my cheeks. I didn't care what my grandfather had been doing this whole time or why he was out there. All I cared about was that he was still alive. I wanted to hug him again. Run. Run, you stupid boy. It's coming. His voice barely sounded human anymore. His voice came out all wrong, and before I could respond, Grandpa was bounding into the woods on all fours. He was gone in the blink of an eye, the bushes hardly swaying where he had passed through. The woods remained as eerily silent as they had been before, even though my grandfather's retreat should have made a large amount of noise. Not a second later, a low growl came from behind me, the sound reverberating off the cabin walls. A massive creature, the one that I remembered, approached from the side of the cabin. Within seconds, it became clear to me that it wasn't a human or an animal, unless someone was wearing an amazing and terrifying costume. The creature was every bit as surreal as I remembered. Long, pale limbs sprouted from an emaciated torso. An ivory deer skull shined in what little moonlight managed to bleed out through the clouds. It was wearing ragged old buckskin leggings and had beads around its neck. I could not see its eyes, though, but I knew without a doubt that if it had any, it was staring directly at me. I knew not whether it was a Wendigo or a Skinwalker or something else, but it didn't matter. It was here. Before I could take in any more detail, the creature began to laugh, a guttural sound that echoed in my head hauntingly. It was laughing so hard at me that it nearly doubled over. 
I realized that its limbs were able to wrap around its body almost twice. I raised my rifle, firing several times at it point blank, all of those rounds lodging firmly into the creature's neck and torso. The being looked down at its new piercings, then without a problem, almost comfortably, it began to dig out the bullets at an unhurried pace. It dropped them onto the ground like a child plucking flower petals, and it seemed to sigh in irritation as it dug out the final one. Pointless. It, it just spoke. What was going on? What did this thing want? Did Grandpa always know about this horrendous looking thing? My head began to ache with the strain of trying to understand all this. <sighs> it seemed to sigh as if annoyed by the bullets. It then lifted its claw and pointed it at the cabin. Uh, inside, go. I was all I could get out in reply to this thing speaking to me. I blinked profusely, and the next thing I knew, the monster was gone, and standing there was Rufus, my grandpa Sebastian's best friend. Rufus had been around as long as I could remember, and had always been a kind old man. He supposedly lived on the other side of the mountain, even though I'd never actually seen his house, let alone been to it. Rufus just always sort of appeared out of nowhere, often startling us so badly that we had almost shot him a few times. What in tarnation you doing out here, whippersnapper? Rufus? Am I dreaming? <laughs> nah, nah, you're not dreaming. But you need to get inside before that thing comes back. That thing that looks like your grandpappy. I was shaking so tremendously from fear that I could barely move my limbs at the time, but I managed to navigate the steps. I'm not entirely sure why I obeyed Rufus after seeing that thing, but after seeing Rufus's familiar face, there was something calming about it making this insane situation more easily dealt with. I needed some semblance of normalcy in that moment, so I went about my usual pre bed routine, ignoring the fact that nothing made sense anymore. Mindlessly, I made sure all the windows and doors were locked. I took a long, hot shower to relax myself. I crawled into bed, my adrenaline finally calming down. I think I was in shock. I noticed I was repeatedly reassuring myself that I would wake up and everything would be as it should be. Just writing this down was hard enough. I have no idea, no ounce of understanding for what went on that night at the cabin. I'm more confused than I ever thought possible. Who really was Rufus? And what was that thing that looked like my grandpa? The House and the Cabin From Kaiju Arcadia When I was 14 years old, me and my girlfriend went to my grandparents' house. We agreed to actually do a test of courage in the middle of the night, an excuse to go explore some abandoned and creepy places. We asked my grandpa if he knew of any places like that. He told us about an old abandoned house and cabin at least a kilometer south of where we were. He said that the house was owned by a man from Ohio named Derek Shod from the 1900s, but he suddenly disappeared and was never heard from again. We were skeptic of this story. My girlfriend and I weren't very strong believers of these kinds of things, so we decided to go to that location, not entirely spooked by that story. My grandparents didn't want us to go, but like teenagers, we disobeyed. We ended up sneaking away and running off in the middle of the night, 
searching for that house and cabin to the south. The only thing we had on us were two knives, two flashlights, and a few extra batteries. As we were searching, I could feel that the forest had eyes and ears. The entire way through, it was like someone was following us, watching us closely. When we finally found the house and cabin, a sudden cold breeze blew, giving us chills straight up our backs. We entered the house first. We found a lot of creepy things, like books about demons and witchcraft, strange graffiti that we didn't understand, some very weird paintings, and worst of all, at least to me, a bunch of dolls in every room we entered. The house was only a common American house. That's the way I'd describe it, as I'm from the Philippines. We were scared now, but we were still ready to see that cabin. So we exited the house and cautiously made our way over to the wooden cabin. It was about 50 or 60 feet away from the house. While I was walking behind my girlfriend, I heard a strange voice. Over here. I'm here. I stop right then and there, looking around, trying to find what called me. All I saw was a small bulge of cement. I approached it and then just stopped. I couldn't help myself but stop at that position. All I remember after that was complete blackness. Apparently, I blacked out. When I woke up, I saw my girlfriend also lying face down on the ground, just outside the cabin. We never made it to it. I panicked a bit and approached my girlfriend. When she woke up, she screamed, scaring me. Leave us alone. I was surprised, and I took a step back. I asked what was wrong, and she said that a man had been following us from the very beginning. What? I looked at her face and saw how pale she was. She looked very frail and sickly. With us scared and now possibly in danger, I gave her a piggyback ride and carried her out of the forest as far as I could. We soon made it to the dirt road near my grandparents' house. When I put her down, I saw that no time had passed since we had first entered the forest. When we left, it was 11.38, but when we came back out of the forest, it was only 11.39. A single minute had passed, despite us walking over a kilometer back and forth. I called my uncle to come pick us up. A few minutes later, he showed up, and we rushed my girlfriend to the nearest hospital. When I told my uncle about our adventure, he got pissed and shouted that we were very, very lucky to come back alive. He said that some other people had tried to investigate that place, but many were hurt when they returned. Unfortunately, my friend actually got a permanent scar from the damage on her head after blacking out. We didn't do anything like this again for several years. Luckily, we're both alive and well now but we won't be going back to any strange cabins. The Island in the Lake From Names James 0933 Rachel, my fiancé, and I were on hour 17 into our drive to her family's cabin in northern Minnesota for a small vacation. I glanced at her with heavy eyelids, to see that she was fast asleep in the passenger seat. The last two hours of the trip were spent through desolate back roads in towns that consisted of a hundred people and a lone stoplight. I could feel myself immersing into the solitude as the roads began to be labeled by numbers instead of names. Finally, I turned onto the long stretch of road that winded through the forest and led to our destination, the cabin. Siri let me know there was two miles left. Then everything went back to silence. The car slowly trudged over the underdeveloped road as large chunks of gravel crunched and tumbled beneath the wheels, while towering pine trees loomed above us, blocking out any stars. 
We arrived, and I was so exhausted that I considered just sleeping right there in the driveway. I'd never been to this cabin before, but upon first glance, it was quite cozy. It's not one of those decked out cabins that rich people buy, but it had three bedrooms and set just offshore to a small 1100 acre lake. We quickly unloaded everything and collapsed onto a bed that smelled older than time. Though we were completely beat, we were excited to spend some time away from it all. The sun lit up our room early the next morning and I was filled with a huge sense of relief when out of routine I checked my phone to see that there was no service. Nobody could bother us even if they tried. Rachel offered to drive to the nearest town to get some groceries so I could settle in and check out the cabin myself. I rifled through hundreds of dusty books that sat on the shelves in the living room. Then I pulled out a dozen board games as I excitedly planned out our time ahead. I made my way outside and onto the dock that stretched out into the lake. A small boat lightly rocked in the water and the dock creaked and groaned underneath my feet. I stared out at the lake and finally felt the last of my anxiety dissipate. As the drive to town was around half an hour, I figured I would set out on the lake to do some fishing. A small island caught my eye that sat close to the middle of the water. It was maybe a hundred yards in diameter and was filled with dense trees and shrubs. Something about it drew me toward it. I can't really describe it, but it's like it slowly sucked me in. The island had an almost eerie glow about it, like it wasn't really in the same world as ours. I anchored maybe 50 feet from the shore and started casting. It wasn't 30 seconds after that I felt something hit my boat. I had nearly had whatever was on the line up to the boat. It must have gotten off the hook, I thought, hit the boat before swimming away. When I reached out to reapply the bait, I saw a fish dangling off the end of the line still. An uneasy feeling washed over me when I saw that it was completely mangled. It was nearly ripped in half with tears all along what was left of its body. My first thought was that a bigger fish must have jumped on it, but I didn't feel any sort of struggle that would indicate such. Maybe an otter, I thought, but again, I didn't feel a struggle when I reeled it in. I tried to ignore this and moved on to the opposite side of the island, resuming my fishing, but again, the next thing I hooked suddenly stopped fighting. I pulled up another shredded fish carcass. This happened a few more times as I was just curious at this point as to what was happening. I looked toward the island and felt such dread, like the island itself had eyes and was staring me down. I slowly rode myself away to another spot closer to the cabin and started to catch some actually intact fish, all the while taking brief glances at that island. After hauling in a decent sized bass, I heard Rachel pull into the driveway, so I decided to make my way back and try to forget about this experience. Over dinner, I casually brought up the island to Rachel. So I saw there was this island in the middle of the lake. Have you ever been to it? I asked. Oh, that? Nah, my dad always just told us to not go over there. He said the land is still owned by the family of some woman who used to live there. She responded. Wait, someone used to live there? How? I asked. Yeah, he said that there was a woman who had a house there. She owned some knick-knack shop in town till around 50 years ago, when she died. She'd have to row to the dock every morning just to get to her car, she explained. Must have been a pain in the butt to get groceries there, I said with a laugh. Yeah, my dad said she was super creepy, and they would sometimes catch her staring at them from the shore while they fished she elaborated. Well, that's just weird, I said, kind of laughing it off. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure none of it was real. I think he just told us those things to keep us from going to the lake and messing around, she said with a laugh of her own. The rest of the day was spent playing various board games, reading, and just lounging around the cabin. However, each time I passed the living room window, I felt that distinct feeling of being watched. Each time I would glance out to see that island looming in the distance. Curiosity was starting to nag at me, especially now that I was told that there was a house sitting by itself, 
probably untouched there for decades. A few days passed by, and we spent our time doing more of the same. While relaxing like this was exactly what I needed, I couldn't get my mind off of that island. I had barely done any fishing since I did my first trip on the lake, as I always felt like something just didn't want me there. I couldn't take it anymore. I decided that once Rachel fell asleep, I was going to row out there to check it myself. It probably was just some urban legend her dad had concocted to scare the kids. But part of me wanted to know if it was real. Wanted it to be real. I sat up in bed reading, waiting for Rachel to fall asleep. She fell asleep faster than anybody had ever met and could sleep through a hurricane, so I knew I wouldn't have to wait too long. She really wasn't a fan of anything creepy, and going to an abandoned house in the middle of the night was not something she'd be interested in. But I did feel kind of bad doing this without telling her. Then again, I knew she would just protest if she knew. I grabbed my heavy-duty flashlight, a hunting knife just in case, and my phone to record anything noteworthy. Rachel was asleep within minutes of laying her head down, and after waiting maybe 20 just to be safe, I turned out the lights and quietly made my way out of the cabin. It was dead quiet outside as I made my way down to the dock. No frogs, no crickets, nothing making a sound that night. I pushed off the dock and rowed my way toward the island. Each dip of the oars into the water seemed so loud in the complete silence of the night. I was so anxious to see if Rachel's dad's stories were true or just legend. Either way, there was something off about this island, and I desperately wanted to see it for myself. I pulled up to it and circled around for a minute. The moon was bright enough for me to see the shoreline as I scanned for any spots that were clear enough for me to set anchor. Finally, I spotted a stump jutting out from the land that was partially submerged. The boat drifted towards it as I grabbed a hold and hoisted myself onto the land. I tied the rope to the stump, and after making sure it was secure, I clumsily stepped through the thick brush until I made my way onto what appeared to be someone's yard. I switched on my flashlight to see a disheveled home sitting in the very middle of the island. It stood two stories with rotting walls and a caved-in roof. No way, I thought to myself. There really is a house here. All of the windows were broken and the entirety of the house was suffocated by an overgrowth of ancient vines. The trees were so dense around it that it blacked out the sky above as this house stood forgotten by time. I remembered to pull out my phone right then to capture anything I might find. I swept the beam of light over the house after I hit record, then I made my way over. My feet crunched on fallen dead branches and leaves. That sense of dread returned to me with a vengeance. I'd come this far, and I was not going to turn back now. I shined the light on the front door that sat ajar. I shone the light through the openings where the windows used to be, and it was eerie to say the least. Whoever lived here really must have owned a knick-knack shop or something, because dozens of miscellaneous items were strewn across the floor, coated in years of thick dust. A box spring mattress looked as if it had been thrown across the room as it sat partially upright against a decaying wall. I put my weight into the door, and it agonizingly creaked open, letting out decades of neglect. The air was dense and unforgiving as I swept my phone all around to record all these long-forgotten memories. Dozens of various trinkets, household tools, and ceramic animals covered the floors as I carefully stepped over the abandoned piles. I shifted the light to one corner of the room and felt my heart jump where I saw a pile of maybe a dozen baby dolls lying in a heap. I made my way towards them as the floor creaked and groaned. I was seriously starting to get the creeps as I noticed it was significantly colder in the house than it was outside in the summer night. Some of the dolls were missing their heads while others had dirty and torn clothing on them. Right above the pile, I noticed a picture hanging on the wall. I blew off the thick coat of dust and went into a coughing fit as it blew directly back into my eyes and down my throat. When I came to, I saw it was one of those creepy old-timey photos of a family where no one was smiling. 
just vacant expressions staring back at me. There was a 30-something-year-old woman holding a baby with two little boys sitting by her sides. I realized they were standing in front of the house that I was currently invading. I turned around, and my blood ran cold. Standing at the opposite edge of the room in a doorway was a small boy lit up in the beam of my flashlight. I jumped out of my skin and screamed as the light illuminated this figure. He was maybe seven or eight years old, with sandy blonde hair and deep brown eyes. The light in his face didn't seem to bother him as he stared straight through me. I quickly recognized his face as one of the boys in the photograph. Sir, what are you doing here? The words slithered out of his mouth and up my spine, sending a cold chill throughout my body. I sat there dumbfounded as I stammered at the ghostly figure. Can you help my brother? Please, sir. The boy requested of me. I was speechless. He quickly turned and darted into the room behind him. I stood there for a moment, but then I realized I had all of this on video and I was seeing dollar signs. This was the most incredible and terrifying thing I'd ever witnessed. I took a deep breath, made sure the phone was still recording, and made my way into the room. I passed through the doorway and into a room that looked pristine. Clean floors, painted walls, and wooden rocking chairs. It even appeared that night had turned back into day, as the room looked dimly lit in the early morning light. I spotted yet another child off in the corner, just sitting on the floor, looking away from me, while the one who urged me into the room was leaning over something wrapped up on a couch. I made my way over to him, then glanced over his shoulder to see a baby cuddled up in a blanket cocoon. He feels cold, sir. He hasn't made a sound in a long time, and we don't know what's wrong. The little boy said to me with sadness in his voice. The other child began rocking nervously, hands clenched around his legs as he formed into a little ball. Can you help us, sir? The boy pleaded. The rocking child began to whimper and mumble under his breath. I'm sorry, I don't know what I can do to help. I spoke to him. Is your mother around? She can help you. It was at that moment that I heard a sound coming up from a staircase that I hadn't seen before. It started out very faint, but as the sound gradually grew, I could make out the heartbreaking sound of a woman crying. It persisted until it was a full-fledged wail that was ringing throughout the house. The boy rocking in the other corner quickly rose and sprinted out of the room. You should leave, mister. She doesn't like visitors. At that moment, it was like something flipped a switch, and the once immaculate room was now dark and cluttered with disgusting furniture that was torn and rotting. The wailing from upstairs hadn't ceased, and I heard loud, vicious stomping on the floor, right above me, rapidly, making its way to the staircase and starting the descent to the room I was in. I felt frozen in place. I shined the light down onto the couch to see a dirty, dust-caked doll lying there in a blanket. I looked back up at what sounded like a raging bull hit the bottom of the stairs, then just stopped. So did the crying. I fell back and waited for what felt like hours for something to show itself. I tried to crawl backwards as my legs seemed to stop working. After what felt like an eternity, it started its way towards me, and my heart sank. Thud, thud, thud. Each pause between the steps was more suspenseful than the last. I sat there, hands shaking as my flashlight trembled with them. I tried to force myself to turn it off, but it was too late. I watched in horror as a figure dark as night with long wispy hair and gangly limbs lumbered into the room. It seemed to stop and face me for a moment, and I could feel tears running down my face. After a brief pause, it made its way to the couch. It looked down at the old doll and stroked its head with the long, bony fingers. It let its face collapse into its hands, and it began sobbing once more. Same as before, it gradually grew louder and louder until it was nearly deafening. It picked up the doll and held it tight to its chest, 
before letting out an ear-piercing scream of pure despair. I was somehow able to get enough of a grip and pull out my knife, but as I did, this thing's neck violently twisted towards me and postured up. It towered high above me as its head nearly grazed the ceiling. At last, my legs found the strength I needed, and adrenaline kicked in. I stopped the video and pocketed my phone before making a mad dash for the door. I heard rapid, heavy stomps close the distance instantly, and I felt a tremendous force knock me through the doorway that I'd been running through. I frantically looked up as my flashlight had fallen from my hands, but I could still make out the figure hurling itself through the beam of light, which was coming from the flashlight wherever it had landed. A symphony of screaming and crying was coming from this thing. It stood over me as it pinned me to the ground with immense strength. I managed to shake my arm free. I then attempted to slash at its face with the knife, but it grabbed my wrist with such force that I felt it was going to snap my arm. It clenched its cold hands around mine and slowly guided the knife down towards my stomach. I tried punching it with my now free hand as it slowly lifted my shirt and began running the blade down my abdomen. I screamed out in pain as it pierced my skin. I felt warm blood slide down my sides. My free hand frantically grasped for anything to use to defend myself with when I felt it go over a large piece of broken glass. Without hesitating, I grabbed it and stuck the thing in its eye. It let out a horrible cry and fell off me as I managed to sprint out of the house and into the boat. I could hear it crying that same mournful wail as I pushed the boat off and made it back to the cabin. I pulled in and tied the boat down before sprinting up to the house, but when I opened the door, I heard a horrible sound. The same crying was coming from somewhere inside my cabin. It sounded muffled at first, but grew in volume as I approached our bedroom. I made my way to the door, and as I opened it, the crying stopped. All I saw was Rachel slumbering peacefully the way I'd left her. I checked the closets, checked under the bed, checked every room in the house, but could find no sign of anything out of the ordinary. I dove under the covers and curled up tightly next to Rachel, my body trembling in terror. I decided right there we were leaving the following day. I couldn't be here anymore. I don't know if it was exhaustion or the result of high adrenaline wearing off, but I somehow found sleep after cowering under the covers for a while. I had a dream, though. It was me walking to the shore of the island. I could see our cabin in the distance, a small candle in the living room providing it enough light to be seen. However, I had no control over my movements. Whatever I was actually seeing through, looked down at the water, dove in, and began swimming furiously toward the cabin. All the way I screamed for it to stop, but it only gained speed. It climbed onto the dock and sprinted at an unnatural speed the earth seeming to shake underneath its feet. It opened the door of the cabin, slowing its pace, carefully making its way through the living room then down the hall. It stopped and looked right at the bedroom door. It creaked open the door and walked inside. There I was, sleeping like a baby. I watched its disgusting, monstrous fingers slowly reach down towards me before violently grabbing me by the throat. I jolted awake and immediately shook Rachel up. We have to go now. What? She replied in a groggy tone. Just start packing. We're leaving right now. I rushed her into the car and hastily threw everything I could find before speeding down the unpaved road and away from the place. Rachel groggily asked me what was wrong, but I couldn't seem to answer. I felt as though I was in shock and I couldn't get any words to come out. It was then that I remembered the video. I'd recorded it all. I pulled out my phone and handed it to Rachel. Go through the videos. Watch the most recent one, I told her. I don't understand what I'm looking at here, she said in an exhausted voice before handing me the phone after watching for a few minutes. What? Please, babe, just watch it through, I pleaded with her. 
she mumbled something but was already asleep again. I didn't really care that she wouldn't see it now. I was just happy to be getting away from that place and back home. I stopped at a rest stop a few hours into the trip. The sun had just finished rising. After making a trip to the bathroom and grabbing a few sodas from a vending machine, I decided to take a look at the video myself. Either Rachel was just half asleep, or the video didn't come out clear like I'd hoped. I pulled open the video, and my heart sank. There was no house in front of me, just dense brush and a huge pile of bricks and wood, the remains of a home. I scrolled through two hours of footage of me just standing there, staring straight ahead at nothing. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I scrolled through the video, and it was over three hours straight of me just standing there. I went to the end of the video before some movement finally caught my eye because the end of the video consisted of me slowly pulling up my shirt, dragging a knife across my stomach and grunting in pain before I dropped the knife and sprinted back to the boat in a panic, making my way back to the cabin. For several hours of the drive, I just sat in silence unable to comprehend what all had happened. Even when Rachel took over driving, I would not let myself fall asleep in fear of having another nightmare. I didn't want to tell her, and I hoped that she was too tired to even remember me showing it to her. After the long 17-hour drive was finally over, we started to unload our stuff from the car. Rachel was gathering up all of her things while I started to haul in the larger pieces of luggage into the home. I walked into the house and set down all the luggage I was carrying. I felt a sense of unease take over. The air was thick and heavy and the house was freezing cold. I reached for our doorknob to the bedroom and felt my heart sink. Just beyond the door, I could hear the faint sound of a woman sobbing. My Summer Camp Ghost Story From Amelia Inn Location Unknown It was the beginning of summer break. I had just finished fifth grade. My best friend, Avery, had told me all about a camp she went to during the summer. It was an all-girls camp that lasted two weeks. She had asked me to go with her this summer and I happily accepted. I never really had a planned out summer like this before. My parents were always too busy to take us on vacations. I saw this as an opportunity to actually have fun and hang out with my friend, and maybe even make new ones. A week after school let out, Avery's mom drove us two hours away to this camp. When we got there, I automatically had an uneasy feeling. I thought I was just nervous, being two hours away from my home, maybe a little nervous about being away for two weeks. We made it to our cabin in the woods and settled in. Our counselor went through all the camp rules and handed us a schedule. We were to wake up at 7 a.m. sharp, then go to the cafeteria to get breakfast. The first week, our group was scheduled to go swimming in the lake first. I was very excited. I had never done anything like this before, and the fact that I got to experience it with Avery made it even better. The following day, Avery and I woke up to the sound of an alarm. We got dressed and headed to breakfast. We sat next to a group of girls and started chatting with them. They then shared with us a chilling story that we weren't familiar with. They said 23 years ago, a young girl took her own life in the lake here. They never did find her body. This spooked me, considering I was only 11 at the time, and I believed anything that came out of someone's mouth. Avery didn't believe the girls and told me we would sit somewhere else. She noticed I wasn't touching my food and tried to change the subject to get my mind off of it. Breakfast was over, and it was time for our group to head over to the lake. I had an uneasy feeling at the bottom of my stomach. I didn't want to be known as the girl who chickened out of swimming on the first day of camp, 
Avery jumped in and looked up at me. I was on the dock looking down at her when all of a sudden, the dock shook from beneath me a bit. I assumed it was Avery trying to get me to jump in, so I rolled my eyes, then I leapt. The water was warm, which was surprisingly welcome. We began to play all the water games you could think of, and as I was about to get out, I tripped over something. Nothing prepared me for what happened next. It was like something straight from a movie, so serendipitous and creepy. I looked down to see what I had tripped over, and below me was a bone sticking out of the sand. I screamed and ran to our counselor who was watching us from the bench about 20 feet away. Avery got out of the lake and ran after me. I was in tears. I told the leader about the story we had heard that morning and what I'd just experienced. She had a concerned look on her face and just stared at the water. After calming me down, she motioned for the other girls to get out of the water. We took our showers back at the cabin and finished the day with some fun activities. Needless to say, I'd forgotten all about my encounter. On the second day, we were scheduled to go canoeing first. I was okay with this, as long as I did not have to be in the water physically. Avery and I entered the cafeteria to get our breakfast. We sat near this giant window. The group of girls from before who were talking about that story the previous day began to make their way towards us. One of the girls introduced herself as Katie. She said she had heard about my encounter at the lake the previous day and asked me if I thought the bone was human. I didn't really know how to answer that. I only glanced at the bone before freaking out and running off. I told her the truth, that I didn't know for sure and that all I knew was the bone was pretty big. She took a seat next to Avery and brought up the story of the girl again. This chick was starting to annoy me with this creepy story, so I decided to walk to the bathroom and leave them. I ran the cold sink water over my hands and thought about everything that had happened. When out of the blue, one of the stalls slammed shut. It scared me so much. I looked under the stall but saw that there was no feet there, so I was still alone in the bathroom. But I sure as heck wasn't about to open that door. Instead, I darted out of the bathroom and I uneasily made my way back to the table Avery was at. She and Katie seemed to be getting along well. I was pale and out of breath when I came back, but no one seemed to notice. It was time for me and Avery to go back to the lake and get into our canoes. These canoes were one-seaters, and all the girls had to take turns considering there were ten canoes, and we had twenty girls in our group. I was one of the first to get in, of course. I climbed into a canoe, and the counselor guided it into the lake. I was getting the hang of things and starting to go further into the lake. Come to find out, that was a big mistake. Suddenly, I felt a hard push against my canoe, and it flipped over. It took me a moment to realize that it had happened. Out of nowhere, I felt a cold hand wrap around my leg and began to yank me downwards. I had on a life jacket, thankfully, and the thing was buoyantly pulling me up. Despite how much the hand pulled at me, it couldn't pull me under the water too far. The counselor had seen my canoe capsize and quickly took action. Before I knew it, I was being pulled up out of the water onto the counselor's canoe. She pushed me to shore and we both got out. When I could finally think clearly, I thought I was going insane. Can you imagine that happening to you? It was honestly a miracle I had my life jacket on or I don't think I would have made it out of that lake. I was in tears. The counselor decided it would be best if I went back to the cabin to see another camp counselor. She took me over there and I explained everything to that counselor. She had the same look as the other one though, from the first day when I told her I tripped over a bone. I couldn't calm down, I was freaking out, 
I would not be satisfied or feel safe until I made it back home. That counselor let me call my mom and she discussed the situation with her. She told my mother it could have been a large fish pulling on my leg. I know she only said this to try and calm me down, but nothing about whatever gripped my leg even closely felt like a fish. It was exactly like a human hand. My mother said she would come and get me, and she would tell Avery's mom that I was going home. I packed my bags and waited for my mom's car to pull up. I climbed in and quietly never looked back. It's been a few years since then. Avery and I haven't really talked to each other anymore. Not long after that experience, I felt it might be a good idea to do a bit of research on that summer camp. And it turns out, the story that Katie had told us was true. A girl did take her life in that lake. Apparently, she had gone swimming, and the counselor wasn't paying attention. They weren't completely sure it was deliberate that she took her own life, or if she simply had an accident in that water. But the fact is, she's still missing, and her body was never found. I can't imagine what could have happened if I stayed at that camp any longer. Maybe I would not be so lucky. I plan on never going back to any summer camp for the rest of my life. I'd rather have a boring summer than one that is straight from my nightmares. There's something out there. From Kala S. Location. Rim Mountain of Arizona. I was 16 at the time. My grandparents owned a fairly secluded ranch in the Rim Mountain of Arizona. They had seven smaller cabins that they would rent out to people occasionally, and my family would go up to visit them in one of the cabins in the spring and summer, but not a whole lot during the fall and winter seasons because it can get cold and snow a lot. One weekend in January, we decided to go up there and stay for the weekend. My brother, his wife, their two young children, and my cousin came along. When we arrived, I remember the snow coming down in a very serene and pretty way. The day was fairly normal, and the night came way too fast. My cousin and I were going to share a cabin together. At one point, I was getting tired, but my cousin decided to stay at our grandparents' house a little longer for board games. When I went outside to head back to the cabin to get some rest after a long day, it was pitch black out and the moon was very dim. The walk was a bit eerie. I used a flashlight, but I could only see the trees close to me and nothing beyond that. Maybe it was the cold, but maybe it was something else. But suddenly, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I felt like I was not alone out there. I froze for a moment and looked around. I couldn't see much, so I didn't spot anything out of the ordinary. So I continued on. I soon made it back to our cabin, where I got ready for bed and climbed into my queen-sized bed and finished the day off with a little reading on my Kindle. Now, this cabin is not very big. It's large enough for a small bathroom, a large bed, some nightstands, a desk, and a couch. The cabin had three medium-sized windows, one directly above the bed, a skylight, I believe. My eyes were getting heavy, so I was about to put my Kindle away when I heard the most haunting noise. It was coming from directly behind me, from the other side of the window there. It was like a growl, deep, almost subtle, but it was audible enough and sudden enough that it made me jump out of my bed and look over in that direction. I will never forget what I saw. There just beyond the window, inches away from where I stood, there was a creature that looked like a wolf. I thought maybe one of the neighbor's dogs had gotten out, but the window it was at was a part of the cabin that was set up on a deep slope so this dog or wolf would have to be taller than the tallest person alive 
in order for its entire face just to be visible. Suddenly, the animal slammed a hand against the window, a human-like hand with long claws. I nearly screamed as it raked those claws across the glass, emanating a dreadful sound. Slowly, it then backed away until I could no longer see it through the haze of the snow and darkness, but I could hear it outside, lumbering around heavily and slowly, occasionally scratching at the wood as if trying to find a way inside. I realized with horror then that I had left the front door unlocked for my cousin. I ran towards the front door grabbing my phone, practically ripping it off the charger. I quickly locked the door and crouched in the corner out of sight of those large windows. I stayed absolutely silent while I dialed my mom, but unfortunately the cell service was terrible up there in the mountain and I only had one bar, so my phone was taking forever to cooperate. I did finally manage to get a hold of my mother. She asked me if I was okay, immediately sensing a panic in my tone. And that's when something heavy crashed against the cabin with such force that the entire cabin shook and the lights even flickered for a moment. I screamed like a five-year-old, tearing my voice and dropping my phone. I could hear it out there, still circling the cabin. But when the grumbling sounds of my grandpa's truck closed in, the sounds of that creature faded away. My grandpa then called out to me, and the first thing I did was run out the front door, straight into his arms. He was holding a firearm. My three uncles were with him, all armed up to the teeth as well. They were looking around, asking me what the heck was going on. My mom climbs out as well and begins to comfort me. I told them word for word what I saw and heard. My grandpa looked at my mom and then to my uncles, then told my mother to take me back to their cabin and that the four of them would look around. Some time passed. I was sitting in my grandparents' house waiting anxiously when finally they returned, all their faces white as sheep. They were clutching their firearms so tight that their knuckles turned pale. My grandma asked what they found. My grandpa answered, they found massive paw prints in the snow that were bigger than my grandpa's hands. There were also deep gouges that reached the rooftop, and the roof is nearly 20 feet off the ground, so none of the local black bears in the area could have possibly made those gouges, not without a slow and steady bit of climbing, and if that were the case, we would have caught them in the act. We all stayed at my grandparents' place that night, and my uncles and grandpa stayed up, waiting for the local game wardens to come and investigate whom they had recently called. We went home the next day. A few weeks passed by when I overheard a Skype conversation between my mom and grandpa. The situation was only getting worse. Apparently, one of their bulls was found in the field, torn to pieces, and they found the same paw prints there encircling the carcass. Be careful out there when going to any rural area. You never know what might be watching you from the shadows. Happenings at Camp From Josh Location Unknown The story begins when I went to a summer camp for a week with my brother. I didn't really want to go, but my parents forced me to. Upon arrival, we all had to do the registration and moving in stuff, making the cabin our new temporary home. I was the first to make it to the cabin, and my counselor introduced himself. Soon everyone else arrived, so we began a get-to-know-you game, then headed off to dinner. Nothing really happened until the second night, when things got really strange. I had fallen asleep and I had a dream where I was in my sleeping bag stuck in the middle of the woods. When I woke up, I knew I was lucid. I knew the dream was over, but my surroundings hadn't changed. I was still in the woods. 
but when I reached out around me to feel around, freely able to move my body, my hand touched cabin walls. I was still in my cabin somehow, despite the scenery being the middle of the woods. It was like the wrong setting had been imprinted into my mind. I reached around for my watch, which was difficult as I couldn't even see my stuff. Everything on the ground appeared to be earth, grass, leaves, all of that. When I found my watch, I pressed a button that caused it to beep and light up, which finally pulled me completely out of the illusion. I was back in the cabin. But even though it was over, I was so terrified and confused that I began to panic, waking up the other campers in the cabin. They turned on the lights, looking at me like I was crazy. I'm pretty sure that was the night they labeled me the weird kid. The next odd thing that happened was when we exited the cabin to go hiking to a certain building. I came upon the entrance to the trail there when I suddenly saw someone completely out of place. There was a girl along the trail, dressed in white, that no one else seemed to notice. As I had to follow the group, I had no choice but to approach her, and the closer I got to her, the more her image faded. That wasn't the end of it, though. As we continued along the trail, there would be more children dressed in odd ways. Each one of them would fade away as we approached, yet none of the other campers seemed to notice. It stopped when we got to the end, and in the building everyone was going into, there was a shadowy black mass enveloping the interior, but the other campers just walked into it like it was nothing. I was too scared to approach it, until, like the other illusions, it faded. I have no idea what was going on at that camp, or if there was something up with me that year, but it was the most confusing and glitchy experience I'd ever had. Almost Attacked from Bumble Tea, Location, Washington. This happened when I was in middle school. I was about 12 years old. One of my friends at the time named Sunny was having a birthday party and I was invited. She invited me along with a few others. We would be staying at a designated camping ground in a heavily forested part of Washington. I don't remember the name of the place, but it was quite a ways away from civilization. We had a small cabin to sleep in and it was near a lake in the middle of the campsite. The night we got there, we went out to the lake to play by the water. We told stories and celebrated Sunny's birthday. The sun was going down, and we were watching the stars at that point. I suddenly heard splashing coming from the other side of the lake. I looked up to see if another group or person was swimming there, or if it was an animal, but what I saw made me do a double take. There was a white figure. It was hunched over its long arms, claws raking at the water. I watched it for a moment, trying to figure out what kind of animal it was. Then I placed my hand on one of my friend's arms, asking, What is that? It was loud enough that the entire group heard me. Together, we all looked toward the figure across the lake. We were all staring at it, dumbfounded, from that distance unable to tell what it was, until it looked at us. The thing had dark eyes, like it didn't have any in the first place. It slowly pulled its arms out of the water, and it began to move. Before I knew what was happening, the creature was striding through the water, sprinting at us. We got up and turned on our heels to run back to the cabin. We could hear the thing speedily going through the water, it was gaining on us. We soon heard it climb out of the lake and began to tear through the grass. The creature was growling like a dog, snarling at us. We made it back to the cabin in one piece, slamming the door behind us and pressing ourselves against it to keep it shut. Then everything was quiet. We stayed up for a long time, making sure the thing was gone. We hardly slept that night, we were terrified of it somehow getting into the cabin. 
The following morning, we went outside and found the trail of mangled grass and torn dirt that it had left in its wake as it chased us. I'll be forward with you about this. The way it looked, it reminded me exactly of how the rake is portrayed. And even if it wasn't the rake, its bizarre appearance, combined with that level of aggression, I would not want to run into it again. My Summer Camp Horror from Alina, location unknown. My summer one year was very boring. My friends lived far apart, and we don't really do a lot together, as they're usually off on vacation during the summer. So I asked my mom to sign me up for a summer camp. I preferred going to technology camps rather than the traditional woods, but there were no openings left in the tech camp that I wanted to go to. So I was forced out into the woods. When the time came, I packed my stuff up for camp, and I left. The camp itself was about an hour drive from our area, so my mom drove me. Before long, I was dropped off at the camp entrance. There was a friendly looking man there waiting. My mom walked me up to him, and he introduced himself as Roger. He said that I could call him Buzzy. He jokingly said that he was friends with the buzzards around here. I was pretty happy, and I was beginning to look forward to my time here. This full camp session lasted for a week. Buzzy instructed me to follow him. He led me to a cabin and he opened the door. Inside, there were three girls. One was on the top bunk of a bunk bed, another reading a book, and the third was listening to the radio at a small table in the corner. The girls were actually very friendly when they saw me and introduced themselves as Abigail, Clarissa, and Chelsea. I introduced myself back our cabin was pretty small, barely able to hold four people. I ended up getting the top bunk area in the left corner. An hour after that, Buzzy called us out to dinner. There were about 150 kids there altogether. I was kind of relieved, because if anything bad happened, I had all these people for help. We finished dinner and went outside to the campfire. It was pretty fun, singing silly songs and eating s'mores. After that, it was time to go to bed. I followed my three new friends to the cabin, and that's when things get bad. The cabin had a fairly simple layout. Bunk beds on each side, one on the bottom and one on top. Each top bunk had a small window which could be opened in times of an emergency. On each right side, there was a door. When you walk out the door, there is a pair of small wooden stairs. This will be important later in the story. So I quickly climbed up into my top bunk, ready for bed. I began to listen to music from my iPod, which I had snuck into the camp. About 10 minutes later, all the lights in the camp turned off. I shut off my phone and went to sleep. At around 1 a.m., my iPod went off with an alarm. I was kind of confused, because I didn't have any alarms set for 1 a.m. I didn't have any alarms set at all. I quickly stopped it and turned off the sound. Somehow, I was the only one who heard it, the only one now awake. Just as I was about to go back to sleep, I turn around to get a good look outside the window. The coldness from outside had formed a fog on it. I took a quick glance, and I see a pair of small red eyes staring back at me. I freak out. If anyone knows what that feels like, it's like having the urge to scream, but you're too scared, so you hold it in. Your brain sort of goes fuzzy, and you forget everything else besides what you're looking at. That happened to me, and I could not take my eyes off of those eyes. It felt like I'd been staring at them for hours, in just a few seconds. Then the eyes simply faded away, like they were never there. I sat there, trembling. I finally managed to make myself look away from the window. I rolled over, stared at the other direction, until I could no longer hold back sleep. At around 2 a.m., though, my iPod rang again with an alarm. Once again, I hurried to shut it off, 
Not sure why I kept having alarms go off when there were no alarms set and the sound was supposed to be off. But remembering what I saw last time this happened, as fast as I possibly could, I twisted over and I stuck my face into the mattress, afraid to look out that window. But it wasn't the window that was the problem this time, because as I lay there afraid, I felt someone put their weight into the side of my mattress. I felt someone crawl into bed with me. I was crying now, tears welling up in my eyes. I could feel this presence next to me, one that did not feel like a person. It felt hateful. I trembled as I felt someone lay a hand on my back. But that was not the worst part. There came a whisper in my ear, one that seared those words chillingly into my mind. No one can help you. Then it emitted this cackle of something not of this world into my ear. I felt it take its hand off of me. The pressure on my back and on the bed seemed to lift, but I was too scared to even open my eyes. Laying there motionless for God knows how long, I eventually fell asleep. Though the following day was normal, I had trouble enjoying anything else. I was quiet and didn't even say anything to my friends. I knew they would not believe my story. We ended up taking a hike through the woods for a small tour. When we were returning, I glanced at my cabin and I saw something that looked like footprints, so I called Buzzy over. Imagine a T-Rex's tracks, but slimmer. That's what they looked like. Even Buzzy was pretty confused as to what they were. He said that he couldn't place those footprints, but he's been seeing them around this camp before. I nodded, and I went back to the camp. The rest of the day was normal, until nighttime came. I turned off my iPod again, and I tried to get some sleep. But as if on cue, my iPod rang out. It was 2 a.m. again. Knowing what had happened the past night, I covered my head with my pillow and turned over. I remember thinking, not again, not again. Then I heard the west door slowly creak open. I heard a sound resembling scales on a wooden floor. I heard it for a while, creeping about the cabin, before it stopped and the door closed with a steady creak. I sighed and I went back to sleep. But for the fourth time in two days, my iPod rang out, this time at 3 a.m. The alarm ringing again, I turned it off. I shut my ears, my mouth, and covered myself with blankets. But then I began to feel someone shaking me. I screamed back this time. Stop it! Just stop! Why me? Until I hear a voice call my name. I turn over to see Chelsea shaking me. She said I had been having a bad dream, that I had been shaking around and yelling, fighting the air. I sighed and thanked her for waking me. As she returned to her bed and was about to get in, I heard her gasp. I peeked over the edge of my bed, about to ask her what was wrong, when I saw the problem. There was a pair of big red footprints in front of the ladder by my bed. Chelsea is just staring at them. I begin to climb down to her, but she says to stop. When I ask her why, she replies with this sentence. It's here. Eyes widened. I ask what's here, and she points to the foot of my ladder. Where there had been just one set of footprints, there's now several, even closer to my ladder. Chelsea then faints. I scream my lungs out, waking Abigail and Clarissa, and apparently Buzzy, who comes running through the west door. He asks what's wrong. I point to the footprints below my ladder, and out of the corner of my eye, I see a dark silhouette, just outside the other door. Buzzy bends down and inspects the prints. He gets up, shakes his head, and picks up Chelsea. He tells me, Abigail, and Clarissa to follow him. 
he takes us quickly to the dining room and gives us leftover pasta to eat and calm down with, all while he's trying to wake up Chelsea. A minute later, he comes back with her. I get up and hug her, and she sits down. I ask her if she's okay, and she says, yeah. I then ask her about what happened back there before she blacked out. This was her reply to the exact word. I heard you yell in your sleep. You were saying go away over and over, so I went to wake you. After you were awake, I climbed down your ladder. When I looked back to check on you, I saw this black thing. It was huge, but I could see white teeth. It was looking right at me. I was about to tell you, but it hissed at me to be quiet. You asked what was wrong, and I said it's here. All I remember is seeing the shadowy thing lunge at me. That was the end of her explanation. Needless to say, the very next day I packed up and left. I did stay in contact with my friends from camp though. Abigail, Chelsea, and Clarissa were all still friends to this day, but never ever in my life am I going back to that camp. Even if a summer camp seems innocent and fun, it may have its secrets, and those secrets may just be dangerous. Shower Singer from Anonymous Inn Location Unknown A couple of years ago, I went to a summer camp. It was a camp about safety. We had police come in and teach us how to be safe. We had a real helicopter fly into our camp too. I loved the camp, except for one particular night. Everyone was doing their normal nightly routine, brushing their teeth, using the bathroom, getting in their pajamas and laying down to go to bed. I was a little late to the bathroom with a couple of my cabin mates. When I was brushing my teeth, I hear a weird noise coming from the shower area. It was almost as if someone was singing in the shower, yet the shower was not on. One of my friends heard it too and walked over to see who it was. When he looked inside the door, I saw him jump back, startled. I asked him what he saw and he stood there staring in the doorway. I walked over to the doorway to look inside and when I did, I was shocked too. There was a man. He was wearing nothing but boxers. He was not a counselor nor a camper. We both ran back to the cabin to tell a real counselor. When we got back, we burst through the cabin door. My friend was shocked and still out of breath, so I explained what happened. They went to have a look themselves. We tagged along since we were no longer scared as there was an adult by our side. When we made it back to the showering area, our counselor walked in with a firearm and was yelling at the person who was inside. We heard the man still singing in the back showers, and we all went back there. Our counselor pushed away the shower curtain, and all we saw was a tape recorder that was constantly playing a voice of a man singing. At that moment, we were all confused, including the counselor. Then, to our surprise, the door to the showering area closed with force. The counselor ran over and tried to open it, but it would not budge. Eventually, he took out his phone and called the head of the camp to come let us out with some police officers with him. When they got there, they let us out, and that was it. It was weird and creepy and just ends right there without any explanation. Nothing else happened on my time at the camp. I'm still paranoid after it happened, but more so wondering who that man was. And last but not least, to top off this video, is a post from Reddit about a terrifying cabin story. You may recognize it, you may not, but either way, you might just enjoy this. Something crawled into our cabin from Fresh Lad 4.
So, I've noticed a lot of experiences take place in the woods. I had previously thought that there were fewer people experiencing strange happenings in forests, despite the many unexplainable events I myself have experienced. Anyway, I figured I would share one of mine. So, here goes. This happened 15 years ago, I believe, because I remember being around 10 at the time. Growing up, I had a best friend named Michael. He was my neighbor. Our families had been neighbors since before we were born, so even if we didn't want to, we would have been made to spend time with one another. Luckily, though, we were quite easy to bond. His family would go to a cabin in the mountains. The mountains, of course, is what we called it, but the nearest mountain range was incredibly small, so it was much more notable as just being a forest. When we were 10, my parents allowed me to accept their invitation for me to join them on their trip that year. Excited as I was at the time, this would quickly change after staying there. When the day comes, we depart from our hometown and embark on the nearly three hour trip to the cabin. Michael and I are both elated that we get to spend a whole week together in this cabin, just enjoying the outdoors away from society. It sounded way more enticing to 10 year old me, I promise. At some point, I had fallen asleep. I assume Michael did too, since his parents called both our names as we were pulling up the snow-covered drive to the cabin. I look out the window, and I see a vast blanket of fresh snow covering everything. It must have snowed as recently as that morning, at least five inches deep too, judging from the snow amassed on the cabin's roof. This cabin was entirely surrounded by a forest that somehow still managed to appear incredibly dense, despite none of the trees even bearing leaves. The cabin itself was incredibly small and wooden and only bearing about five windows throughout. As soon as the car is parked, Michael and I burst out of the car and tromp through the snow, chasing one another and throwing snowballs. His parents took our bags and coolers of food inside and started making a home of the place while we stayed outside nearly until dark, playing in the snow. As nighttime was nearing, Michael and I heard what I can only assume was the cry of an animal. It sounded like a nervous, shrill bleat. We both guessed it must have been a deer. Not long afterwards, Michael's dad would call us in for dinner. After dinner, we sat in the living room area. His mom tried to turn on a lamp, which wouldn't turn on. His dad joked about the place being cozy, but being wired horribly. Then he started a fire in the fireplace, and we just hung out until it was time to wind down for the night and get ready for bed. Michael and I headed to our room, which featured two twin beds, a closet whose door refused to latch, a throw rug, as well as one of the five windows in the cabin. Michael and I, being young and having slept on the way to the cabin, weren't really ready to sleep. So instead, we spent our time sitting in our beds, trying to scare one another the way kids do. We began nodding off and called it a night. We switch off the lamp and go to sleep. I was woken up in the middle of the night to what sounded like a very small slam or bang. Being jarred right from my sleep, I thought I had imagined the sound, but something woke me up nonetheless. I bolted upright in my bed and I am sure I saw something creeping out of my peripheral vision. But the room was heavily shadowed, and it was a moonless night, so there was nearly no natural light to bathe the room. There was just me, Michael, and something else in the pitch black. I turn to the lamp, and I switch it on. Nothing. I try again to turn it on, 
but nothing. Beginning to panic, I searched through drawers in the nightstand the lamp sat on until my hands found a flashlight. I pull it out and light it up, placing my hand over it, shining it through my fingers, not wanting to make too much light so I wouldn't draw attention from whatever was there. I shine the small beam of light around the room slowly, always fearing the next inch of room the light would reach. Shining it on Michael's side of the room, I found he was still asleep. I crawl out of bed as quietly as possible, shining my light at the floor. I remember it like it was yesterday, the sight of melting snow footprints making their way across our room from the window. They stopped halfway through the room when the prints came into contact with the rug on the floor. I cried out in fear and ran to Michael's parents' room, waking them up and telling them that something got inside our room. They believed me and rushed to the room to inspect. However, I would lose their trust when they found the wet footprints gone, like they had dried up instantly, hiding themselves. His dad inspected the window, and the window was locked. No way something could have gotten in. His parents weren't mad. They told me everything was all right, then sent me back to bed. I curled up with the flashlight still in my hand in case I should need it again. Eventually, I would get back to sleep and make it through the rest of the night. The next morning, Michael and I were woken up by his parents encouraging us to stay quiet. All of our bags were packed and in the car, we were rushed outside and into the car as quickly as we could, still in our pajamas. His dad was the last out of the house and into the car. We drove all the way home, and Michael's dad told us that they had forgotten something at home, and that it was too much of a hassle to drive all the way back to the mountains just for a few days. I always thought there was something fishy about that story. Over this past Christmas, Michael and I found some time to hang out and catch up. Our families had gotten together in his living room, and we were just discussing life and reminiscing over some drinks. Then we bring up the cabin story, and his dad's demeanor suddenly becomes serious that's when he decided to tell us what he actually knew. Well, Michael's dad woke up at the first light of dawn on the morning that we would leave. He got up and headed outside to collect firewood. Going behind the house where the forest was thickest, he spotted a trail of footprints in the snow coming from the woods leading directly up to the window in Michael's and my room. He didn't really know how to describe the footprints, other than they didn't look entirely human, unless a human walks around on all fours with three long toes on each foot. He circled the cabin, looking for exit tracks and found none. He immediately rushed into the house, woke up his wife, and told her to pack everything while he searched the house. As much as he searched, though, he found nothing. Not willing to take chances with whatever was in the house with us, he instead had us get the hell out of there as quickly as he could. While Michael's mom was loading us into the car, he was checking through the house one last time. And upon checking our room, he found the closet slightly ajar, with just enough light shining in to illuminate a sunken black eye peeking out and watching him. Grandpa's Best Friend from Mythology Loves Horror 
The hunting cabin was just as I remembered it. It was tiny, hardly bigger than a tool shed, and after a year of neglect, dust now coated every surface. I hadn't been there in almost 10 years, not since the last time I went hunting with my grandfather Sebastian. I'd been so terrified by the thing we saw in the woods there that I hadn't wanted to return, and my parents just assumed I was too bored to want to spend two weeks with the boring old man, but Gramps still came to visit us. Thankfully, we never went there. When Gramps passed away a year ago, he left the cabin and the 30 acres surrounding it to his only remaining grandchild. At 20 years old, I had never expected to set foot on the rural mountainside again, much less inherit it, but a bad breakup had left me with the decision of moving into the cabin or into my parents' basement. The choice had almost been hard to make. The local newspaper, The Village Times, had claimed that Gramps died of a bear attack while out chopping firewood behind his cabin. I didn't really buy that story, though, and even as I pulled my beat-up old Ford into the unpaved driveway, I had my hand on my rifle. Though if that thing came back, I was sure it wouldn't do much to it. But still, it made me feel better. I hadn't seen it in a decade, but if that creature was still out there, I would be prepared this time. At least I hoped. Several hours later, I was unpacked, and the cabin was decently clean. All of the utilities were still hooked up, and the refrigerator was well stocked. I had taken the week off of work to adjust to my new life, and I was planning on just relaxing for the next few days. My first night and day passed uneventfully, but by the second night, things were getting a little weird. I had spent enough time in the country as a child to be familiar with the wildlife here. Raccoons, skunks, bears, other mammals. But the freshly made claw marks on the side of the cabin, they weren't anything that I recognized. I woke up on my third morning to gouges in the wood, and I was definitely unnerved. They were too large to belong to any small critters and far too high up to be from coyotes. They were even too wide to be a mountain lion or bear. In this neck of the woods, that ruled out everything logical. As I studied the claw marks, I wondered how I could have slept through them being made. They definitely hadn't been there when I first arrived and the fresh marks stood out in a bright contrast to the weathered wood of the cabin walls. I supposed a human could have made them with a knife, but I didn't have neighbors for miles. Who would be skulking around out here just to prank me like this? It didn't make any sense. It crossed my mind that maybe my ex might have done it, just to freak me out. But Sandra lived almost 50 miles away and did not have the address for the cabin in the first place. I don't use social media enough to bother listing my new address, and we didn't have friends in common or anything like that. I eventually shrugged it off, deciding to let it go. I knew that worrying about it wouldn't help. That afternoon though, I found myself driving the 10 miles into town and buying some motion activated floodlights and a motion sensing camera. Two more nights passed and each morning, I woke up to the claw marks getting closer and closer to the cabin door. As much as I wanted to believe it was a prank, I had to admit to myself that the evidence was overwhelmingly against that idea. The floodlights would turn on and the camera would snap, yet somehow all I would ever see in the photos was an empty yard. I had even tried to set up a video on my phone, but all it managed to capture was a vague blur of movement at the edge of the screen. I had enough. On the fifth night, I went outside rifle in hand, settling comfortably on the porch steps. There was no noise, no sound to indicate that the usual nocturnal critters were up and about. I shut all the lights off and waited for the creature that I knew would come. Hours passed, and as 1 a.m. rolled around, I snapped myself out of a doze. I could hear something moving quietly out by the edge of the woods, where I could make out a figure skulking about its features hidden in the shadows. 
As the animal drew closer, I rubbed my eyes in disbelief, because there stood Sebastian, my supposedly dead grandpa. He wasn't wearing any clothes. He paused mid-step, his head slowly turning to face me, probably hearing me gasp from shock. Grandpa looked sickly, with skin pale and ribs visible. He was bald now, his once Santa-like beard and hair gone. Grandpa, I called out. I could hear the quiver in my own voice, and my hands were shaking from terror. The rifle had fallen to my lap, nearly forgotten in the intensity of seeing my presumably dead grandfather. I'd been so convinced that what I was about to see would be that antlered creature that I saw years ago, the one I knew killed Sebastian, but I never considered once that my grandpa was still alive. Grandpa, what are you doing? C come inside. Tears were streaming down my cheeks. I didn't care what my grandfather had been doing this whole time or why he was out there. All I cared about was that he was still alive. I wanted to hug him again. Run. Run, you stupid boy. It's coming. His voice barely sounded human anymore. His voice came out all wrong, and before I could respond, Grandpa was bounding into the woods on all fours. He was gone in the blink of an eye, the bushes hardly swaying where he had passed through. The woods remained as eerily silent as they had been before, even though my grandfather's retreat should have made a large amount of noise. Not a second later, a low growl came from behind me, the sound reverberating off the cabin walls. A massive creature, the one that I remembered, approached from the side of the cabin. Within seconds, it became clear to me that it wasn't a human or an animal, unless someone was wearing an amazing and terrifying costume. The creature was every bit as surreal as I remembered. Long, pale limbs sprouted from an emaciated torso. An ivory deer skull shined in what little moonlight managed to bleed out through the clouds. It was wearing ragged old buckskin leggings and had beads around its neck. I could not see its eyes, though, but I knew without a doubt that if it had any, it was staring directly at me. I knew not whether it was a Wendigo or a Skinwalker or something else, but it didn't matter. It was here. Before I could take in any more detail, the creature began to laugh, a guttural sound that echoed in my head hauntingly. It was laughing so hard at me that it nearly doubled over. I realized that its limbs were able to wrap around its body almost twice. I raised my rifle, firing several times at it point blank, all of those rounds lodging firmly into the creature's neck and torso. The being looked down at its new piercings, then without a problem, almost comfortably, it began to dig out the bullets at an unhurried pace. It dropped them onto the ground like a child plucking flower petals and it seemed to sigh in irritation as it dug out the final one. Pointless. It, it just spoke. What was going on? What did this thing want? Did Grandpa always know about this horrendous looking thing? My head began to ache with the strain of trying to understand all this. <laughs> It seemed to sigh as if annoyed by the bullets. It then lifted its claw and pointed it at the cabin. Inside, go. Uh, I was all I could get out in reply to this thing speaking to me. I blinked profusely, and the next thing I knew, the monster was gone and standing there was Rufus, my grandpa Sebastian's best friend. Rufus had been around as long as I could remember and had always been a kind old man. He supposedly lived on the other side of the mountain 
even though I'd never actually seen his house, let alone been to it. Rufus just always sort of appeared out of nowhere, often startling us so badly that we had almost shot him a few times. What in tarnation you doing out here, whippersnapper? Rufus? Am I dreaming? <laughs> no, no, you're not dreaming. But you need to get inside before that thing comes back. That thing that looks like your grandpappy. I was shaking so tremendously from fear that I could barely move my limbs at the time, but I managed to navigate the steps. I'm not entirely sure why I obeyed Rufus after seeing that thing, but after seeing Rufus's familiar face, there was something calming about it, making this insane situation more easily dealt with. I needed some semblance of normalcy in that moment, so I went about my usual pre-bed routine, ignoring the fact that nothing made sense anymore. Mindlessly, I made sure all the windows and doors were locked. I took a long, hot shower to relax myself. I crawled into bed, my adrenaline finally calming down. I think I was in shock. I noticed I was repeatedly reassuring myself that I would wake up and everything would be as it should be. Just writing this down was hard enough. I have no idea, no ounce of understanding for what went on that night at the cabin. I'm more confused than I ever thought possible. Who really was Rufus? And what was that thing that looked like my grandpa? So, I've noticed a lot of experiences take place in the woods. I had previously thought that there were fewer people experiencing strange happenings in forests, despite the many unexplainable events I myself have experienced. Anyway, I figured I would share one of mine. So, here goes. This happened 15 years ago, I believe because I remember being around 10 at the time. Growing up, I had a best friend named Michael. He was my neighbor. Our families had been neighbors since before we were born, so even if we didn't want to, we would have been made to spend time with one another. Luckily though, we were quite easy to bond. His family would go to a cabin in the mountains. The mountains, of course, is what we called it, but the nearest mountain range was incredibly small, so it was much more notable as just being a forest. When we were 10, my parents allowed me to accept their invitation for me to join them on their trip that year. Excited as I was at the time, this would quickly change after staying there. When the day comes, we depart from our hometown and embark on the nearly three hour trip to the cabin. Michael and I are both elated that we get to spend a whole week together in this cabin, just enjoying the outdoors away from society. It sounded way more enticing to 10-year-old me, I promise. At some point, I had fallen asleep. I assume Michael did too, since his parents called both our names as we were pulling up the snow-covered drive to the cabin. I look out the window and I see a vast blanket of fresh snow covering everything. It must have snowed as recently as that morning, at least five inches deep too, judging from the snow amassed on the cabin's roof. This cabin was entirely surrounded by a forest that somehow still managed to appear incredibly dense, despite none of the trees even bearing leaves. The cabin itself was incredibly small, and wooden, and only bearing about five windows throughout. As soon as the car is parked, Michael and I burst out of the car and tromp through the snow, chasing one another and throwing snowballs. His parents took our bags and coolers of food inside and started making a home of the place, 
while we stayed outside nearly until dark, playing in the snow. As nighttime was nearing, Michael and I heard what I can only assume was the cry of an animal. It sounded like a nervous, shrill bleat. We both guessed it must have been a deer. Not long afterwards, Michael's dad would call us in for dinner. After dinner, we sat in the living room area. His mom tried to turn on a lamp, which wouldn't turn on. His dad joked about the place being cozy, but being wired horribly. Then he started a fire in the fireplace, and we just hung out until it was time to wind down for the night and get ready for bed. Michael and I headed to our room, which featured two twin beds, a closet whose door refused to latch, a throw rug, as well as one of the five windows in the cabin. Michael and I, being young and having slept on the way to the cabin, weren't really ready to sleep. So instead, we spent our time sitting in our beds, trying to scare one another the way kids do. We began nodding off and called it a night. We switch off the lamp and go to sleep. I was woken up in the middle of the night to what sounded like a very small slam or bang. Being jarred right from my sleep, I thought I had imagined the sound, but something woke me up nonetheless. I bolted upright in my bed, and I am sure I saw something creeping out of my peripheral vision. But the room was heavily shadowed, and it was a moonless night, so there was nearly no natural light to bathe the room. There was just me, Michael, and something else in the pitch black. I turn to the lamp, and I switch it on. Nothing. I try again to turn it on, but nothing. Beginning to panic, I search through drawers in the nightstand the lamp sat on, until my hands found a flashlight. I pull it out and light it up, placing my hand over it, shining it through my fingers, not wanting to make too much light so I wouldn't draw attention from whatever was there. I shine the small beam of light around the room slowly, always fearing the next inch of room the light would reach. Shining it on Michael's side of the room, I found he was still asleep. I crawl out of bed as quietly as possible, shining my light at the floor. I remember it like it was yesterday, the sight of melting snow footprints making their way across our room from the window. They stopped halfway through the room when the prints came into contact with the rug on the floor. I cried out in fear and ran to Michael's parents' room, waking them up and telling them that something got inside our room. They believed me and rushed to the room to inspect. However, I would lose their trust when they found the wet footprints gone, like they had dried up instantly, hiding themselves. His dad inspected the window, and the window was locked. No way something could have gotten in. His parents weren't mad. They told me everything was all right, then sent me back to bed. I curled up with the flashlight still in my hand in case I should need it again. Eventually, I would get back to sleep and make it through the rest of the night. The next morning, Michael and I were woken up by his parents encouraging us to stay quiet. All of our bags were packed and in the car we were rushed outside and into the car as quickly as we could, still in our pajamas. His dad was the last out of the house and into the car. We drove all the way home, and Michael's dad told us that they had forgotten something at home, and that it was too much of a hassle to drive all the way back to the mountains just for a few days. 
I always thought there was something fishy about that story. Over this past Christmas, Michael and I found some time to hang out and catch up. Our families had gotten together in his living room, and we were just discussing life and reminiscing over some drinks. Then we bring up the cabin story, and his dad's demeanor suddenly becomes serious. That's when he decided to tell us what he actually knew. Well, Michael's dad woke up at the first light of dawn on the morning that we would leave. He got up and headed outside to collect firewood. Going behind the house where the forest was thickest, he spotted a trail of footprints in the snow coming from the woods, leading directly up to the window in Michael's and my room. He didn't really know how to describe the footprints, other than they didn't look entirely human, unless a human walks around on all fours with three long toes on each foot. He circled the cabin, looking for exit tracks and found none. He immediately rushed into the house, woke up his wife, and told her to pack everything while he searched the house. As much as he searched, though, he found nothing. Not willing to take chances with whatever was in the house with us, he instead had us get the hell out of there as quickly as he could. While Michael's mom was loading us into the car, he was checking through the house one last time. And upon checking our room, he found the closet slightly ajar, with just enough light shining in to illuminate a sunken black eye peeking out and watching him. The House and the Cabin from Kaiju Arcadia. When I was 14 years old, me and my girlfriend went to my grandparents' house. We agreed to actually do a test of courage in the middle of the night an excuse to go explore some abandoned and creepy places. We asked my grandpa if he knew of any places like that. He told us about an old abandoned house and cabin at least a kilometer south of where we were. He said that the house was owned by a man from Ohio named Derek Shod from the 1900s, but he suddenly disappeared and was never heard from again. We were skeptic of this story my girlfriend and I weren't very strong believers of these kinds of things, so we decided to go to that location, not entirely spooked by that story. My grandparents didn't want us to go, but like teenagers, we disobeyed. We ended up sneaking away and running off in the middle of the night, searching for that house and cabin to the south. The only thing we had on us were two knives, two flashlights, and a few extra batteries. As we were searching, I could feel that the forest had eyes and ears. The entire way through, it was like someone was following us, watching us closely. When we finally found the house and cabin, a sudden cold breeze blew, giving us chills straight up our backs. We entered the house first. We found a lot of creepy things, like books about demons and witchcraft, strange graffiti that we didn't understand, some very weird paintings, and worst of all, at least to me, a bunch of dolls in every room we entered. The house was only a common American house. That's the way I'd describe it, as I'm from the Philippines. We were scared now, but we were still ready to see that cabin. So we exited the house and cautiously made our way over to the wooden cabin. It was about 50 or 60 feet away from the house. While I was walking behind my girlfriend, I heard a strange voice. Over here, I'm here. I stop right then and there, looking around, trying to find what called me. All I saw was a small bulge of cement. I approached it and then just stopped. I couldn't help myself but stop at that position. 
all I remember after that was complete blackness. Apparently, I blacked out. When I woke up, I saw my girlfriend also lying face down on the ground, just outside the cabin. We never made it to it. I panicked a bit and approached my girlfriend. When she woke up, she screamed, scaring me. Leave us alone. <sighs> I was surprised, and I took a step back. I asked what was wrong, and she said that a man had been following us from the very beginning. What? I looked at her face and saw how pale she was. She looked very frail and sickly. With us scared, and now possibly in danger, I gave her a piggyback ride and carried her out of the forest as far as I could. We soon made it to the dirt road near my grandparents' house. When I put her down, I saw that no time had passed since we had first entered the forest. When we left, it was 11.38, but when we came back out of the forest, it was only 11.39. A single minute had passed, despite us walking over a kilometer back and forth. I called my uncle to come pick us up. A few minutes later, he showed up, and we rushed my girlfriend to the nearest hospital. When I told my uncle about our adventure, he got pissed and shouted that we were very, very lucky to come back alive. He said that some other people had tried to investigate that place, but many were hurt when they returned. Unfortunately, my friend actually got a permanent scar from the damage on her head after blacking out. We didn't do anything like this again for several years. Luckily, we're both alive and well now, but we won't be going back to any strange cabins. The Island in the Lake From Names James 0933 Rachel, my fiancé, and I were on hour 17 into our drive to her family's cabin in northern Minnesota for a small vacation. I glanced at her with heavy eyelids to see that she was fast asleep in the passenger seat. The last two hours of the trip were spent through desolate back roads in towns that consisted of a hundred people and a lone stoplight. I could feel myself immersing into the solitude as the roads began to be labeled by numbers instead of names. Finally, I turned onto the long stretch of road that winded through the forest and led to our destination, the cabin. Siri let me know there was two miles left. Then everything went back to silence. The car slowly trudged over the underdeveloped road as large chunks of gravel crunched and tumbled beneath the wheels, while towering pine trees loomed above us, blocking out any stars. We arrived, and I was so exhausted that I considered just sleeping right there in the driveway. I'd never been to this cabin before, but upon first glance it was quite cozy. It's not one of those decked out cabins that rich people buy, but it had three bedrooms and set just offshore to a small 1100 acre lake. We quickly unloaded everything and collapsed onto a bed that smelled older than time. Though we were completely beat, we were excited to spend some time away from it all. The sun lit up our room early the next morning and I was filled with a huge sense of relief when, out of routine, I checked my phone to see that there was no service. Nobody could bother us, even if they tried. Rachel offered to drive to the nearest town to get some groceries, so I could settle in and check out the cabin myself. I rifled through hundreds of dusty books that sat on the shelves in the living room. Then I pulled out a dozen board games as I excitedly planned out our time ahead. I made my way outside and onto the dock that stretched out into the lake. A small boat lightly rocked in the water, and the dock creaked and groaned underneath my feet. I stared out at the lake, and finally felt the last of my anxiety dissipate. As the drive to town was around half an hour, I figured I would set out on the lake to do some fishing. A small island caught my eye that sat close to the middle of the water. It was maybe a hundred yards in diameter, and was filled with dense trees and shrubs. 
Something about it drew me toward it. I can't really describe it, but it's like it slowly sucked me in. The island had an almost eerie glow about it, like it wasn't really in the same world as ours. I anchored maybe 50 feet from the shore and started casting. It wasn't 30 seconds after that I felt something hit my boat. I had nearly had whatever was on the line up to the boat. It must have gotten off the hook, I thought, hit the boat before swimming away. When I reached out to reapply the bait, I saw a fish dangling off the end of the line still. An uneasy feeling washed over me when I saw that it was completely mangled. It was nearly ripped in half with tears all along what was left of its body. My first thought was that a bigger fish must have jumped on it, but I didn't feel any sort of struggle that would indicate such. Maybe an otter, I thought, but again, I didn't feel a struggle when I reeled it in. I tried to ignore this and moved on to the opposite side of the island, resuming my fishing, but again the next thing I hooked suddenly stopped fighting. I pulled up another shredded fish carcass. This happened a few more times as I was just curious at this point as to what was happening. I looked toward the island and felt such dread, like the island itself had eyes and was staring me down. I slowly rode myself away to another spot closer to the cabin and started to catch some actually intact fish, all the while taking brief glances at that island. After hauling in a decent-sized bass, I heard Rachel pull into the driveway, so I decided to make my way back and try to forget about this experience. Over dinner, I casually brought up the island to Rachel. So I saw there was this island in the middle of the lake. Have you ever been to it? I asked. Oh, that? Nah, my dad always just told us to not go over there. He said the land is still owned by the family of some woman who used to live there. She responded. Wait, someone used to live there? How? I asked. Yeah, he said that there was a woman who had a house there. She owned some knick-knack shop in town till around 50 years ago, when she died. She'd have to row to the dock every morning just to get to her car, she explained. Must have been a pain in the butt to get groceries there, I said with a laugh. Yeah, my dad said she was super creepy, and they would sometimes catch her staring at them from the shore while they fished, she elaborated. Well, that's just weird, I said, kind of laughing it off. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure none of it was real. I think he just told us those things to keep us from going to the lake and messing around, she said with a laugh of her own. The rest of the day was spent playing various board games, reading, and just lounging around the cabin. However, each time I passed the living room window, I felt that distinct feeling of being watched. Each time I would glance out to see that island looming in the distance. Curiosity was starting to nag at me, especially now that I was told that there was a house sitting by itself, probably untouched there for decades. A few days passed by, and we spent our time doing more of the same. While relaxing like this was exactly what I needed, I couldn't get my mind off of that island. I had barely done any fishing since I did my first trip on the lake, as I always felt like something just didn't want me there. I couldn't take it anymore. I decided that once Rachel fell asleep, I was going to row out there to check it myself. It probably was just some urban legend her dad had concocted to scare the kids. But part of me wanted to know if it was real. Wanted it to be real. I sat up in bed reading, waiting for Rachel to fall asleep. She fell asleep faster than anybody had ever met and could sleep through a hurricane, so I knew I wouldn't have to wait too long. She really wasn't a fan of anything creepy, and going to an abandoned house in the middle of the night was not something she'd be interested in. But I did feel kind of bad doing this without telling her. Then again, I knew she would just protest if she knew. I grabbed my heavy-duty flashlight, a hunting knife just in case, and my phone to record anything noteworthy. Rachel was asleep within minutes of laying her head down, and after waiting maybe 20 just to be safe, I turned out the lights and quietly made my way out of the cabin. It was dead quiet outside as I made my way down to the dock. No frogs, no crickets, nothing making a sound that night. I pushed off the dock and rode my way toward the island. 
Each dip of the oars into the water seemed so loud in the complete silence of the night. I was so anxious to see if Rachel's dad's stories were true or just legend. Either way, there was something off about this island, and I desperately wanted to see it for myself. I pulled up to it and circled around for a minute. The moon was bright enough for me to see the shoreline as I scanned for any spots that were clear enough for me to set anchor. Finally, I spotted a stump jutting out from the land that was partially submerged. The boat drifted towards it as I grabbed a hold and hoisted myself onto the land. I tied the rope to the stump, and after making sure it was secure, I clumsily stepped through the thick brush until I made my way onto what appeared to be someone's yard. I switched on my flashlight to see a disheveled home sitting in the very middle of the island. It stood two stories, with rotting walls and a caved-in roof. No way, I thought to myself. There really is a house here. All of the windows were broken, and the entirety of the house was suffocated by an overgrowth of ancient vines. The trees were so dense around it that it blacked out the sky above as this house stood, forgotten by time. I remembered to pull out my phone right then, to capture anything I might find. I swept the beam of light over the house after I hit record, then I made my way over. My feet crunched on fallen dead branches and leaves. That sense of dread returned to me with a vengeance. I'd come this far, and I was not going to turn back now. I shined the light on the front door that sat ajar. I shone the light through the openings where the windows used to be. It was eerie to say the least. Whoever lived here really must have owned a knick-knack shop or something, because dozens of miscellaneous items were strewn across the floor, coated in years of thick dust. A box spring mattress looked as if it had been thrown across the room as it sat partially upright against a decaying wall. I put my weight into the door, and it agonizingly creaked open, letting out decades of neglect. The air was dense and unforgiving as I swept my phone all around to record all these long-forgotten memories. Dozens of various trinkets, household tools, and ceramic animals covered the floors as I carefully stepped over the abandoned piles. I shifted the light to one corner of the room and felt my heart jump where I saw a pile of maybe a dozen baby dolls lying in a heap. I made my way towards them as the floor creaked and groaned. I was seriously starting to get the creeps as I noticed it was significantly colder in the house than it was outside in the summer night. Some of the dolls were missing their heads, while others had dirty and torn clothing on them. Right above the pile, I noticed a picture hanging on the wall. I blew off the thick coat of dust and went into a coughing fit as it blew directly back into my eyes and down my throat. When I came to, I saw it was one of those creepy old-timey photos of a family where no one was smiling, just vacant expressions staring back at me. There was a 30-something-year-old woman holding a baby with two little boys sitting by her sides. I realized they were standing in front of the house that I was currently invading. I turned around and my blood ran cold. Standing at the opposite edge of the room in a doorway was a small boy lit up in the beam of my flashlight. I jumped out of my skin and screamed as the light illuminated this figure. He was maybe seven or eight years old, with sandy blonde hair and deep brown eyes. The light in his face didn't seem to bother him as he stared straight through me. I quickly recognized his face as one of the boys in the photograph. Sir, what are you doing here? The words slithered out of his mouth and up my spine, sending a cold chill throughout my body. I sat there dumbfounded as I stammered at the ghostly figure. Can you help my brother? Please, sir. The boy requested of me. I was speechless. He quickly turned and darted into the room behind him. I stood there for a moment, but then I realized I had all of this on video and I was seeing dollar signs. This was the most incredible and terrifying thing I'd ever witnessed. I took a deep breath, made sure the phone was still recording, and made my way into the room. I passed through the doorway and into a room that looked pristine. 
clean floors, painted walls, and wooden rocking chairs. It even appeared that night had turned back into day, as the room looked dimly lit in the early morning light. I spotted yet another child off in the corner, just sitting on the floor, looking away from me, while the one who urged me into the room was leaning over something wrapped up on a couch. I made my way over to him, then glanced over his shoulder to see a baby cuddled up in a blanket cocoon. He feels cold, sir. He hasn't made a sound in a long time, and we don't know what's wrong. The little boy said to me with sadness in his voice. The other child began rocking nervously, hands clenched around his legs as he formed into a little ball. Can you help us, sir? The boy pleaded. The rocking child began to whimper and mumble under his breath. I'm sorry, I don't know what I can do to help. I spoke to him. Is your mother around? She can help you. It was at that moment that I heard a sound coming up from a staircase that I hadn't seen before. It started out very faint, but as the sound gradually grew, I could make out the heartbreaking sound of a woman crying. It persisted until it was a full-fledged wail that was ringing throughout the house. The boy rocking in the other corner quickly rose and sprinted out of the room. You should leave, mister. She doesn't like visitors. At that moment, it was like something flipped a switch, and the once immaculate room was now dark and cluttered with disgusting furniture that was torn and rotting. The wailing from upstairs hadn't ceased, and I heard loud, vicious stomping on the floor, right above me, rapidly, making its way to the staircase and starting the descent to the room I was in. I felt frozen in place. I shined the light down onto the couch to see a dirty, dust-caked doll lying there in a blanket. I looked back up at what sounded like a raging bull hit the bottom of the stairs, then just stopped. So did the crying. I fell back and waited for what felt like hours for something to show itself. I tried to crawl backwards as my legs seemed to stop working. After what felt like an eternity, it started its way towards me, and my heart sank. Thud, thud, thud. Each pause between the steps was more suspenseful than the last. I sat there, hands shaking as my flashlight trembled with them. I tried to force myself to turn it off, but it was too late. I watched in horror as a figure dark as night with long wispy hair and gangly limbs lumbered into the room. It seemed to stop and face me for a moment, and I could feel tears running down my face. After a brief pause, it made its way to the couch. It looked down at the old doll and stroked its head with long, bony fingers. It let its face collapse into its hands, and it began sobbing once more. Same as before, it gradually grew louder and louder until it was nearly deafening. It picked up the doll and held it tight to its chest, before letting out an ear-piercing scream of pure despair. I was somehow able to get enough of a grip and pull out my knife, but as I did, this thing's neck violently twisted towards me and postured up. It towered high above me as its head nearly grazed the ceiling. At last, my legs found the strength I needed, and adrenaline kicked in. I stopped the video and pocketed my phone before making a mad dash for the door. I heard rapid, heavy stomps close the distance instantly and I felt a tremendous force knock me through the doorway that I'd been running through. I frantically looked up as my flashlight had fallen from my hands, but I could still make out the figure hurling itself through the beam of light, which was coming from the flashlight wherever it had landed. A symphony of screaming and crying was coming from this thing. It stood over me as it pinned me to the ground with immense strength. I managed to shake my arm free. I then attempted to slash at its face with the knife, but it grabbed my wrist with such force that I felt it was going to snap my arm. It clenched its cold hands around mine and slowly guided the knife down towards my stomach. I tried punching it with my now free hand as it slowly lifted my shirt and began running the blade down my abdomen. I screamed out in pain as it pierced my skin. I felt warm blood slide down my sides. 
my free hand frantically grasped for anything to use to defend myself with, when I felt it go over a large piece of broken glass. Without hesitating, I grabbed it and stuck the thing in its eye. It let out a horrible cry and fell off me as I managed to sprint out of the house and into the boat. I could hear it crying that same mournful wail as I pushed the boat off and made it back to the cabin. I pulled in and tied the boat down before sprinting up to the house, but when I opened the door, I heard a horrible sound. The same crying was coming from somewhere inside my cabin. It sounded muffled at first, but grew in volume as I approached our bedroom. I made my way to the door, and as I opened it, the crying stopped. All I saw was Rachel slumbering peacefully the way I'd left her. I checked the closets, checked under the bed, checked every room in the house, but could find no sign of anything out of the ordinary. I dove under the covers and curled up tightly next to Rachel, my body trembling in terror. I decided right there we were leaving the following day. I couldn't be here anymore. I don't know if it was exhaustion or the result of high adrenaline wearing off, but I somehow found sleep after cowering under the covers for a while. I had a dream, though. It was me walking to the shore of the island. I could see our cabin in the distance, a small candle in the living room providing it enough light to be seen. However, I had no control over my movements. Whatever I was actually seeing through, looked down at the water, dove in, and began swimming furiously toward the cabin. All the way I screamed for it to stop, but it only gained speed. It climbed onto the dock and sprinted at an unnatural speed, the earth seeming to shake underneath its feet. It opened the door of the cabin, slowing its pace, carefully making its way through the living room then down the hall. It stopped and looked right at the bedroom door. It creaked open the door and walked inside. There I was, sleeping like a baby. I watched its disgusting, monstrous fingers slowly reach down towards me before violently grabbing me by the throat. I jolted awake and immediately shook Rachel up. We have to go now. What? She replied in a groggy tone. Just start packing. We're leaving right now. I rushed her into the car and hastily threw everything I could find before speeding down the unpaved road and away from the place. Rachel groggily asked me what was wrong, but I couldn't seem to answer. I felt as though I was in shock and I couldn't get any words to come out. It was then that I remembered the video. I'd recorded it all. I pulled out my phone and handed it to Rachel. Go through the videos. Watch the most recent one, I told her. I don't understand what I'm looking at here, she said in an exhausted voice before handing me the phone after watching for a few minutes. What? Please, babe, just watch it through, I pleaded with her. She mumbled something but was already asleep again. I didn't really care that she wouldn't see it now. I was just happy to be getting away from that place and back home. I stopped at a rest stop a few hours into the trip. The sun had just finished rising. After making a trip to the bathroom and grabbing a few sodas from a vending machine, I decided to take a look at the video myself. Either Rachel was just half asleep, or the video didn't come out clear like I'd hoped. I pulled open the video, and my heart sank. There was no house in front of me, just dense brush and a huge pile of bricks and wood, the remains of a home. I scrolled through two hours of footage of me just standing there, staring straight ahead at nothing. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I scrolled through the video, and it was over three hours straight of me just standing there. I went to the end of the video, before some movement finally caught my eye, because the end of the video consisted of me slowly pulling up my shirt, dragging a knife across my stomach, and grunting in pain, before I dropped the knife and sprinted back to the boat in a panic, making my way back to the cabin. For several hours of the drive, I just sat in silence, unable to comprehend what all had happened. Even when Rachel took over driving, I would not let myself fall asleep in fear of having another nightmare. 
I didn't want to tell her, and I hoped that she was too tired to even remember me showing it to her. After the long 17-hour drive was finally over, we started to unload our stuff from the car. Rachel was gathering up all of her things while I started to haul in the larger pieces of luggage into the home. I walked into the house and set down all the luggage I was carrying. I felt a sense of unease take over. The air was thick and heavy and the house was freezing cold. I reached for our doorknob to the bedroom and felt my heart sink. Just beyond the door, I could hear the faint sound of a woman sobbing. <laughs> 